Hi, I'm Chris Sikora, and I'm going to step you through exercise one, SOLIDWORKS 2021. In this exercise, we're going to take a look at how to build that model that you see in front of you. Some of the features that we're going to look at, first of all, are just basic sketches, extrusions, fillets, that's the radius that you see here and here. Okay, and let me turn off the integrated preview there. And then chamfers, that's these angled edges. And then we're also going to learn how to put a hole in. And we will also learn how to shell it and make it a thin wall plastic part. So let's begin. First of all, you'll find this information if you like a written document or some, some form. You could just go to vertanu1.com and get to the instructional manuals. Go to SOLIDWORKS Basics. And in there, it will actually bring up a document. I already have it up and loaded. And here you can see the SOLIDWORKS Basics document here. And you will see it has a syllabus in it. This is a college course. So if you're wanting something that's five minutes, find a different video, because this is actually going to teach you how to do it. Just like you wouldn't want a brain surgeon working on you that only had five minute tutorials on YouTube, I wouldn't want to hire a person who learns SOLIDWORKS using five minute videos. Anyhow, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, once you go into the training guide, you'll see that there's uh, lots of different things you could look at in here. It goes through what I'm about to cover. And really the lesson though, if you want to fast forward, you could fast forward a few minutes into the video if you just want to see how the part is modeled. But I'm going to go through some of the settings and things like that. So as you can see here, exercise one starts on page 19. We're going to go through how to build this. This gives you step by step. It's really just notes. It's not really a great training guide, beware. But we're looking over here. Once we finish that part, exercise one, we go into the labs. And the labs are saved as L1 and L1B and L2 and things like that. But you can see right here, there's two parts for you to build after you complete the model. And it uses the same tool. We basically use the same tools that you see in the exercise, of course. There are a few things I might show you, though, that are uh, added value. Now, going back to SOLIDWORKS. To get started, after you've installed it, go to New, and it will bring up this. You have Parts, Assemblies, and Drawings. The first four weeks of this course are just part files. The fifth week, we look at Assemblies, and then the sixth week, we get into Drawings. Seventh week is a review week for the midterm exam, and then the eighth week you actually take the midterm exam turned in. So, and all these videos are in sequence on YouTube under Vertani One, or you could go to the web page that I just showed you. It has all the parts that you're going to need, everything that you would possibly need except the software. You have to get that on your own through SolidWorks or wherever. Okay, so I'm going to go select part. Now, there is an advanced option here too, and uh, you'll see part assembly and drawing. Now, I made a template, and I don't get into making templates until like exercise six, or you could watch a different video if you like on that. But I already made an A and C inch. Now, when you go to part, it will give you options for those things. Uh, not all the time, actually, if you're in the novice section. So it will just give it to you. And usually when you install it, it just defaults to the ISO standard, which uh, international standard. Whereas I'm out of the United States here, so I'm using the American National Standard, or ANSI. Okay, now you'll see over on the left, let's go through the interface. This is the Feature Manager Design Tree. This is very interesting, because this was, the first time I ever saw this was in the 90s, the SOLIDWORKS, and it's just really nice how it works. It basically is your roadmap of everything that you're going to do. It's going to contain all the, part, uh, the features and things like that that you could edit from here. Or here's the view screen or the viewport you could edit it. There's a WCS just to let you know your X, Y, and Z. SOLIDWORKS, you don't really need to use X, Y, and Z all that often. You'll see it's broken down into front, top, and right planes. Very simple, very easy to use, and pretty neat. Now, you'll also see in the Feature Manager Design Tree, there's a material not specified. If you right-click on that, you'll see it gives you some basic materials, and it will actually input data on those specific materials, like the weight and characteristics of it, also the color. Now, you could go to Edit Material, and you get a much larger library. And you can also procure additional libraries if you don't see them here, or you could customize this down at the bottom and create your own custom materials. But let's say we wanted this to be 
and aluminum. So if I go to aluminum alloys, and let's go with 1060 alloy. And here you could see I have mine set to megapascals or MPA. And we could see the yield strength, tensile strength, all that fun stuff. So go ahead and hit apply and close. You don't have to do that part unless you want to. But later on, we could actually find out how much our part weighs. So if we're going to order material, you can find out how much you need or how much it's going to weigh, I should say. All right, now let's go to the sketch tab. This, these tabs, they call it the ribbon, and it's just like Windows um, Office. So you have the ribbons on almost all typical Windows software nowadays. And inside you have the icons. And I have some people say they don't like using this and you can customize it. And you can, you can just right click and there's toolbars and you could select from the toolbars and bring them up individually if that's your preference. And you want to right click over here. You can right click on the toolbar, but just be careful because you might undock it. Uh, you can actually unlock it. And actually you saw there, drag the command manager by the tabs to unlock. So you're, you are able to move it, and then there's little docking stations you have to drag and drop it back into. Okay, let's go ahead and also let's go to the options menu. I just want to show this too. So if you go to the little gear up here, it will bring up the options or what is referred to as the heart of SOLIDWORKS. Here you have system options. These are global settings. Whatever you change there is going to be permanent inside SOLIDWORKS. Of course, you can go back and change it. But document properties, which is the next tab, only affects the current document we have open. So if we say you're moving between metric and inches documents for different customers, this is how you could do it. You could adjust the properties just for the specific doc document that's open right now or up and active. Here you could go to units and here you could actually see all the, the, the basic units. You have imperial or IPS, inch pounds second or millimeters grams second, things like that. Um, Again, in the United States, I'm going to go ahead and use IPS today. So make sure that's selected. And then over here, you have the ability for decimal place precision. Let's set it to three decimal places, 0.123. You could go up to eight decimal places. And for right now, that's about it. Oh, one last thing, drafting standard. If you're not in the ANSI, make sure you select ANSI. And it's not the end of the world if you, if you don't. It's just the dimensions appear a little bit different than this. All right, let's now select the front plane. And right here, you'll see a quick launch that appears. If you don't move your mouse too fast, it's there, and that's great. I love the quick launch. However, if you move away from it, it disappears. Now, you probably want to what are these planes? Those planes are your paper that you sketch on. And we're going to sketch on the front plane for the next four weeks. I will show you a couple instances where you could click on the top plane. A lot of people ask, like, what's the point? Like, what, or what should we, how should we design? And I always tell them, like, if you're going to, design something like let's say here's a mouse and you're thinking okay well what's the front top right or better yet actually it's uh here's like a lip balm and essentially you have to figure out what's front top and right and you can sketch that so this is a cylinder very easy to model pretty much so you might want to sketch it from the top where you just draw a circle and you could extrude it later so you could sketch it on the top plane and then extrude it up and it will be sitting vertical and the interface but to be truthful it doesn't matter all that much and all that often once you understand your spatial recognition inside the software you can do pretty much anything you want all right but we're going to sketch on the front plane so select the front plane go to the sketch tab and start a sketch because of course i blew through the quick launch which would have given me the same exact option all right it oriented me normal to the plane or so you can see here we're parallel to it and you have an origin that's your origin is not movable inside SOLIDWORKS. You can add a double additional WCSs for output to other CAD systems. That's not or CAM systems. It's not as critical as it used to be, but you don't move this origin ever. That's your anchor point, And it's you'll see it's awesome the way it works. OK, now find the tools up here on the sketch tab. You'll see there's a variety of different tools. Typically, anything you, you see here, you're going to see in a different CAD system, too. But hit the little arrow to the right of corner rectangle. You'll see that there's center rectangle. We're going to use that. I'm going to show that one to you for lab 1B today. So if you continue and watch that, you can, I'll show you a cool trick with that. But we want corner rectangle. Now move your pointer to the origin. You'll see the origin turns. First of all, your pointer is no longer a pointer. It's actually a pencil. And 
it turns, uh, whenever you hover over something, you get that little orange dot. You want to make sure you get that orange dot. And to the right of the pointer, there's a little symbol, and that's what they call a constraint that's automatically being added, and we'll talk about that in a second. But once you have that, click one time. And when I refer to the mouse buttons, this is in the training guide. The When I say click, I'm referring to the right, uh, the left mouse button. And that's when we use 90% of the time. The right mouse button, we only use uh, maybe 10% at most. Okay, and that's for bringing up context-sensitive menus. And I'll make sure I tell you, right-click, and I'll say it slowly, and perhaps I might even say it twice, just so you know. Um, then there's the wheel. The wheel, many people don't realize it's actually a push-button mouse, too. You could, it's actually a third button if you hold it down instead of scroll. But um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. That's for zooming in and out and things like that and rotating. But let's go ahead and move our pointer to the upper right. Now you'll notice on the left hand side there's some parameters. Now I've been using SOLIDWORKS since 1997 and I was a, an applications engineer and I've seen places that where I've had people use that on the left and then they fail to use the smart dimensions tool. And what happened is that uh, actually a company I worked at, someone accidentally moved the line because it doesn't really constrain it, threw the, the whole model off, it ended up getting molded. And we're talking $30,000 of a mold that was no good, basically. And so um, I don't recommend using that. That and, and in that case, the owner of that company said it was a fireable offense to use that from then on. So not saying that that's every company, but I would not recommend that. That's It is nice for plugging in numbers quickly, but don't use it. Now look at to the upper right of your pointer, you get X and Y information. And this is just to get you close to the marker. So let's just um, just get it up here to where you can't go any further or you don't want to go past. Go ahead and click. And you'll see little green squares. Now those green squares are indicating vertical and horizontal constraints. It's locked in, so it's not going to tilt at an angle because it automatically put those in for us. Now we could click on it, hit escape, click on them, and hit delete if we didn't want them, but then we could get a parallelogram where basically they, or not even parallelogram, where they basically just the, drag them at an angle, which that might be what you want, but not in this case. All right, now this little constraint here indicates that it's locked in at the lower left, so it's on our anchor. Let's go to smart dimension. Now smart dimension, if you hit the little arrow underneath it, there's baseline dimension, horizontal ordinance, vertical ordinance, things like that. We're not going to go through all those right now. We will take a look closer at them maybe in six weeks in exercise six for detailing. But for right now, just use smart dimension. It's actually pretty smart. Go ahead and click on this line. Now, I see a lot of people who migrate from like AutoCAD and some other CAD systems. They end up clicking on the points because that's what they're used to in those systems. That's an extra point every time. You don't have to do that. Just click right on the line. When the line turns orange, click. Move your pointer to the right and you'll get the dimension. Now, if your dimension is horizontal or vertical, that means that you're probably in the ISO standard. So go back. You could go to that little gear up here and change that. You could also go down here, and there's an option to change it there. But um, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever, if you want to use the ISO standard, that's fine. ANSI standard is fine, too. Just center the dimension like so. Click and make the, type in. Now, notice this. You can see the eight decimal places. I've had students and I've been training. I also used to be, um, I used to hire people as well. And when I would give them a test to see their skill level, um, I would generally, this is what I would look at. If they went ahead and they did this, this is what not to do. Like they click in here and they backspace. I've seen this multiple times. And I was guilty of it when I was a new user. Um, so don't feel bad if you do that. And then they type in 5.000. They're like, oh, because, yeah, we have three decimal places. And they hit enter. It's going to work. But as a manager, I'm going to look at, like, oh, this is a novice user. This is a beginner. So let me show you a trick on how to look professional, like you really know this software well. Do this instead. Like, now go ahead and click on this line here. Drag the dimension down. Center it. Click. Instead of typing over that, notice it's highlighted in blue. Just hit, oh, and also make sure on your keyboard, make sure the number lock is on. And now just hit the number, like three, and hit enter. Look at that, 3.000, it filled in the decimal place and the zeros. So 
that makes a person look much more skilled with the software. So if you're looking for a job for this and they, they ever, the manager sits you down and says, let's see what you can do, and they give you a drawing, make this, try and do that. You're going to look very impressive and hopefully get the job. All right, let's go to Features and go to Extrude Boss Space. All right, go ahead and type in 0.5. Now, Features is the 3D area of SOLIDWORKS. Sketch is the 2D area. Now, there is a 3D sketch, but 3D sketch is really reserved more for piping, tubing, things like that. Um, it is pretty nice, very nifty the way it works, but we'll look at that in Exercise 7. So stay tuned. All right, so we typed in 5 here. Notice um, we have from a sketch plane. We're not going to get into that right now. It's a little bit more on the advanced side, but it's very, it's a very nice tool. Blind, if you hit the little arrow to the right of blind, you'll see there's up to vertex, surface, body, midplane, things like that. We just want blind. Blind is a given depth, and we can type that in with 0.5, as you see right here. And if you know what the equivalent is in metric, just so you know, you can always type it in, and um, like you'd be able to type in 0.5 with the little quotes or IN, lowercase IN, and hit enter. If you're metric, it will actually convert it for you, which is really pretty cool, and vice versa. Type in mm for millimeters, but leave it at 0.5. Hit the green check. Now you have your first solid, perhaps, maybe. Okay, now hit escape. See the blue edges? That's just highlighted because that was the last thing we did. If you hit escape on your keyboard, that disappears and refreshes. Now some of the settings in here, like I have shadows and all this fun stuff, where you'll find that at, there's, I have real view graphics. Some of you may not have this or the ability to select real view. Real view gives it just that, what it says, real view graphics. Like NVIDIA with their Quadro series of cards does it automatically, as well as the Radeon Pro or Fire Pro series from AMD. Um, a typical CAD, uh, gaming cards don't have it built in. There is a cheat under computer. Uh, not configurations, but uh, reg edit, and you can look that up on YouTube. I don't recommend it. I tinker with those, and I've had them screw up my system more often than not. I mean, they're, I got them to work, but I, it, it, quadro graphics are just nicer, the professional graphics. Otherwise, it looks like this. So yours might look like that. That's fine. Uh, it's still perfectly usable, but I'm going to go ahead and turn on the real view. You can see the shadows. Uh, maybe I don't want to see the shadows. I'm going to turn that off. There's also ambient occlusion. It gives it a little darker. We don't have anything really to reflect too much off of, so I'm going to turn that off too. All right, now we're going to go ahead and continue on with this. We're going to build a block at the bottom. So select this face, and we'll use the Quick Launch. Notice the Quick Launch toolbar just appeared. Otherwise, you could go up to the Sketch and the little Sketch button there. You could do that too. But right here, click on this icon. All right, now let's... I want to show you how to rotate a little bit first using the keyboard. Hit your space bar. The space bar may or may not bring this up depending upon the computer you're using. You have this little vector of view selector, and I really like this. I call it the ice cube because it brings up this little ice cube. If you turn it off, it disappears. But you turn on, you have this, and you can click on any of these polygons, and it will bring you to that view orientation. Space bar. Click on that polygon, brings you the isometric spacebar. And also it gives you a list here too. You can also break this up into four views, those of you who like that, um, which is really nice for other CAD systems. I've never found it really all that useful for SOLIDWORKS, but I've seen people use it, and it's okay. All right, but let's go hit the spacebar, click on front. You also, if you hold the right mouse button down, hold the right mouse button down, move left or right. Look at this, you have some quick launch tools there too. Um, I'm not gonna select any of those. Uh, we were in the sketch tool, so it was gonna let me do that from there, but I wanted to go ahead and click on here. Now, mine is really, I'm getting this terrible shadow effect. Now, click over here on this little beach ball, and I'm gonna go to plain white, and that helps lighten it up a little bit, but there's other ones in there too. Feel free to tinker with them. They're really neat. Okay, let's go back to corner rectangle. Go to the lower left corner, click, and drag this to the right. Now, as you glide along this right edge, you'll see it will highlight in orange. Now, if you move close to the midpoint, guess what? You get a midpoint. We don't want that. 
That would be an automatic relation we're not interested in. So drag this down a little bit. Like we want Y to be around one and a half inches, around there. So click. Now go to Smart Dimension, click on that vertical line on the right, drag it to the right and click. Now, you might have missed it because I didn't call it out. I'm going to cancel for a second. I'm going to hit that red X and Control and Z one time will undo. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry, I had to hit it a second. I'm not sure why I had it the first time. But anyhow, um, I hit Control Z. That's undo. Now there is the undo button up here, and there's redo too. Look at it tells you Control Y is redo, Control Z is undo. Now notice this line here is like a light, a lighter blue, and this is black, and then it's shaded inside. What do those things mean? Light that that blue indicates that of that line that's underdefined. There's no constraint telling it where to be exactly. So this is where it could be dangerous if you don't dimension things, because look at that, you can just move it by clicking and dragging with the mouse button to press. So we want to eliminate that with the smart dimension. Click on this line here, click over here to the right, type in 1.5 and hit enter. And now it's turned black. Black is an indicator that it's fully defined, and that's what you want before you go into production with anything. Anything that's underdefined, SolidWorks will let you go into production or send it to the 3D printer or whatever you like to do, but be aware that you might not have measured that. And this is a good way to checks and balances for yourself. So you'll also see down here it will tell you when you're fully defined as well. It says fully defined right there. The other term would be underdefined, meaning you're missing either one of the two types of constraints. Let's look at that right now. The two types of constraints, you have dimensions, and that's using the dimension tool. And then you have these little green blocks, which have all been automatic thus far. We're gonna see how to manually put one in in a little bit. But those are also constraints, telling it to be vertical, horizontal, perpendicular, tangent, all those fun uh, geometric type constraints. Okay, let's now go to features, go to extrude boss space. Now, if you want to see this extruding, like right now it's extruding out at us, so we can't really tell, but watch this. I'm going to show you a little trick. The mouse wheel. If you have a mouse wheel, hold it down like it's a button. Don't scroll. Now scrolling will zoom in and out, but now move your mouse on the table left, right, up and down. That's dynamic rotation. So that's how SolidWorks does it. All right. Now you could also zoom in and out with your wheel. Like move your pointer where you want to zoom, like this upper right corner. Let's say you want to move up or zoom up to that area, hover over it and start scrolling towards it. And that's how you could get a focal point, just by hovering your point over where you want to focus on and rotate. Okay, you could go ahead and hit enter or the green check mark and we now have our next block. Again, you could hit escape to refresh the screen. Let's put a hole in it now. Go ahead and select this face and go to the sketch, or I'll go up here to the long way. Just go to sketch. Now, just to show you, if you hit the little arrow under sketch, you'll see sketch, 3D sketch, 3D sketch on plane. Remember, 3D sketches are great for tubing, wiring, pipes. Not so great for what we're doing now, so don't bother with the 3D sketch. Just the regular sketch. All right, hit the space bar. You could actually, we'll use this button right here, front, or control one is the fast key. Well, there is a hole tool, but we're, we won't explore the hole tool until exercise four. Okay, and the hole tool itself is for counter bores, counter sinks, national pipe threads, things like that. It actually has a nice, robust library to choose from. This is just showing you how to draw one manually, and then we're going to go ahead and cut it. So hover over this upper left quadrant, click, drag out, or just uh, move your pointer out to create a circle. Now sometimes you'll hear me say drag out, and I had someone comment like, oh, that was confusing, and I apologize. SaltWorks does let you drag lines, like just like if you were to hold a pencil down and drag it across, holding the mouse button down, and when you release it, it automatically releases the li you from line chain. So there is that option, and I apologize, because that's how SaltWorks used to function on a regular basis. And so if I uh, say drag, I just mean click and click. I don't usually use that old tool, which it, I don't really find it all that valuable these days. Okay, go to Smart Dimension, click on this circle, drag this up here, click and 0.75 for the diameter. Now we're gonna locate 
that. So select the center point of that circle, click on this edge here, and I'm gonna use my wheel to zoom out a little bit and click up here, make that one, because it's one inch offset from the left edge. Now you can actually click on the actual circle and then the top edge, and it gives you the same option. It automatically goes to center it does give you some additional options sometimes for going to quadrants, which we'll look at that maybe around exercise four. Some built-in functionality. There's a tremendous amount of built-in functionality that I'm not showing you. Is it would just overwhelm a new student. So we're just looking at the very basics. And this is how SOLIDWORKS, how you've been, I've been teaching it since 1997. I add some of the enhancements that have come over the years, but essentially you could almost go back to an older version, of, probably up to 2001 and use these same functions. So they've been in there for a long time. All right, let's go to, uh, let's rotate first of all. So middle wheel, hold it down, rotate it a little bit. Now we're gonna see how to cut material. This is where SOLIDWORKS is very unique. Um, I, there, like FreeCAD does this. Um, there's, there's some others that do do it, but not all of them. A lot of them have it integrated into the extrude button, but this has actually a separate button for removing materials, which is called extrude cut. Click on extrude cut. Now, one thing about this, SOLIDWORKS is a parametric model, meaning those dimensions, we could later on go back into them, double click and have it change and update. And that's one of the beautiful things about parametric modeling. However, there is something called design intent, and that's how your plan, how you want it to react when changes come down the line, someone tries to change it, so it doesn't error out or do some strange things and no matter what it's going to happen but there it is a skill over time that you'll develop i don't i don't suggest thinking about too deeply right now but let's see an example of design intent right now we have this going it's a half inch it remembered the dimension from the wall thicknesses that we created now a half inch on that single plate would go through right now but changes come down what if that plate changes? Someone says, you know, the plate's not thick enough. Let's make it three quarters of an inch. So 0.75 instead of 0.5. This hole will have to be changed too. So you'll have to go in later on and change that. That's extra step for you. Or someone might not even realize it. And the part goes out to be manufactured and it's wrong because the hole no longer a through hole. Here's the fix for that. Instead of blind, use through all. Now there's a through all both, but that would be if there was something in front of the model that you want to cut as well. So you don't need that here. You just need through all. It's going backwards. SOLIDWORKS has a little bit of an AI built uh, that basically is built in that knew that there was volume behind it. So it automatically picked to extrude that, that direction when we select the extrude cut. If we were actually adding material, it would flip flop it the other way. It's not always so smart. Sometimes you have to help it along depending upon the complexity of the model. So just note that. All right, hit the green check. Now let's take a look at that. Double click on this side face here and you'll see the dimensions appear. One of them up here is the, the thickness. Double click on that 0.5 and you can use this as a wheel and you'll see it update. See how it's, it's making it thicker? Let's say we made that thicker and then you could, this is a preview regenerate. See that little traffic signal, that red light, green light? Click on that, it commits partially you could actually see the preview. And however, though, um, it essentially, um, yeah, you, you can see the preview and then you just hit the green check mark to apply it. If you don't like it, you could hit the red X, but notice it goes through because we select through all. Okay. Go ahead and just hit the red X to cancel that operation. Now it's still in a thickened state. So hit this rebuild or this regenerate up here or control B and it'll go back to its original state. But if we wanted to keep that, we would have hit the green check mark instead of the red X. So there you go, there's some information for you. Now, let's take a look at fillet. Technically, we're done. In my training guide, this is all I expect my students to do. This next area is an enhancement that's gonna make you a better modeler. If you wanna do this for the rest of your life, watch the next few minutes. If you don't want this as a career, you're just taking this because you have to, you're done. You don't have to go any further. Turn this in, do a, a file and do a, let's see, a save as, and you can save it as a PDF 
first you probably want to save it for yourself but there is a uh, let's see here okay and there it is PDF Adobe portable document format click on that hit save save it as e1 well I'll, I'll actually make one right now so click here and capital E1 for exercise one. All of your exercises should be turned in that way. Exercise two will be E2, exercise three, E3. Your labs will be L for lab one, lab two, lab three. And those numbers go by the exercise. The exercises are typically the opener to the chapter. That's your chapter, basically. And so it would be E1, E2, E3. Those we do together. The labs, I recommend you do those on your own. Okay, um, I will give you videos for most of them. So, because I don't want to see anyone get stuck. I used to have students call me and say, hey, how do I, I can't figure out how to get this to work. Now I put the video in there, but I still recommend you do them on your own. You'll be a much better modeler. Go back and take a look if you get stuck. All right, so capital E1, hit save, and you just save the PDF. Send me the PDF, those of you in my class. <clears throat> or later on, you could save these and uh, make a portfolio. Okay, I'm going to save actually the part now. I'm going to go to save as instead of there. It's going to say SolidWorks part. And I'm going to save this. I made actually my documents folder a SolidWorks 2021 parts. And I'm going to name that E1. And that's how I'd want you to save it. Now we're going to go to the fillet tool. Find fillet up here. Now the fillet tool enables us to put a radius on. And we're just going to look at the basics here. Set the radius to 1 for 1 inch and select the edge. Like I'm going to rotate this. See this edge right here? Click on that. Now to get it to this isometric view, if you can't figure out how to use the mouse wheel, remember the space bar. Now you'll have to close the fillet tool, I think, before you hit the space bar. I don't think it likes it when you do that. Let's try it. Yeah, see, it, it just alters this, so we don't want that. But you could cancel, hit the red X if you need to. Now, if you can see these, though, click on this edge. SolidWorks does do something rather unique. I've only seen it in two other CAD systems where it allows you to select faces. Now, we don't want any faces here. Now, this would be a face. See this whole face right here? And you get a little symbol to the right of your pointer. It's a blue square. I don't want you to select the face. If you do select the face, it, all the topology of that face gets filleted. And sometimes it can't handle that, especially with this large of a radius. So there's not enough room there to put that in, so it's going to error out. So be careful not to do that. If you do, like here, I clicked on it. Notice the preview disappeared. Make sure you turn on full preview, by the way. I don't know if it's always on. It used to not be on by default. So full preview in order to see that. But look at that. See, I just clicked on that. They disappeared. That's an indicator that it's not going to work. Because this is only half inch thick. It can't fit a one inch radius on that. So click on it again to deselect it. And there you go. So just these two edges that I selected, hit the green check. Now let's try chamfer. Hit the little arrow underneath fillet and you'll find it hiding in there. It's chamfer. Chamfer is an angle versus a radius. Make sure over here you type in 0.125. Make sure, sure full preview is turned on. Select this edge right here and this edge here. If you wanted to, you're welcome to try it right now. You could click on this edge. I encourage you to have fun with this at this point. Remember, I only require the basic model. If you want to make it look really impressive and tinker with it, and you're going to learn a lot, put more stuff on it. Put more fillets. Put more uh, chamfers. Learn how to sculpt. Like I could put in a chamfer like this. At that point, though, what you're looking at is it's uh, a countersink. All right, and here notice that we have... Um, 0.125 at 45 degrees. You could do a variety of things. Distance to distance, angle to distance, so on and so forth. Hit the green check. All right, we're almost done. Rotate this. Now practice rotating until you get this view. Remember, middle wheel. Hold it down. Move your mouse left, right, up, and down. And take a break. Learn how to, right now, pause it if you like. Try rotating around. Rotating is a very important skill I know some think like, well, it's, we're talking really basic. What is he talking about? But no, new, new users who've never used a 3D CAD system, this is time for you. Take a minute or two, learn how to rotate. It's going to make your life a lot easier.
Okay, welcome back. So let's go to the shell command. Now with the shell command, we'll make the wall thickness 0.1, which is the default. Now what you do, you just select what you want open. So click on this back face. There is a show preview. Um, I am not a huge fan of the preview in this one, but that's okay. Click on this face here and click on that face. Now those are the faces it's going to remove. Everything else is going to have this thin wall and you can kind of see it in that preview. You can also shell it outward. I don't want you to do that. That would thicken it on the outside. We don't need it here. Hit the green check. And now look at that. Look at this beautiful part that we modeled. Very simple, but yet it has some nice elegance to it with the fillets and the chamfers. Now let's look at some of these keys. Your arrow keys on your keyboard. Hit them. It rotates in 15 degree increments. Try up, down, left, right. Now, if you hold the Alt key and the left and right arrow keys, it rotates clockwise and counterclockwise. If you hold Control and the arrow keys, it pans. If you hold Shift and the arrow keys, it rotates at 90 degree increments. If you hold Shift in the middle wheel, it's zooming in and out, and that's just like scroll to. If you hold control in the middle wheel, it pans left, right, up, and down. If you hold the right mouse button, now you get these options like you could go to top, bottom, left, right, and that's with the right mouse button. And up here, you have zoom to fit. The F key on your keyboard does this. Okay. There's also zoom to area, so let's say you want to zoom up on that hole, you just click. You can hit zoom to fit again. There is previous view, so it takes you back to the last view. We have section view, click on that. Now the section view, grab the arrows, drag it through, grab these rings and rotate it, and you can drag through it at any angle, seeing it. Now if you hit the green check mark, you'll see it leaves you with this, which might not be desirable. So turn off section view to stop that. You can actually partially work in that mode, which is pretty cool. There are some limitations to it, though. All right, there's dynamic. Uh, we're not going to go into that. View orientation, that's what we've been hitting with the space bar. And then finally over here, we have the shade with edges, shade without edges. We can go over to wireframe, hidden lines, and uh, this one, integrated preview, that's if you have Photo View 360, it gives you a nice shaded, professional looking image. All right, now at this point, let's go ahead and take a look at why did we select that alloy, first of all. Take a look here, click off of it, hit Escape. You could go to the Value Weight tools. Now, Value Weight, you could go to Measure. Now, the Measure tool is really neat. You could say, I oh, like, what is that? Click on that line. That's two inches. Now, if you hit this little arrow, you could clear that out. Now, like, let's say we want to see what this radius is. Click on that. And there it gives you the information. Okay, so you could measure things really easily with that little tape measure. Now, here, mass properties. And what we could see is that with this specific 1060 aluminum, the weight of this part would be 0.1 pounds, so a tenth of a pound. And you could change that. You could go over here to options and use scientific notation, use custom units, all that fun stuff. All right, we could close that. Now let's take a look at uh, changing colors. We're going to go ahead. We already looked. See, it has an aluminum facade. That was because we selected the 1060 alloy. But you could override that. Let's say we want this hole to be a different color. Click on that. And then right here is a beach ball. Hit the little arrow underneath it. You could say the face, the cut extrude, the whole body, or the entire model. You could adjust. But let's go to the cut extrude, which is just the hole. And now over to the right or the left, you have different colors you can make. That See how I click on the color rainbow here? You can change the colors. Or you could go over here to plastics, find like high gloss. And there's a whole variety of plastics to select. You can select high gloss blue. There's also car spray painted. And like there's gloss blue. Okay, and it doesn't looks a little bit different. Now 
we could also select from here the chamfer. We could right click, or we could do this. Actually, let's say we wanted to steal that color. We could right click on that cut extrude, and right here is copy appearance. Click on the chamfer, and there's paste appearance. So you're able to put it back in. There's several different ways and tricks for that. At this point, let's set this up for rendering. So go to perspective. Perspective gives us a gives it a vanishing point. And now if you go to not non, not every system has this or every license. So if you go to SOLIDWORKS add-ins, see if you have Photo View 360. If it's grayed out or if it's not there, that's an indicator you just have the core modeler. Photo View 360 comes in the professional version, which some schools will procure, but some don't. Um, we have it at the college that I teach at. So you do have this technically, if you, uh, depend upon what class you're in, you get different licenses. All right, so at that point, we could go for Photo View 360, go to Render Tools, and go to Integrated Preview. Now, if you hold on, I have a bit of an older computer here. I'm going to do Control Alt Delete and hit Task Manager here and go to my performance. And you can see it's uh, it's rendering it, and you can see that it's utilizing all 16 threads on my Xeon processor. And my the speed of my Xeon is 3.6 gigahertz. And I have a, a GPU. It's not using much. It actually looks like it is using some GPU performance there. A very minuscule amount. But this uh, is the Quadro K5200, which is actually a rather old from 2014, I believe, card. 8 gigabytes of RAM. But this is a professional card. And I got this for, uh, believe it or not, 100 bucks. Normally they're like 300 bucks on eBay or higher. Uh, it depends. You really have to shop. And I got this because it, um, it had an issue with it. One of the ports, I think, is out on it. But it has four ports, so it was a big deal. Okay, so there we could see it's finished with the threads. But it is a multi-threaded process, this rendering. So the more cores you have, the better. Let's take a look now in the training guide. Now that we finished this, let's go to L1. Now you can save what your part, just hit File, Save. It should save over the last one, or save as if you want to rename it or something. But L1, we see a 2 by 3 and a half inch, looks like an F, right? We're going to go ahead and model this, a 2 by 3 and a half. So go turn off Integrated Preview because it does suck up system resources if you leave it on. Now we go to File, New. And ANSI inch, uh, just part is fine for you if you want. Again, if you need the units changed down here is a quick way to change them to IPS for inch pound second. Go to the front plane, start a sketch. We're not going to change the material type here. Draw out the line. Now, we didn't learn the line tool. It's kind of an assumption drawing the rectangle that works the same way. So click on that origin, drag this up. Now notice when you do an individual line though, it doesn't constrain you to vertical. So you have to kind of move your pointer to make sure it looks vertical. And you see the little symbol to the right of your pointer? That's vertical, that little yellow vertical line. Used to, years ago, it used to have a V for vertical and H for, I thought I'd like that, but of course it's an international product, so it doesn't have that these days. So two inches approximately, click. Drag this across here about one point, uh, I think one and a half, and then drag this about halfway down, about one inch. Drag this over about one inch. Drag it up, across, down a little bit, and just have a little fun with it. This goes a little lower, click. Now, if you can get the inference line, look at that, I'm inferring to the origin. Click, and now connect that. All right, hit Escape. Now let's go to the Smart Dimension tool. Click on this bottom line, that's gonna be 3.75. Now it's gonna do some scaling. Click on this line here, that's going to be 2. And then click on this line here, and let's see what that is supposed to be. That's supposed to be 1 inch, and the next one is 1.75. So this will be 1. Now to get that baseline dimension, we're just going to do it manually. There is an automatic tool for it. I'm not going to show that to you right now. Click on this line to this line, 1.75. 
Now they do have tools later on. It is, I always suggest that it's good to lay these out, these dimensions out, how you would like to see them on your drawing, because you can retrieve them in the drawing when you make it, and it shows up just like that for the most part. But there are tools that allow you to automatically do it too. All right, click on this line here, click on this over here, and maybe uh, zoom out a little bit, get that dimension over there, and we're looking that that's going to be two and a half. Okay, those are all constrained. Now notice this one is not, uh, and that's fine. Let's take a look. We we want this one right here to be 0.85. Oops. And from here to here, this will be one. Now this one we could add a dimension, but you notice my print doesn't have it in there. So what you need to do, hit escape on your keyboard. I'm going to show you a little trick how to manually add a relationship. We want it to be aligned or what they call collinear to this line here. So click on that line one time. Hold control then for the second entity. You always have to hold control. That's typical Windows functionality. If you're selecting multiple files, you hold control. So click on this line here release and now you get this quick launch and look at this you could go through here and there's collinear now you could go over here too and it has them spelled out for you collinear and now you'll see that little dashed line that ignores that for the extrude but it notes that it's a line now and we're fully defined so i'm going to go to features extrude boss space and select 0.5 type in 0.5 hit enter and hit the green check click anywhere on the screen and basically you're done at this point. Again, feel free to enhance it. Use the fillets, go to the fillet tool. Feel free to put some fillets in on some of these edges. Enhance it because later on, the, the purpose of this class is for you to learn it as well as make a portfolio that you can show off to potential employers. And when I used to hire people to do this, that's one thing I would do is I would actually look at the portfolio if they had one. Believe it or not, believe it or not, not a lot do. But if they had it, they would automatically go to the top of my list because I could see exactly what they were capable of. Go ahead and put a few more in and just have fun with it. All right, let's move on to the next one. For this one, we have a three by five block and it's one and a half inches thick with a cutout that goes one inch deep. And then we have some holes in it, offset three quarters of an inch from the edges and their half inch holes. So let's begin. For this one, go, uh, actually let's save this first though. I'm gonna save. And this one is capital L1. Oops, capital L1, let's see. All right, now we could go to File, New, Part, hit OK. Again, if you need to change this, I'm not going to show you today how to do a template, but um, you can select the IPS right down there, or you could go to the, the this again. All right, I'm going to do this on the top plane. Let's just see what happens if we do it on the top plane. Select top plane, start a sketch. This time, let's show you a different tool. How about the center rectangle? When something is symmetric like this block, automatically try center rectangle. Click on this center here, drag this out, click. Let's go to Smart Dimension, 5 by 3. Now let's put the holes in. Select one of the circle tools and stay away from the geometry here. Click and drag out a small hole. Don't touch the edges. Stay away from the edges. Now go to Smart Dimension. Dimension the diameter of the hole at 0.5. Oops. And I'll select the center of the hole to the left edge, 0.75. Center of the hole to the top edge, 0.75. Wow, it's really close there. All right, now what we can do is we could do that each time, and that's good practice. But how about I show you a new tool? This tool doesn't really, we don't go into it until next week usually, but let's go ahead and try it out. Let's try the mirror tool. The mirror tool requires something, the center line. So click on this little arrow to the right of line, find center line, and hover up here till you get the inference to the origin. Click 
click to connect to the origin, and then click to the left. Hit escape. Just as long as it's centered, that's all I care about. I don't care how you, what order you draw it. Now, this is how you, if you hit escape, select the circle, hold control and select the vertical center line. You can only do it across one center line at a time. Now, at least last I checked. Now go to mirror entities. Mirror it over. Let's try that again. Select the hole here. Now hold control and select this. Now you could do this too. Watch this. What if you, if you didn't want to do that? You could like move your point over here, surgically go in and just encompass or in an envelope those two holes without anything else completely encompassed. Now hold control and select this line. So you could use that too. Always go from left to right if you're trying to surgically get in there. Otherwise, if you go from right to left, it selects everything that it touches. So that's typical of other CAD systems too. All right, let's go to mirror entities. There we have it. We saved a lot of time. See all those additional constraints that are there? Now we could go to features, extrude boss base. Let's make it 1.5, which is the overall thickness. Hit the green check. Click somewhere. Now select this face, start a sketch, space bar, go to top, go to center rectangle again, and right at that origin, click, connect to this upper edge right about there. We're just eyeballing it right now. Go to smart dimension. It is supposed to be 1.5 wide. Go to features, extrude cut. You may want to rotate this to see there. See it's going through right now, so we just want it to go one inch. Just one inch. Oops. I hit the wrong button. There. One inch. Hit the green check. Done. Now, if you hit the space bar and go to isometric right here, or control 7, there we have it. Let's add some fillets. Go to the fillet tool. And again, just for fun. You don't have to do this. Just enjoy yourself. This is really, you could be as creative as you like with these. Go ahead and type in 0.5 for the radius. Select this edge, this edge here. And some ask, like, could we have added this in the sketch? Absolutely. We'll learn that next week or the week after next. All right, now to get this one behind here, you could rotate, but SaltWorks employs kind of like a Superman X-ray vision. You can just hover over where you think the line is, and it will highlight. Click. Hit the green check. Let's put some chamfers on there. Go to underneath fillet, go to chamfer. We'll stick with our 0.125. I like that size. Click on this edge here. Click on that edge there. You could even click on this entire face and look at that. All right. And let's say we want to add that and that too. Hit the green check. Now you have a very interesting looking model. All right. Now, let's enhance it with some colors. Select these four faces for the holes. Now, go to the appearance, the beach ball. Hit the little arrow to the right of the big beach ball. Go to face. And let's go to plastic. Actually, let's have them illuminated. Go to lights. Go to, I actually like the neon tube. It's actually pretty neat. And let's go to blue neon. Or actually, let's go green just for fun. Hit the green check. And if you want, you could also go here. If you want the whole body, you could just go ahead and click on the part at the top here. Right click, go to the beach ball. And right here, this is for the entire part. So anything you change is going to change except when we select those faces, that trumps the overall part. So here we can go to part and let's go to plastics, high gloss, white high gloss. Green check. And hit your space bar, go for isometric, and let's turn on perspective. And you could also try ambient occlusion, see how it darkens it there. That's not realistic. These are supposed to be glowing. So let's see what it does when we render it. Go to the render tools. And remember, you may not have the render tools. If you don't, don't worry about it. It, it is what it is. It is an extra module. So click on integrated preview. 
And again, I have a slower computer. It's a, it's a bit dated. dates back to uh, several years ago. And you can see those holes are kind of glowing. It's not the best rendering right there. But you can have a little fun with it. I wouldn't recommend the lights for the inside there. I, I don't like how that looks. It's kind of blah. All right. And that concludes. Oh, before I do that, if you want to make a portfolio, those of you in my class, here's how. There is actually, if you type in E0 SOLIDWORKS, you'll see a whole video on how to make portfolios with more rendering in it and things like this. If you have, there's a product called LibreOffice, L-I-B-R-E, Office. Just type it and Google it. It's free. You could use that. I'm going to click on it. And there's also Microsoft Word. I have an old version, Word 2010. And let's see the differences here. All right, here's LibreOffice, and it looks similar to Word. Here's Word. Now, let's say we want, I'm not happy with that rendering, but we'll use it. What the heck? While it's rendered, hold Alt and hit Print Screen, especially if you have multiple screens. It will only pick up what's selected. Now, here's Microsoft Office. I could type in E1, Control, hold Control, and hit V as in Victor. And it should drop in a printed screen. Some of you might want to leave this here to prove that you modeled in SOLIDWORKS. Others, feel free in here. There is actually a crop. Let me, uh, if you go to View, I'll actually click on this first. Go to Format, and there's Crop. And then you can just grab these corners and crop out what you don't want to see. Click off of it, and then you have the ability in Word to enhance it. Like there's corrections, so you can lighten it so it blends in more with your sheet of paper. You have a little fun with it. There's a bunch of different things in there. Now, if you don't have Word, here is LibreOffice, which is free. E1, Control-V, same thing almost. Click on here. If you right-click, Crop appears on the drop-down, and really it works pretty much the same way. Now, one nice thing about LibreOffice is it allows, it doesn't anchor it to the left every time. So you can move this anywhere you like. You can drag this out. Just don't grab the middle. Then it stretches it. And when I'd see portfolios like that, I'd cringe. Because it's like, oh, it's not how it's supposed to look. You want it to look proportional. Okay, now here, notice this one can't really be moved. So to move it, you right click and you go to wrap text and go to either behind or in front of text. And then you're able to move it wherever you want. And then you just move on down to the next one. You could go to insert, page break, and now you could start an E2 or lab to whatever. Okay, and just copy and paste those in. So there are some tips and tricks for making a portfolio. My students, you have the option. You could either turn them in, the exercise in the labs, at the end of the semester with a portfolio like this, or save them as PDF and send them to me as you go. Whatever, however you work best. Uh, a portfolio in the end is not required. I just need to see the actual PDF part files or a Word document. Don't send me the part files. You'll clog up my email system in no time. All right, so please just make, uh, do it this way, and that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a good day. Welcome. Today we're going to take a look at exercise two in SOLIDWORKS 2021. As you can see here, this is our goal to create that model. We're not going to create quite that detailed, but we're going to get pretty close. And what it is, it's using the Revolve feature, but inside the Revolve feature, we're going to look at the sketch. We're going to do some mirroring, both um, feature mirroring, which is 3D, and as well as 2D sketch mirroring. So let's begin. Go to File, New, and I have the ANSI A inch setup. You could use Part, or if you are set to Novice, just use Part. Either one is fine. Uh, the ANSI A inch, again, because I'm here in the United States, that's the one I end up using here. And apparently I must have saved my template with the part in it, so um, I'm just going to go to File, New, and just select Part there and hit OK. All right, you'll see I have front, top, and right planes. 
we're going to first go to the little gear up at the top here and make sure we go to document properties. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you first how to set up and save a template specifically with our settings. So let's go to the drafting center, make sure it's set to ANSI, ANSI, and go to units and make sure it's IPS and set it to three decimal places. All right. Now, just to be on the safe side, I think I'm going to just make sure because it seems as though something strange is happening here. Um, if you have a look here under ANSI, you'll see that there's GHOST, DAN, ISO, which you could switch between pretty easily. And I'm not going to show you exactly the differences between those. You could actually tinker with those if you like. But then um, let's just make sure I set that back. And we look good. Hit OK. Now this is how to save a template. Go to File, Save As. Now this is a part template. You could do the same with parts, assemblies, and drawings. And right down here where it says SolidWorks Part, make sure you go to, you want to find, there it is. Uh, let's see. You want to find Part Template. So right here, P-R-T-D-O-T. -T. That's a native SOLIDWORKS template. And it will take you to the templates folder here. We could remove or copy over an old one. So if you like, you could type in ANSI A inch. And so that way you'll have the same thing. And go ahead and hit save. And I'll hit yes. Now what we want to do to make sure we don't make that as a part file every time, like what you saw earlier where I had the exercise one part up, uh, just make sure you do this to be on the safe side. Do a file, save as, and we're going to go to desktop. Make sure it's set to part, and we're going to name this E2 for exercise 2. And that way, just for kicks, let me show you now. If we went to new part, our ANSI int should be in there. When we click on it, the preview should be blank. We shouldn't see our model like I did earlier. If you rewind, you can see what had happened with that. Okay, let's go and... If you go to the vertani1.com and then instructional manuals and basics, SolidWorks basics, you'll be able to pull up this document and scroll down to page 28. And our goal is to make this wheel that you see here. And here's a cross section of the wheel. So it's using the revolve feature. And there's some tidbits of advice down there uh, that you could read on your own. But uh, there, here's the instructions, what we're going to create. And I'm going to zoom up a little bit and see this sketch. That's what we're going to end up making. There's all the dimensions for it. And we're going to start by drawing one half of it like here with a vertical and horizontal center line locked into the origin. We're going to mirror it across and create our model. So let's go select the front plane, start a sketch, go to the little arrow to the right of line. And now if you did lab, 1B. We use the centerline tool. I showed that to you briefly. So this is a review for those of you who have done that. If you haven't done the lab yet, it's new to you today. So go to centerline. Now hover just directly above the origin. You'll get the line of inference. It's a little dashed line. Go ahead and click and then connect to the origin when you get the orange dot. Click again, drag to the left, make it about five inches or so. And then to end the line chain, there's a couple things you could do. If you want to just get out of the centerline tool, you could hit escape on your keyboard, or you could double click, and that's the left mouse button that you're clicking on, and that will end the line chain, or you could right click and select end chain. But I'm gonna hit escape. I just wanted to show those tools to you. Now, hit the little arrow to the right of line, click on line, you no longer want centerline now. Glide over this edge just to the left of your pointer, now you get, do get some feedback down here. You can see one, one uh, roughly about a half inch or so, 0.4-ish is good. Make sure you're on it. Get the little yellow square to the right of your pointer with a point on it, which indicates that you're on it. Click. Drag this straight up about an inch or so. Click. Drag to the left about 0.4-ish. Click. Drag and we're going to draw at a slight angle like you see here, like a wing on an airplane. And don't connect it to the, to the, uh, Center line, just get 
directly above it like I have it. Click again, drag to the left about an inch, click, drag it up about an inch or so, maybe a little bit higher, click, drag to the left about a quarter of an inch, so 0.25-ish, and then straight down and connect to the center line. Click. Now hit Escape. Now you can see those are the relations that we have there. Like if we wanted to get rid of one like this one, we could click on the vertical and hit Delete on our keyboard. But now this happens. And we don't want that. So I'm going to hit Control Z and Control Z again until I get that back. I could re-add it by clicking and then the quick launch gives me make vertical as an option. So you can do that as well. All right, now that we have the geometry, we're going to go ahead and mirror this across. So to do that, just simply uh, click and drag across from here. Make sure that that vertical center line is not completely in your envelope that you're creating right now. See how I have like a little gap there? That way, when you go from left to right, it only picks what's inside the envelope. Anything that's sticking out of it isn't part of the selection. So once you have that selected, let's go now to mirror entities. You can also control select if you hold control and click on each individual one if that's too much for you. Okay, that's how we mirror. We just select what we want and then we select a center line to mirror across it uh, in this case, it was part of our envelope, and it was inside the selection, that horizontal center line right here, because it was completely in that, like when I did this, completely in it. Now, notice this didn't get picked. Now, if I go from right to left, we get the opposite effect. Well, not exactly opposite, but it picks everything, even things that aren't completely in the envelope. All right, now it might not be a bad idea to get rid of some of these. We're getting to the point where we're getting pretty advanced here. We don't need to see all these green squares. So if you want to turn them off, it's up to you. I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go view, hide, show. And what we're looking for are sketch relations. And this will remember it on this computer if you keep reusing it. Uh, and it won't turn them on again until you do. But the nice thing about it, if you need to see them, you just click on a line and any relations that are related to that will show up automatically. So click off of that or hit escape. Now we're going to add the dimensions. So let's go to smart dimension. Now let's click on this vertical center line to this left edge. Now notice if I keep it inside this little area here, it gives me the, the exact spacing, but something, here's an interesting phenomenon inside SOLIDWORKS. Move it to the right of the center line, and now it gives me what would be a diameter. It's almost a preview dimension of what that hole diameter is going to be. So it's very useful in this case because that is a hole. So click to the right and click. And let's see if we look at a training guide here. That's going to be 0.75. So click in there, 0.75, and hit Enter. And everything should get scaled for us. And we're going to move our, make our way from the inside out of the wheel. So go ahead and click on this. Now be careful not to get at midpoint, just so the line turns orange. Stay away from the points. Click. Now, this is a neat tool. I didn't used to like it. I kind of dig it now. But basically, it remembered our last selection, and that... That way, it's actually giving us an angle, which we don't want, but just hit Escape on the keyboard one time, just once, and it will remove that earlier selection. And now we could just click over here and make that 0.4. All right, now here's how to do an angle dimension. Select the angle line, stay away from points, and then select a line you want to show the angle related to. So this vertical line to the right, click. Now make sure you get the dimension between the two lines and click and type an 18. Now go ahead and select these two lines here and here. Drag this to the left and let's type in 0.25. Now go ahead and select this point here. It's very rare I ask you to select a point because I, I believe in saving time usually, but in this case we need it. And then select the center line. And we don't want this one inch. Remember, if we move to the right, we get the diameter. Now go ahead and click and make that two. Hit enter. Now while that dimension is still highlighted in blue, it was selected, take a look over on the left here. Now on the left, we have the ability to add tolerances. Like if we want the basic bilateral limits, min, min max fit, you could put this information in or not. 
uh, how, how many units precision you want. You could also, um, down here, you could put in notes. And what we're looking for is the quick little library that's below at the bottom diameter. Select that and hit the green check. Now it's interesting, somehow I managed to delete or I never achieved getting that line vertical there. Yours probably didn't do this. So to fix that, all I have to do, watch this, click and right there, make horizontal. And there it is. Okay, now let's go to Smart Dimension. Click on this line right up here, stay away from the points, drag it straight up, click 0.25, click on this line right here. This is going to be two, and we're almost done. Now select this line again, and in theory we didn't have to do that um, because it remembers the last line selection, but I forgot about that. Go ahead and select this center line, and now drag it to the right of the center line, and click and make that five. And let's go ahead, just as a reminder, go ahead and select the diameter symbol and that will add it in. If we want, we could add it here too. Now, what's the point of doing this, you might ask? Like, um, you know, it's a 2D sketch, it's a preview, do we need to do this? And no, you don't need to do it. But if you, some companies have people who do detailing, sometimes the designers themselves do the detailing, that's when you make a 2D layout and drawing. And this is just a courtesy to add that little diameter symbol. Now it's interesting, they add the diameter symbol behind this. So I'm not sure if that's a glitch or if maybe that's an ANSI standard. Never tried that before. Anyhow, I, I think that might be a glitch, but I might be wrong. Now we're ready to go ahead and revolve this. Now to revolve it, hit escape. And you have to pick, there, when there's multiple center lines, you have to pick the center line you want to spin it around. So we want the vertical center line. That's our spin center. And go ahead and pre-select it. Go to Features, and now go to Revolve Boss Base. And it should spin around that center line. Now, does it have to be a center line to spin around? No, it could could have actually been a solid line. We might have had some problems though with SolidWorks because uh, we would have had to go through some additional selections to ensure that it picked the proper boundary conditions. But there we go. So click off of it. Now hit F as in fit for zoom to fit on your keyboard to center that. Now we're going to go to the fillet tool and add some fillets. Go to fillet. And I've talked a little bit about this before, but uh, SolidWorks is kind of a rare boat here. There's only a couple CAD systems that I've seen do this. And the ability to put fillets on a face, and it's such a time saver. Let's make sure fillet is selected. Let's set this, uh, keep it to point one. Click right on the surface. Now notice the symbol to the right is a square. That's the surface symbol. If you get an edge, you get a vertical line. And you see the edge highlights orange too. You could do that if you like, but I like saving time, so I'm going to click right there. Now I'm going to rotate with my wheel. Remember the middle wheel, if you push it down and hold it and then move your mouse up or forward, you could see the underside. Now go ahead and select this face here. And let's bring her back down. And let's go ahead and select this face here. And I should have left that on the other side. I, I forgot, but go ahead and select that face down there too and hit the green check. All right, so faces are very nice. They just fill it the entire topology, which that's explained in exercise one. Now let's go to the fillet tool again, and let's add a larger fillet. Now you can integrate different sizes fillets inside one fillet feature. However, um, I'm not showing you that just yet. That, that could get a little confusing sometimes for a new user. All right, now here we want to select the edges, but What's interesting here, once a face is filleted, or an edge on a face is filleted, if you select the whole face, it will just fill it what's available to fill it, i.e. this edge. So it is easier sometimes to select the face. Go ahead and try it. And notice it puts that big fillet right there, and this one is unaffected because it already has a fillet. It's been trumped by the earlier fillet. Now let's use our, what I call the Superman X-ray vision to get the one on the inside. Rather than rotating, which you can do if you like, Go ahead and hover over this until you find that orange edge, which is it's seen through. It's like x-ray seen through to select that edge on the other side. Go ahead and hit the green check. And so now we have those larger fillets there. Now, this is all you have to do for this exercise. I just really wanted you to carry out what you see here. Now, what I'm going to show you next are some advanced functions, and it's going to make it look like what you saw earlier 
when we see um, I'll go window and we'll tie, uh, tile horizontally back and let's get rid of that one that was an accident and we could go to window we could tile vertically if you want there we can see them better this is our goal to create something that looks similar to that you can see there's a lot of complexities uh, it, it really is actually pretty easy to do and so we'll see how that's all done on this so let's begin first of all maximize this and let's select this face right here and start a sketch I'm going to show you the rib tool the rib tool I would consider a more advanced tool so normally you won't see this in an intro class but let's have some fun click on your space bar and then go to the top or control 5 now find the spline tool now if you, if if you're worried if you haven't really gotten good at clicking on things just use a line for this next thing because that's a lot easier I'm gonna use the spline now the spline is a freeform tool it gets to this quadrant right here and you see that little point up here click now um, get it up about uh, almost straight up well, we could go straight up right in the middle here around about so it doesn't have to be perfect just have a little fun with it click and now get this in to the that edge right about there not all the way to the outside just right about where my pointer the third ring that's showing up click so we're given a little bit of a, a bow to this so now hit escape after that and you should have this what looks like an arc but it's actually a spline it's not continuous if you were to measure it all right now that we have that let's go ahead and uh, you can see you can click on this point and reduce the bow if you want stay away from those little arrows those will give you some weird things and it might not work with what we're about to do all right now that you have that we could rotate a little bit let's go to features and find rib when you click on the rib tool you can see it's going to the right so you have to click here and normal to sketch so then it's going to go down now you normally don't want to go up with the rib because it has to have a place where it ends so that's why i drew it up top here and it's going to go downward now here's the wall thickness for the rib we could add draft while we have it on there but i'm going to go ahead i'm not going to add draft i don't want it too complex i'm just going to go ahead and hit the green check and you'll see it will put in the rib as you see it there and you could click off of it and we've just added that now let's mirror that to the other side select the rib now we've seen how to mirror sketches which were 2d and does anyone remember what the geometry you mirror across was what what was it in 2d it wasn't the line it was a center line dashed line okay now when you're doing it in 3d a 3d like in this case this looks like a fin or a vein what do we use we haven't learned that yet this is what you do hold control and select the top plane you actually use planes or flat faces of other geometry to mirror across now our top plane by holding control we select we have both the rib and the top plane selected for us in advance and you can see the top plane runs right through the center of our part so it will mirror across that just like a, a pane of glass with the mirror it would mirror across it you'd see through it so it's kind of cool all right just click on mirror and you'll see a preview down below right there sorry about the zooming I'm getting a little carried away there hit the green check and so now we have it on both sides now we're going to go ahead and pattern this so let's um, hold control and select the rib and the mirror because we want both of those to be patterned in a circular array of sorts now underneath linear pattern hit the little arrow and find circular pattern okay the first thing we need we could click on the outside of the wheel and mine's going to equal spacing 360 degrees and I have 15 instances uh, go ahead and just make sure equal spacing selected 360 degrees should automatically pop in and set it to 15 don't set it beyond 15 it might be too much for it to handle and it might choke it might just take a long time and then give you an error message saying I can't do it because when they intersect each other it's very complex all right so there we have our veins now let's put some fillets on here go to the fillet tool all right and set the fillet the radius to point zero uh, point zero four 
and select this face right here and just sit back and wait. It's going to try and fill it the entire topology. It takes a minute. There it goes. Hit the green check. Okay. All right, now let's rotate around the other side. I keep uh, zooming up. Sorry about that. And let's do the same thing. Could we have done them both? Yes. It would have been slower, though. I'm not sure if it's exponentially slower, but uh, I just do one at a time. So click on that face there. And just wait. My computer is uh, a Xeon from 2014, so it's, it's kind of old. Yours might do it a lot faster on a newer computer. Or if you're on a laptop with a very slow processor, it might take longer, so just give it some time. Okay, now go to fill it, and let's set it to something smaller. Now point zero three, and select. Try selecting this face here. Now this one's going to take even longer. There we go. Just do one at a time. Don't get carried away trying to get the other one done. I actually saw where it failed the second one I tried to do when I tried to do them all together. Rotate around. Let's get this side. Um, sometimes students ask, could you mirror this? You can try. Sometimes mirroring uh, surprises me. Other times I, I won't even try because I just suspect it's not going to do it. And in this case, my suspicion is that it won't mirror it easily. So just easy to put it in. All right, so now we have those filleted. Looks really complex now. And what you're making here is a pretty impressive portfolio piece. Now we're going to put in those cutouts. So to do that, let's hit our space bar, go to front, select the front plane, start a sketch. Okay, now we could go over here to wireframe and we could see the insides. Go to the circle tool. And right here on this center point, click and drag on a nice size circle. And let's go to Smart Dimension and make it 1.5. Now go to the Circle Tool again. And right up here, well, actually, this is where our rib is. Don't get the midpoint of that. and Stay away. Like Kind of get it close to where I am at, if you could eyeball that. And I'm not liking exactly where mine is. In fact, it's probably too far, but that's okay. We'll add a dimension. Select this point to this edge. And let's see what one inch does. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, if yours gives you an error and it says it can't do it, delete your circle and just redraw it. Make sure it doesn't lock into anything other than an edge. All right, and then we'll make this one inch in diameter. All right, now we're going to make a little interesting feature down in here. Uh, what I'd like you to do is find the straight slot tool. Actually, you could do center point straight slot. And right here, see this looks like kind of like a pyramid type thing. Try and get, actually, yeah, the midpoint. That We do want the midpoint if you can find that. Click, drag this straight down about 0.25. Five, um, or actually straight up about 0.25. Uh, 0.3 is good. Click, drag that out just like so. Click, and let's dimension that. And we're going to make that diameter, let's see, 0.16 actually. I like that one. And then you could click on the center line and give it a dimension of 0.6. All right, now we can mirror that stuff across. So hit, go to center line, find center line there. And right at this point here, just click and drag it to the origin. Hit escape. And now we're going to hold control, hit escape, and then select this, hold control. Uh, you know what? We're going to have to group select, just like that. Then hold control and select the center line. And we have two center lines, so you know what? We might have an issue there. Let's just go to mirror entities. Ah, it did it. Okay, cool. It must have ignored the vertical center line inside of the slot. Okay, now that we have that, let's 
draw one more sound line. I should have drawn this one earlier, right off of the origin. Drag it straight up, hit escape. Click on that center line. Now let's go to features. And before we go to uh, revolve, let's turn it back to shaded. And if you want, you could rotate. See, we can see our geometry there. Oh, it's going to notch out this. I don't like that. Um, yeah, that's too deep. Let's see here. Double click on this. Let's make it. Oh, not that one. Sorry. Double click on this. Make it 0.1. Let's see if that makes it smaller. Nah, it's still not what I like. 0.05. Eh. Anyhow, um, we'll probably go even lower than that. 0.04, so it doesn't touch the edge. There we go. And you'll see how to make a cutout slot. That's cool. All right. Now select this center line. Go to revolve. And, and again, don't panic. I'm going through it rather fast. This is just for fun, this part. And if you want to re just rewind and see how it's done, you can. Okay, now I'm going to go to revolve cut. Now cut is to remove material. Go ahead and hit the green check mark when you're done. Okay, now look at what it did. It cut in that little slot there. It cut out the, all this geometry, which, holy wow, that looks complex now, doesn't it? Let's go to fill it. And uh, let's set it to 0 0.025. And select this face here. Give it some time. And it's fill it in everything. Hit the green check. Now that's some significant modeling computation going on there. Okay, now these, if you go ahead and select these faces holding control, I think my keyboard just went out. Hold on. No, there we go, okay. Now adding a fillet to these really looks amazing especially during the render there is a tool inside the photo renderer if you have it that will automatically like put a little tiny fillet on edges like this but um, I'm not going to show it to you just yet. and then we could select this we can even select that edge let's go to fill it and should remember the 0.025, which is good. It's thinking. I probably should have saved it. That would have been a good idea, just in case it crashes, especially when you're doing complexities like this. Okay, there we go. And if you want, you could get the other side, but let's give it a minute. There it is. All right. Very, very impressive looking piece. As you can see there, um, I didn't fill out the bottom ones. But now let's take a look at rendering this. Like uh, we can go ahead, select the model, go over here to this uh, tool, and let's go to glass, and let's go to thick gloss, and just double click. That will make that glass. Now we could select individual faces if we want, or we could select like this face right here. This one would be really cool to add color to as well as, oops, not the dimension. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to go back to the beach ball there. And for this one, I like, I've been tinkering with this car. I like some of the, I like cars, so these are pretty cool. Like, I'll try candy apple red, double click. And actually, maybe this one would look cool too. Let's add that. Now, what we could do, I showed you some other tricks last time where you 
right click on the surface you could copy the appearance and then click where you want it and paste the appearance oh it didn't do it okay let's get let's just do that again it says it's there okay that's strange all right now let's hit the space bar go to isometric and if you go here to view settings go to perspective now perspective gives a vanishing point and be aware also that you might not have this rendering tool so under solidworks add-ins if you have photo view 360 you have it you have to have solidworks premium in order to do that uh, if it's not there you probably should have the core product so um, anyhow it still looks neat even like that let's go to integrated preview so i hit the renders tool tab give it time the more um, the more cores you have or threads on your computer as i described before the faster this renders and as you can see there with the glass effect that takes longer it's much more intensive we could do a control alt delete here to see the uh, keyboard i have to change my battery i go to performance we're using all 16 threads you can see they're all at 100 percent memory is not too bad 7.9 out of 32 gigabytes it's not too shabby. it's 25 percent the memory disk gpu next to nothing now I could actually hear my fans speeding up. And now you have this amazing rendering that would just look fantastic in someone's portfolio. So that concludes this exercise. Now, those of you who are taking my class, there are the two, uh, two labs. So there's the bolt. Yeah, this IMT-103, that is not necessary for my class, my students to do. If, it's just if you want to challenge yourself, you can try that one out. And then there's the quiz, quiz one. And so if you want to give those a shot right now, go ahead, pause my video. I am going to go through how those are created, though, right now. Okay, so as we can see here, we have a 1.7 diameter shaft. Uh, the, overall, the bolt is 2 inches. And then we have some 0.1 parameters. The diameter is 0.5 for the shaft. And the, the top is 1 inch. And it has a dome on the top. So let's go ahead and see how that one's done. All right. So I'm going to save my exercise there. I'm going to go to New. My ANSI inch. Or you could use part, whichever you prefer. I'm going to select the front plane, start a sketch, and I'm going to do that bolt. So for the bolt, we could do it a couple ways. We could go out here about 0.25, and then I think it was 1.7, and that comes out a little bit, another 0.25-ish. Let me zoom up here. And then about 0.1 high, and then across, we could infer to the origin. Now uh, you, you're wondering, like, wait, what about the head of the bolt? I'll show you a cool little trick for that. Okay, my keyboard battery's going bad. i got to change that. All right, so um, now we don't need a center line necessarily here, but if you want to get that little dimension, like uh, I was showing you, like this, where we get a smart dimension between this now just to show you if i don't select this R line this is what i get i can't get the diameter so i'm gonna delete that but here if i select this and then the center line oh i selected the point let's try that again there we go there i could get the actual diameter oh darn Okay, if I get this where it's, I'm going to put 0.25, but watch this, you have another option here. Under leaders, you could display as diameter. So there's a couple ways you could do that. And we'll put the diameter symbol in just for fun. Okay, this, the head of the bolt, 
should be a one inch diameter. So as you can see, we're using all the tools that we've tinkered with. Let's go back and take a look at that document. Okay, one, uh, we're at, yeah, it is 1.7. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this, escape, 1.7. And then this might happen to you. If that happens, hit escape. My escape key is no longer working because my keyboard's dead. All right, now we can go over here, put this one in as 0.1. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to do it here. Instead, you can use this little guy here. I have no battery power left. That's all right. Let's just leave it like that. Okay. So now I go to features, revolve boss base, hit the green check. Now you know to put the right dimension in. That should be 0.1. I'll select this face. And here's a neat little tool, very unique to SolidWorks. Uh, insert features. Now we're using the pull down menu. And if you're wanting to pull down menu, you have to, if it's not showing up, it has to be tacked in. Like it normally looks like that. Oops. But see this little arrow? If you click on that, you get the pull down. I always tack it in. All right. So where was I? Insert features. And notice there's no dome icon that was out there. So it's not all that commonly used. Now you have an elliptical dome you could use. And it looks like we're getting some weird phenomenon there. Or non-elliptical, uh, hit the green check. And you can see we've got the dome. And actually, let's edit the feature. I believe that needs to be a bit higher. Probably 0.2 if I'm correct with my math. All right, so that's how you could put a dome on. Otherwise, you just draw an arc across in the sketch and make sure that the back line goes up two inches. Now to make that little cutout, because uh, my keyboard's dead and I don't want to stop the video, I'm just going to go to sketch and we'll go over here to the front view orientation. I'm going to draw a center line. So the cutout for the screwdriver head needs to uh, look like this. It's going to be a line. Get on this edge. Get it down there. Get it on this edge here. Double click to end that line chain. Now, I'm gonna turn off the line because uh, I want to mirror this. So I'm gonna click and drag a fence around that. And you can put the dimensions in according to what you see in the print. But I'm gonna go over here to mirror entities and now I have my little slot, or it appears. Now we're gonna cut that. So we go to features. Extrude cut, and we're going to go through all, both. And now this arrow ensures that if you flip it, it's going to cut everything inside. Otherwise, if it's outside, you have to flip the arrow. So you see flip side to cuts right there. Hit the green check, and there's our cutout. Now to get the thread and the chamfer, the chamfer, you just select this edge and go to chamfer. And again, because mine is dead, I can't put in, oops, let's just go with the 0.9 because my keyboard's dead. Now this, you could actually, there's a couple things you could do. Um, you could actually add the thread through the appearances. If you go to miscellaneous, I, I believe, um, or let's see here, pattern. And there's screw thread. And normally you could go in there and edit it. There's a little arrow that allows you to change it. Um, you pull it, but again, my keyboard's dead. My apologies. All right, and that's just a cosmetic thread. Why cosmetic thread? Well, cosmetic threads are much more stable. They're much more uh, less intensive on the computer. 
if you use the, there is a thread tool. There's actually three ways to make a thread, a real true thread. There's a new through tool that came out about a year ago and it's in there. I'm not going to go through it in this exercise. Look it up if you like. And it's really cool. It's really easy. It has standard threads in it and it will actually make a real thread. But be aware, you don't always want real threads unless it's for the purpose of actually manufacturing that bolt. If it's just an off the shelf component, use this. Use, you don't even have to do this, um, but you can use cosmetic thread because otherwise, if you have a million bolts with those threads, the threads are so complex. It's going to slow your computer down. You saw how long it took to fill it when we were trying to put fillets in. Imagine that works the same way when you have tons of threads for a million bolts. So just be careful how you use it. And now let's take a look at the quiz. Now I don't want you to watch the quiz when you do this, but I'm going to give some pointers on how to do it. So the quiz, as we can see, let's go to I'm not going to show you how to do that part there. All right, we have a six by three by one inch thick and a 0.75 thick boss and four holes. Um, I'm just going to show you the very basics. And one reason why is because I want you to do it on your own. Start a sketch on the top plane. This is one of those instances where that will work. Go to the rectangle tool and I'm not putting the dimensions in, but you need to put the dimensions in those of you who are in my class. And I'm going to go ahead and put one of the circles there. I'm going to use the mirror tool. And remember for the mirror tool, we need to have center lines. Oh, my keyboard worked. All right. Now I'm just going to click that. And keyboard's working for a moment here, but still I'm just showing you some strategies. So we want to mirror that across. So we're going to mirror entities. Now I could click on these, get those two selected, hold control, select that, mirror entities. I don't like to put the circle in right away because then you end up having to cut it twice. So I don't need to do it that way. So go to extrude. Again, make sure you put the dimensions in according to the book. You could use a little handle here. This needs to be one inch thick. Hit the green check. Now select this face, start a sketch draw at the center, draw your boss, and again make sure your dimensions are correct. Go to features, extrude boss. This boss is only 0.75 in height. Hit the green check. Now select this face, start a sketch, draw the hole that goes through. Go to features, extrude cut, and through all. Hit the green check. You will be required in my class when I grade your quiz. The dimensions have to be correct or else it's a point off for each incorrect dimension. Go to fill it and the fillet is 0.25 and it should be on the four edges. And you want to do the fillets first and then the chamfers. This gets filleted here too. And now go to chamfer. Someone said, oh, it sounds like you're saying chamfer, S-H. And yeah, that's just the way I pronounce it. You say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, chamfer, if you want to call it that, I, that sounds awkward to me. Um, I've only been, I've been using this CAD software for 25 years, actually 30 plus years. I always call it a chamfer, so that's what you like. Okay, now the chamfer. And my keyboard's dead again. Ugh. Oops, we got to get it on, down to a number that will work. Select one edge. It should go all the way around. And those dimensions are all on the print. Make sure you get those. And that concludes the quiz. Uh, but what you do for me, you're going to go to file and go to save as and save me a PDF. Adobe PDF and just uh, send that to me. Don't send me the model. And that concludes this exercise. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.
Welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at exercise three on SOLIDWORKS 2020. We're going to take a look at the functionality with regards to what you see up on the screen here, which is a, a ratchet. And uh, with that, we're going to look at extrusions with draft, some additional filleting techniques, as well as uh, you see the extruded text. We're going to actually engrave that text onto the uh, handle. And we'll see it, uh, how to create a plane and offset at the same time. Uh, and then some other additional features. So let's begin. Go to File, New. Make sure Part is selected and hit OK. Select the front plane and start a sketch. Now, what we're working off of here, if I go to Google Chrome again, you just want to put in Vertanu one.com. It'll bring you to the web page with the instructional manual and SolidWorks Basics. And I believe it's page 34. Yep. 35. And our goal, as you saw earlier, was to create that ratchet. We're going to start with the head. Now, SolidWorks, um, over the years, again, I've been teaching this about 22 years, uh, has evolved in such a way that in the past, we always used to want to start with the head or the handle. You wouldn't want to start with the transition section necessarily, just because of challenges, but almost any way will work nowadays. I mean, um, there are better strategies than others, but in this case, we're going to stick with the traditional um, and we're going to start with the head. So let's uh, begin by sketching. Go to the little arrow to the right of line, find center line, and off of the origin, make sure you get the little orange dot, click, drag up center line about an inch and a half in height, and then you can hit escape. Now take the line tool, I'll use the fast key for that if you want, and just over here in the lower left side, click and drag maybe one inch line at a slight angle similar to what I have up on the screen. Take a look just like that and then hit escape. Now notice it's not uh, in any sort of alignment with that origin. You want it a little bit of diff distance to the left and kind of centered, but you have flexibility. So if it's not exactly like that, don't worry. We're going to go ahead and add some dimensions to it. But before we do that, we want to mirror this across. Now, this technique I'm showing you is a technique that will eliminate you having to use the trim tools. In fact, today we will look at trim tools, but normally uh, techniques that were taught in the 80s for other CAD systems, where you draw circles to make that head and then you trim and have to make things tangent, just isn't the same as now. Now it's much easier. And that's what I'm showing you, this, this strategy I'm going to show you here. So I'd like you to apply the strategy for your labs. Actually, there's two labs coming up, lab four and lab three will incorporate the same technique. It literally mimics this exercise for the head. So uh, pay attention and you'll do fine on those. All right, now I'm just gonna hit escape and then I'm gonna click and drag a fence to surround the two pieces of geometry. I drew the vertical center line and the object line. Release it. And now go to mirror entities and it should just mirror it directly across the other side. Now we want tangent arcs based of, off of this. So find this little arrow to the right of arc tools and find tangent arc. With tangent arc, it's very simple. You just get to the vertex of one of the lines, click, release it, move it up and around. Don't stop at the middle, go all the way over and around. If you go directly across, sometimes it transitions to a different type of circle. So just be careful of that. That's why I kind of go over and around. Now let's do the same using that same strategy, but down and around. So click on this vertex here and down and around and connect. And that automatically made those ends tangent from the start points. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be tangent on the end points all the time, unless it's somehow an auto relation. But now we have the head of a ratchet, at least the profile. It should turn gray on the inside. If it's not, after you hit escape, then maybe delete the arcs and try putting them in again. There's a likelihood is you just missed the end point. Okay, now we're going to go to smart dimension. 
Dimension the bottom arc first, and that's going to be 0.6. And then dimension the top arc. Click, and that's going to be 0.75. Now dimension both arcs. Now, an earlier, if you're using an earlier version of SOLIDWORKS, for a while it was doing some odd things when you clicked on the arcs. Uh, don't click on any points of the arcs, per se, except maybe the center point. But uh, if you click on the arcs, then you can just drag this to the right. Those of you using earlier versions like 2018 or 2019, it might actually go to the quadrants up at the top. In that case, just select the center points of the arcs. It's just easier with that version. You later on can actually drag the endpoints of the extension lines down, but that gets a little bit complex from time to time. So anyhow, now that we have this, go ahead and drag it to the right and center that dimension. Click and go ahead and type in 0.75. And then you could go ahead and hit escape. Now, notice it's not fully defined yet. What we have to define is just the center point of the bottom arc to lock it into our origin. So hover over the center point at the bottom. See, it's a little cross, a little blue cross. Get over there, click, and hold down the mouse button as you drag it and connect it to the origin. When you get the little bullseye to the right of your pointer, like double circles, release it. And now it should turn black, which means it's fully defined around the outside. And that's what you want. If you didn't get that the first time, try dragging it down and then back up again. Sometimes students are a little too close to it. Um, and it just that slow or short distance movement, it won't automatically activate the automatic relation. So, okay, now that we have that, let's go ahead and go to features, extruded boss. Now we're gonna extrude this to prepare it for a mold. And actually, this is a forged ratchet body, so like a drop forging. And a drop forging is essentially a mold that has two halves, kind of like a double ice cube tray and smushing together a hot ingot of steel. And so for that, instead of blind, click on blind here and go to mid plane. And then the overall thickness is gonna be one inch so by going mid-plane, you'll notice it's dividing it a half inch on either side. So the, the sum is one inch. Now, we're going to add draft. And draft is typically used, it's our draft or taper. Some of you know it's a slight angle or that's put on items that are molded. And that's so it could pull out of the mold easier. If you've ever looked at an ice cube tray, the plastic ice cube trays, you'll typically see that there's a, a bit of a, a draft on all the sides. And that's when you um, try and pull it out, it pulls out easily. If it were straight, that ice cube would give you a lot of trouble trying to pull it out straight. So for molding, we add draft. So go ahead and click on this little draft icon here on the left and plug in seven for seven degrees. And you could see that it's actually squeezing them down the further they get away from the center. Now, there is a draft outward and that's sometimes useful. In this case, we don't want it, but go ahead and check it one time, just to, and look at the change that occurs. You'll see that will not pull out of a mold very easily at all. That's stuck for the rest of its life. So make sure you uncheck draft outwards, just so you see it tapered like mine. Okay, go ahead and hit the green check mark. Go ahead now and select the front face of that head and start a sketch. Now remember, if you if this evaporates too quickly, you could go to the Sketch tab up the top and click on Sketch. Now we're going to learn how to offset entities. With this face still selected, and the way you know it's selected, if it's highlighted in blue, it's kind of almost glows. Um, once you have that selected, you could find Offset Entities. Go ahead and try it. Click on it. And you'll see it will initially offset to the outside. Now, in other CAD systems, you could put negative numbers in and to reverse it. Um, SOLIDWORKS isn't consistent with that. There's some areas you can add a negative, some areas that you can't. In every instance, though, they almost always give you a reverse switch in lieu of a negative number. So see, there's a reverse checkbox under there, and it will flip it to the inside. So always look for the reverse. Very rarely do you have to type in a negative number. That's on older CAD systems, typically. Okay, so now that we have the reverse 
checkbox. Let's go ahead uh, and you'll see the inside there. Then, oh, and actually let's make it 0 0.125, 0 0.125, hit enter. You can hit enter two times to apply it and then you'll see it there. Now you can see the actual dimension appear right here and it's rounding it to 0 0.13. If you double click on it, you'll see it actually changes to 0 0.125. To five. Internally, SOLIDWORKS still keeps track of the additional digits, even though it's only set to do two decimal places. If you have something like this where you know it's it needs to be 0 0.125, while that dimension is in the selected state, at least click on the arrowheads or whatever. Over on the left here, you could set the document precision. So right here, uh, well, that's for tolerance. Um, but basically, uh, let's, let's look at the tolerance right now, and then we'll go to the document precision. But the tolerance precision allows you to go with basic, bilateral, limits, metric, min, max, and fit, uh, as well as some other options there. Let's go with bilateral just to see what that does. And you can see it puts the plus and minus on the right-hand side. And let's go ahead and set it down below here to three decimal places and set the plus tolerance to 0 0.00. Let's go with 0 0.005 and the minus tolerance 0 0.007. Those are just examples. We wouldn't necessarily really use those. I'm just so you can see this. Okay. And <clears throat> so there we have that. Okay. Now you do have this option here, same as nominal and options like that. You could adjust for the, uh, the dimension, tolerance precision. So go ahead and hit the green check mark. Now, also, if you want to set that up globally, and I showed this to you the first day, go to the gear up at the top and go to the document properties and find units. And right here, you'll see the length of units. And you could change it to up, uh, three decimal places for this class. But look at that, up to eight decimal places you could change it to. And now every dimension will show as three decimal places. So you, could, you have the ability to type in those tolerance precision uh, inform information right there as well. Okay, now that we have that, go to Features, go to Extrude and Cut, and let's set this to a depth of 0.125, hit Enter, and hit the green check. All right, we have a recess now, and I just wanted to share with you that you could also name these features that appear in the feature tree to whatever the, what's more relative than Boss Extrude 1, Extrude 2, and so on and so forth. To do this, cut extrude or boss extrude one. Let's say we want that to be called the head. Click once on it, wait a minute, uh, a second, and click a second time. It allows you to change the text. Go ahead and let's call that the head, H E A D. Now click on the cut extrude one once, wait a second, click a second time, and go ahead and call that the recess. So you could actually name these. Now you might think, well, I didn't need to name those, but remember these, you could have feature trees with thousands of features in it, and it might be nice to highlight certain features so that you could go back to them and find them easily. Now, go ahead and select the floor of the recess and go to your sketch tool right here and go to the circle tool. And the center of the circle is very easy to find because the origin is there. Click on that and you get the orange dot. Drag out a circle, about 0.3 for the radius. Now, this next one isn't as easy. We could locate it with the quadrant of the circle below it, but to wake up this, the true center point of the arc above here, hover your pointer over the arc. Don't click on it, just hover. Let it sit there for a second. And look at that, it will appear as a little circle with a cross in it. Click on that now drag it out and intersect this one with the actual other circle. So a radius of about 0.5-ish. Click. Okay, now I want to show you, uh, hit escape and hit the F key on your keyboard. The F key is for fit. Now I want to show you the trim tools. And in this instance, we don't really need the trim tools nowadays. SOLIDWORKS would allow us to extrude these volumes pretty easily might be a little bit of extra work. We're going to learn how to do that a little later um, in another exercise. But I want to show you how to use the trim tools. So find trim entities. Hit the little arrow underneath. Notice there's trim entities and there's extend entities. Pretty obvious what those do. 
Uh, Trim Entities actually has a lot built into it. It actually has the ability to uh, extend as well. But let's just go to Trim Entities, and you'll see you have these options. You have Power Trim, Corner, Trim Away, Trim uh, Away Inside and Outside, and Trim to Closest. My two favorite, and the ones that using SOLIDWORKS for 22 years, I really feel are the only ones that are truly necessary that I found, are the top and the bottom ones, Trim to Closest, and power trim. Every CAD system has power trim now, or something very similar to it. The way it works is, watch this, you just hover your pointer over the area that you want nearby where you want to trim, and you just click and hold down the mouse button as you drag, and it looks like it's scribbling here, and whatever you scribble through gets removed. You see how that just eliminated that. Release it. Don't go all the way through because I want to show you the next one, which is trim the closest. Go ahead and click on trim the closest. Now go ahead and just select with one click the geometry you want to get rid of. And there you have it. So there are two tools. You could tinker with the others. Um, again, some people really like those tools. I'm just not a, I just feel they're unnecessary. All right, now I'm going to go to Start Dimension. And I want to go ahead and dimension this bottom arc. So click and drag the dimension out. Let's make that 0.35. Now, Technically, we want a diameter for that hole uh, because it's just easier because this is giving us a radius. And the reason it gave us a radius is because it's an incomplete circle. There's actually a gap in it. So it's going to give you radius by default. Go ahead and apply this. And now over on the left to change it to a diameter so that later on, if you can recreate a drawing or create a drawing, it brings up these dimensions that you can retrieve. You don't want to see a 0.35. Someone might actually grab the wrong tool. Tool, excuse me for that. We go to leaders and right here in the middle, this little diameter, and it will convert it to diameter for you. It even puts a diameter symbol in it. Now you'll see it's 0.7, so it's twice the 0.35, of course. Let's go ahead and try that again. Click on the top arc here, drag that out, and make that 0.5. Oh, I'm sorry, no, not 0.5. Uh, here. And it's 0.5. All right. And hit the green check. And on the left, remember, go to the leaders tab while it's still in the selected state and click on diameter. And there we go. We're ready to cut that. So go to features, extrude cut, and make it 0.75 deep. We're not going to add draft on that one. That's a machine feature, so there's no need for draft. Click anywhere, and now we're going to put in some through holes here. Select this face, start a sketch, and hit your space bar, or you could go to um, Control 8, which is normal 2. If you select the floor of the reset of that pocket, you could go to normal 2, and it will align us normal 2. Now you're probably saying, well, we could have gone to the front. We could have. I just wanted to show you another tool. That's all. Now let's go to the circle tool and at the origin, once again, it's very easy to find that center and let's dimension that. I'm going to make that 0.35. Now we need another circle up the top there. So let's go back to the circle tool. Now here's your chance. I'm going to wait a second. And how do you wake up the center point? We learned that just a few minutes ago. Think about it. How did you wake up the center point to the top arc? Okay. All right, let's try it. You just hover over the arc. Let your pointer sit there, and it will wake up the center point eventually. There it is. Click, drag out your circle, and make it a little bit bigger. Maybe make it a quarter inch here, and then hit Escape. I want to show you how to relate those two to be the same size. And we've seen this in one of the labs. So if you've done the labs, you've already learned this trick. If not, here's how. Hold control down on your keyboard. Don't let go. Select both circles. And over on the left, you should see equal. Go ahead and select equal. Now they're both the same size. However, that, that 0.35 diameter should have a node in it saying two places or two X or whatever, however you dimension or note things. Click on it, on the actual, not on the text, but on the actual line, the extension. And 
Right here, you'll see in the dimension text, you'll see the DIM, and then you see the greater than symbol at the end, which is a bracket. Click after that, then hit enter to so it scrolls down. Now, rather than just do two acts or two, for two places, let's go ahead and type in two space, capital P-L-C-S, period, so two places. And again, that's not the ANSI standard. That's the standard where I used to work, one of the places I worked at at least. And I just wanted to show you how you could put in a custom node if you wanted to for any dimension. Click. And so now we know that both of those share the same size. Let's go to Features and Extrude Cut. Now, did we have to do that last feature? No, that last step, no, we did not have to. So just be aware, that's just showing you how to put notes in. All right, so we went to Extrude, rotate this a little bit, and now we know that it needs to go through all the time. So if you remember from day one, design intent. If something's going to go through, instead of going blind and later on having to change it, if something thickens, go through all to ensure that it's always a through hole. Hit the green check. All right, and there we have it. Now let's put some fillets on here. So go to the fillet tool and set your fillets to point one, which is the default. You could select this edge right here. And notice I'm selecting the edge versus the face because we don't want the inside filleted. There's going to be a cover plate that goes over that. So just this edge right here, click. And the bottom edge right here, click. If you accidentally get a face or something else, just click on it again. And it's like a light switch, it turns it off. So very forgiving. Hit the green check. Okay, so there is the head of our ratchet. Let's now move on to putting the transition section in. Now for the transition section, my strategy is going to be to create a plane offset from the top plane that is dragged down about four inches from the, the top plane, which is almost the bottom center of our model. So we're going to learn how to create a plane. And then we're going to draw on that plane a little circle, a half inch diameter, and extrude it up to the head, making the transition. So here's how to do that. Hit your space bar and go to isometric. Control 7 is the fast key. Click one time in the feature tree on the top plane, and you'll see it right there in, in the model. Now, hover your pointer over the thin blue line. Don't grab the dots. Stay away from the dots. Now, if, uh, just hover over that. Get ready. Hold Control. Don't let go of Control until I tell you. Now, with your pointer over the thin blue line, hold the mouse down, uh, uh, click and drag it down. And you can see it immediately starts to offset it. Uh, it might actually take a minute, uh, depending upon the speed of your computer. But anyhow, now you can release the mouse button and then release control. And over on the left here, we could actually type in an explicit value. Now look at this, these are different ways to make a plane. You have parallel perpendicular coincident at an angle, and we have offset. So we want the offset to be four for four inches and hit the green check. And there's several ways to create a plane. And over the course of this uh, 16 weeks, we're gonna go ahead and learn a few ways to do that. Now hit your F key on your keyboard and you should see the plane is floating down below. Let's go ahead and now <clears throat> select the edge of that plane and start a sketch on it. You'll see the origin projected itself down onto the plane. So now we could go ahead and click on circle and lock into that origin. When you get the orange dot, click, drag out a circle and go to smart dimension and dimension it at a half inch, so 0.5. Now you could go to Features, Extrude Boss Base, and if we drag this up, you'll see that pretty quickly we might accidentally intersect into the pocket. We don't want that. We want it to stop once it reaches the part and, not, and merge with it, but not go past it. So let's take a look at our direction options. So over here where we have blind, go ahead and select that. Um, as we go through them, look for the one that makes the most sense. How about up to next? Go ahead and select it. And you'll see it goes up to the, the body and it merges with it.
Now up to surface, some of you might think, well, couldn't we do up to surface? Notice that the surface is split into two surfaces and up to surface is not plural, it's singular. Let's just select only one of them and you would have a gap on the other side. So that's why you don't want to use that one in this instance. All right, go ahead and hit the green check. Now, what I recommend doing is hiding the plane that's floating down there. So you could actually right click. You can right click on anything and hide it. I just hover over it, right click. And the hide icon is the same consistently throughout SOLIDWORKS. It's always an eyeball and it has a little line through it. Go ahead and select it. Now, no fear if you ever need that plane again, it's right over here in the feature tree. And you could click on it and click on the eyeball to show it again. So uh, we don't want to do that right now. We just wanted to get it out of the way. All right, so now we're ready for the handle section. So let's select the front plane from the feature tree, start a sketch, hit your space bar and go to the front view orientation. Now with your pointer in the center of the screen, you could use your wheel and wheel backwards. So it zooms out a little bit. And if you want, you could pan a little bit. I, I just do it all with the zoom in and out with the wheel. Uh, remember the pan is actually um, control in the middle button. Actually, I never went through that with you, but uh, anyhow, so you just learned something new. Now let's go to corner rectangle. Now, some of you might, who are very savvy might say, okay, I would go with center rectangle, right? And lock it into the center. You could do that, but you would really want to have some sort of center line drawn in advance that it could lock into, or you could have a constraint holding control, select the center point of the center rectangle and the origin. I want to show you a technique that kind of gives you an idea of the strength of sketching and its ability to be manipulated so that we're going to do it a little differently. Go to corner rectangle, move your pointer over here to the right and click and just drag out a rectangle like, like that. Now go to the center line tool. Remember center lines to the right of the line tool. There's that little arrow, go to center line and find the midpoint on this rectangle at the top. When you find that midpoint, click and drag out a line. Make sure it's vertical, about three inches and then hit escape. Let's add our dimensions. Go to smart dimension, select this line here, make that four inches, that's the handle. Here's the bottom of the handle. That's going to be one inch. So click on that. And this dimension for the center line is going to be 3.75. You might wonder like, hmm, 3.7, why? Shouldn't it be four inches so it's right on the edge? Remember there's draft. And if we have draft on it, it gets smaller from the inside out. So we'd have a little sliver holding it on. So we actually want to have it converge into the transition section so we don't have that issue. And it's perfectly fine to do that. All right, hit escape once you have those dimensions out there. Now here's the thing, after you hit escape, simply grab, hover over that point at the top of the center line, click, drag it, holding your mouse button down and get it to the origin and be very careful, be patient and make sure it's bullseye. It has to be a bullseye, otherwise it's not gonna come out right. Release and your handle is now in position. It's centered. If we rotate, you can see it's in the middle. We're good to go. Again, there's multiple ways of doing that. I'm just showing you, I'm trying to give you the most bang for the buck in this case. Go to features, extrude boss space. Now this is going to be, instead of blind, it's going to be like the head of the ratchet. We're going to use mid plane once again. And it only needs to be 0.75 thick. Make sure your number lock is on. Mine seemed to have been turned off. Okay, now draft on and seven degrees, just like the head. Hit the green check. And there's our handle. Let's put some fillets on. Now fillets, just so you know, fillets, rounds, radiuses, blends, those are all names for pretty much the same thing. What in SOLIDWORKS we call a fillet. Fillets, from an engineering standpoint, are used for multiple reasons. Like in the case of a handle, we don't want, we want it nice and smooth around there so a sharp edge won't cut. But also it's for manufacturing, uh, especially when this is compressed in this mold. 
you want to have radiuses everywhere so that the material could flow. So there's more to it than that. And there's also aesthetics. It just looks nicer in some, in some cases. There's uh, multiple reasons for fillet other than just one item. So let's go to fillet, set it to uh, point one is fine. Select the four sharpest edges. That's the top and the bottom ones. And I'm going to use my x-ray vision here to get that one on the back side and hit the green check. Now go to the fillet tool again and 0.06. And you know, you can actually add multiple variations of these fillets inside one fillet feature. I like to break them out separately and you'll learn that in the advanced class when we start talking about configurations and such. But um, anyway, let's go ahead and now it's 60. Click on this edge and this edge here, this edge over here, and this edge to help it along there. And now the transition section needs to have fillets on the connections between the head and the handle. So just select right smack dab in the middle of the transition section. It automatically fillets everything around it. Go ahead and hit the green check. And there we have it. Now we're going to take a look at, this is some people really, my students seem to really enjoy this part, putting in your name or text engraved or embossed. The way you do it is let's say we want to put uh, something on the handle, our name maybe. Click on that surface, start a sketch, and now hit the space bar. And this one, you want to go to the top view orientation. Oh, not top, I'm sorry. Um, oh, just front, sorry about that. Okay, now that we're at the front, also let's rotate it. 90 degrees. So you could actually hold alt and hit the left arrow key one, two, three, four, five, six times. And that rotates in 15 degree increments counterclockwise, in this case clockwise. Now zoom up to that and hit the little arrow to the right of the line tool. Go to center line. First glance, students want to go centered on the center line throughout the whole part. The center line's objective is to rest your font or your text on the center line, not in the middle of it. So you want it offset if that if your intention is to try and center this, believe it or not. So that being said, watch what I do. I'm going to go down a little bit near here, click, and I'm not going to touch the edges because I don't want the text to touch the edges. So I'm going to stay clear of those. Now note, you could put dimensions on this line to locate it accurately. Not going to bother with that. That's, we're just having a little bit of fun right now. Once you got the center line, hit escape. Now that that center line's there, note you can move it, you can relocate it and shrink it, do whatever you want. But once you have that line drawn, now go to the text tool, click on text, and it automatically selects line one under our curves because that's what we had selected. If this is if this blue box is just blue, select your center line. You could select edges too, but we don't want it to rest on a tangent edge or a fillet. That wouldn't be good necessarily, at least in this instance. Now in text, I'm going to go ahead and just type in solid works. Now, if we want a different font, there are these, the ability to go to bold. I would recommend never using the bold on these fonts. Um, I've had it corrupt the font where the actual geometry is offset and it's no longer valid to extrude. So just be careful with the bold. The italicized works just fine. Um, where you do want to use bold is inside the, the font options here. But notice you could align, center line. So like, let's say I want center line, or I could even do this. I could full justify where it spreads it out. You have the ability once you go in here to change the width and the spacing. But let's turn off use document font and go to the font button. Now, what we're going to do is select a different font. So um, I think I'm going to go with something very basic. Oops, went too far. Let's see what we have here. They're pretty much the standard fonts. I just want to get past some of these. I'm going to go with Arial. Okay, now with Arial, 
here you have italics and you have bold. Again, be careful using the bold because it might actually thicken it and geometry might intersect, making it invalid for extrusion. So if you can find a bold version, because you can buy fonts online, there's tons of them. You can even find them for free. But um, anyhow, just a little piece of advice there. Now the units or points, we could go with either one. Let's go with units and set, set it to point three seven five and hit OK. And there, it should be pretty close to center. Again, now you could grab that line and drag it up or down if you want. I'm going to go ahead and leave it, hit the green check. And I'm going to go to features. And if you want to engrave it, extrude and cut. If you want it raised or embossed, use extrude boss base. I'm going to engrave it. I'm going to go with extrude and cut and only engrave it 0 0.02, so 20 thousandths, just a very subtle engraving. Hit the green check and then click. And there you have our engraved text. Okay, now moving on in the training guide, now to get to the labs. And again, this is where you might wanna pause uh, to do these labs, but uh, let's take a look at this L3 and there's L3B. I'm going to do L3B first because that's pretty easy and, and I'm not going to put all the dimensions. I'm going to give you the strategy for creating it, but I want you to put the dimensions in. So when I grade it, if the dimensions aren't correct, you're going to get marked off, but at least I'm going to give you the strategy because I'm going to try and wean off my students by the time uh, the sixth week comes around to where you're doing these labs pretty much on your own. I still give you some uh, help on that, but uh, anyhow. Okay, so here we see it's like a disc with some interesting features in it. There's a through hole, it's one inch, and it overall is one and a half inches in thickness, quarter inch for most of the actual dimensions, except 375 for that tapered cup-like thing. So let's get started. I'm gonna go new. Part, hit OK. I'm going to select the front plane, start sketch. I'm going to start this off with a center line right at the origin. And then take the line tool and proceed to draw that profile. And it kind of goes off like this. And, and look at this, you could find the angles. Look at that little symbol to the right. It's actually aligning parallel to the other angle. You can see because the other angle is actually highlighted. That's an automatic relationship of parallelism. That's what you want here. Click, drag this across, and let's take a look, a really quick look at that again. Okay, go in like so. Again, parallelism. And Sadly, I missed the marker a little bit, so I'm going to just connect there. And I'm going to control select these two lines after I hit escape, for, then control select those two lines and make those parallel. And now for the dimensions, I'm going to go ahead and select this line here to this line here, and that is going to be one and a half inches for the overall height. Um, here, Oops, I accidentally selected the point. Uh, let's just clear that, delete that out there. Oops. Let's just start over with that. Try not to select the points too often. This is supposed to be 0.25. If I recall correctly, I might be wrong. And then from here to here, these lines. And notice I'm getting parallelism. If you select the bottom line like I've taught you, because there's an angle there, you're not going to get parallelism. You're going to get parallel to the bottom line. That's not what you want. You want to follow those edges. So in this case, it's going to be 0.25 here. And from here to here, 0.375. And then this one here, we could go, oh, darn it, selected that little point again. Just hit the escape key. And 0.25. And then from the center, so that little point there to the center line, don't click on the points on the center line, drag it to the right. It's going to be one inch. And let's see what else we need here. Let's go back to the drawing. 
me see. Oh, uh, 2.25 and the angle of 25 degrees. So smart dimension from this line to this line, 2.25. And from this angled line to this line here, that's going to be 25. And let me just verify that. All right, we look good. Now we could go ahead and revolve that. So go to Features, Revolve Boss Space, hit the green check. And you're probably thinking, you never put the fillet in. Watch. Go to the Fillet tool, set it to a half inch, select that edge, and you're done. See what I mean? How this one's pretty easy. If you do it on your own, though, without watching the video, it takes you some time. I mean, it could take hours that if you're learning, but you're going to be extraordinary when you're done because you've learned, you will have learned so much. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and save that as L capital L three B. Now let's do this next one. Now I held off doing this next one because this one is tough. Uh, this one's going to take a bit longer. I'm going to go new part hit okay. Now for this one, you might want to download the document. Remember there's download, or if you already have it downloaded, you could just bring it up if you could find it. So I'm going to bring up my training guide and I could go to that page, which is page 43. There it is. And you could write, uh, let's see, did this not get, Oh, there we go. There's rotate. I had to right click and rotate. Sometimes it's in different locations, depending upon the browser that you're using. So, uh, oh, that's reload. No, that's not what I wanted. Um, darn it. Okay. I'm not seeing it here. There we go. Rotate. So I'm going to rotate, um, in this case, counterclockwise. There we go. Now that's using Firefox it, in Google. It's a little different. Right, so you can see with this one, we have something that's very similar to the head. And I, I told you that you will have two labs. Lab four, which is next week, is very similar to this one. It's uh, with just some changes to it. But this one incorporates almost every single thing we learned in exercise three. It's just, believe it or not, it looks different. It looks similar to the head though, doesn't it? Okay, so let's see how this is. We, we have a 0.6 at the bottom, a 1.5 radius at the top. We don't have tangency except at the bottom. This does not go tangent, so it looks kind of like an, the uh, Area 51 alien head. So we're going to have to create that. It's two inches center to center. So let's give that a try. Okay, front plane, start a sketch, center line. Go to the regular line, click add that line like so. And then our little trick, we click and drag a fence around both entities, mirror them, use tangent at the bottom, tangent arc. Now for this next one, we don't want tangent. Now we could have left tangent on and did some trickery, but um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the, the direct way. Use three point arc. Now a three point arc just, click and drag clear across. Now you can inflate it and look at that. There's no tangency though here. So now we get our area 51 alien head. So um, we're going to go to the bottom here and add our 0.6. Uh, we're going to go to the top here, add our 1.5. The distance between both arcs, so click on both arcs, is going to be two inches. The angle here is I think 35 from memory. And then we got to get that centered. So I'm going to hit escape here, grab that, drag it up like so. Oops, it didn't take. Drag it down and back up to snap it. And let's see what we have back on that drawing. Oh, wrong one. 
All right, so center 0 0.6, 1.5 to 35 degrees. We have that right. Okay. So we're fully defined. We don't need anything more. Let's go ahead and extrude that. Go to extrude boss base, and I believe it's 0 0.25, but you know what? Let me double check that. The overall height. Oh, jeez, I was way off. 0.61. And I do believe there's draft on there too. So before I go any farther, I do let's see. Typical draft is 16 degrees. So I click on this, bump that up to 16, hit the green check. Now this breaks conventional wisdom when it comes to modeling uh, what we're about to do. Uh, most of the time you put the largest fillets in first and then you work your way down to the smaller ones. This one, for some odd reason, at least in the past, let's see if it's maybe it's changed. If we put the larger one in first, sometimes we get an error message. So the largest fillet here needs to be uh, 0.5. And I think this is going to error out. And we have to put the smaller one in first. So, yeah, as you can see, there's no preview. So I'm going to deselect that. I'm going to click on that. And in, in lieu of that, we're going to go with the 0.25 on the front. So let's change this to 0.25. And this is just how modelers work. From time to time, reverse things and test it to see if it works. Fillets, blends, radiuses. Uh, if you can't accommodate it mathematically, it's just not going to do it. Okay, so there we have that. Now we go to the fillet again. Now we can put that big one on 0 0.5. Select that, hit the green check. All right, we're getting there. Now let's cut out the back. Select this phase, start a sketch. We're going to learn how to offset again. Remember we did that earlier. Go to offset entities. I think 100 thousandths and hit the reverse switch to the inside. Hit the green check. We're going to go to features. Extrude and cut. We want it to only go, according to the print, 0.25, and it does have the draft that matches the outside, so 16 degrees of draft. So go ahead and put 0.25 over here and 16 degrees. Hit the green check. Don't forget the 16 degrees of draft, or else it might sever it into two pieces. Okay, now let's put the hole in, select this face, start a sketch. I'm going to go normal two or to the front. I'm going to go to the circle. And remember, we had to locate the center. Here, we're not seeing the center wake up. Remember, the trick is to hover on the arc. And then it wakes up. Click, drag out your circle. This one's going to be a one inch through cut. Go to features, extrude cut, and through all. Now we have to put in that little rectangle. Remember how we made a handle? This time it's a, a keyway cut. So select this face, start a sketch. And we could use the same technique, if you want, that we did before. Draw a rectangle, small one, and then we'll center line at the bottom this time. And let's dimension that. It's going to be 0.25 and then this, uh, I don't think, just as long as it cancels out inside there. Or we can go two inches, just to be on the safe side and make sure it makes its way in there. Okay, now we just grab this. Oops, we forgot one dimension. It's 0.25 for the width. All right, now we could hit escape, grab this bottom center line, drag it to the origin, and we have it located. Go to features, extrude cut. 0.25 deep, and there it is. Now this does have text, and the text on here is wrapped. So to add a wrapped text, this is the trick. Select this face, start a sketch, and go, now let's just go to front. There we go. All right, take the, we're going to use center point arc for this. Line center point arc. Now center point arc is probably the toughest of all the arc tools because you have to locate three, really three points. You have to locate the center point and the two ends. So locate the center point first. 
then drag this out right about there click and drag it over and around just like so now we need to change that to construction geometry if you leave it solid like it's an object geometry it's going to give you some error messages so the way to change that um, you can either go right away over here to for construction and check that i'm going to do that and hit the green check the other method if you forget to do that you just click on it here and right here is the toggle switch it turns on and off changes it from construction to non-construction um, the difference is when it's construction geometry, it's somewhat innocuous as far as extrusions and things like that. Features can't really be constructed from that geometry for cuts or for extrusions, but it's still good for resting text on or for aligning things too. All right, now we're going to go to uh, select it, go to the text tool, and I'm going to go ahead and put in ECC. Or better yet, I'll put in Elgin. Uh, just as uh, at that edu. And just as a side note, all these courses are available if you wanted to take an uh, accredited uh, certificate. We do have a certificate available if you take three courses at uh, through Elgin. They are available online. Um, there's a couple different instructors that teach it, one including myself. So if you're interested in taking them, uh, you could take them from anywhere in the world. Okay, so now we have the uh, Elgin.edu. We hit green check. I'm going to go to Features, Extrude Cut, and so it's 0 0.002. And so we have the engraved text. One last thing. We want it to be brass. Remember the first day, right click on material and you could just click on, they have brass right here, or you could go to add material and find it. And it adopts the properties of the brass. Now also be aware that not only does it adopt the properties, it actually adopts the weight. It'll tell you how much this weighs. You could go to the evaluate tab, go to uh, mass properties, and it'll tell you like right here, the mass 0.7 pounds and all the other information that might the density surface area centroid center of mass okay that concludes exercise three welcome back we're going to take a look today at exercise four uh, using SOLIDWORKS 2020 so in this exercise as you can see in front of you there's actually a, a rendering of what we're going to work on uh, that's the exercise. It's just a hand wheel, um, and it's going to have some features in it. Like, for example, the sweep feature we're going to take a look at today and the spline tool and the sketch tools. And so those are more for free form design. As you see, it looks kind of like a sculpted shape to some, to some extent. So we're just going to scrape the surface of that today. Uh, we're going to review uh, revolve features a couple times in here. But we're going to take a look also for the first time at the whole wizard. And the whole wizard is really nice because you could, it has a whole bunch of different types of holes to select from that are uh, standard, for example, um, counter bores, counter sinks, national pipe threads, and things like that. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. First of all, make sure that you go to the Vertanu One webpage. And that's just under. V is in Victor E R T A and N is in Nancy U X. Make sure you put the one in there. Dot com. And it should bring you to the web page. And from here, instructional manual, SolidWorks Basics. And if you want, you could download it if you haven't downloaded it already. Otherwise, it should be in your download directory if you've been following along every week. So you don't have to keep downloading it. They'll just keep making copies. I actually have it um, already downloaded. And this lesson starts on page 44. Okay, so let's begin. So we're going to sketch out this pre this profile that you see right here, three inches in height, uh, really one inch 
thick to start off with because it's going to be a revolve feature. And then we're going to have a little hump in there for uh, it's going to be a half inch radius. And then we're going to learn how to do a sketch chamfer, quarter inch, 45 degrees. So let's begin. I'm going to go to new part and hit OK. Select the front plane and start a sketch. Take your corner rectangle tool and hover over the origin. And when you get the orange dot, click, drag it to the upper left. So X will be about one and the Y is about three. Once you got that, go to Smart Dimension, click on this line over here on the right, click to the right of it when you center the dimension and type in three, click on the bottom line and make that one. Now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the sketched fillet. But before I do that, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see this better. I just hit the F key on the keyboard for zoom to fit. All right, now you'll see sketch fillet is right here. There's also a little arrow to the right of it, which you'll find sketch chamfer. Now chamfer remembers an angle. So click on sketch chamfer. We're going to go, we, in this case, it's going to be the same either way. We could go distance to distance or angle to distance, but it's going to be a quarter inch. And because it's at 90 degrees, once we put a quarter inch equal distances, it's going to come out to 45 degrees. So whichever one you prefer, you could go angle to distance, type in 45 degrees and 0.25 or distance to distance equal distance 0.25. Once you have that in there, go ahead and click on this upper left corner. Uh, a lot of people who've come from older CAD systems uh, have a tendency to click on both intersecting lines. You could do that. Um, that's one of those instances though, where if you're taking a test for this in front of a, a potential employer, they see you doing that. It's kind of old school. It's best to click on the upper corner because remember everything's about efficiency. Um, that might might seem like that's uh, being a little nitpicky, but the fact is is that uh, those are things that an employer might look for as far as your knowledge of this software. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and draw in a circle. So go to the circle tool and hover right about here and get an inference to the 0.25 edge there of that chamfer and just somewhere in the middle where my pointer is somewhere similar to that, click, and I'll drag out a circle and the radius should be about 0.5-ish. Now go to Smart Dimension, dimension the diameter of the circle, make it one inch, because remember it's a diameter now, radius is half of a diameter, and now click on the center point of that circle to the bottom edge, and click over here on the left to drop that, and I'm going to need to use my cheat sheet. It's 1.75. All right, you'll see it's still blue. That's because it could float left and right. So hit escape a couple times on your keyboard. We're going to assign a relationship that will align it vertically, the center of that vertically to the 0.25 edge of the chamfer. So here's how. First, select the little blue cross there at the center point of the circle. Now, after you select that release, now hold control because any subsequent selections, you have to hold control and otherwise it won't stay. So go ahead and click on this vertex here. Vertex is the end of a line. You'll see it highlight in orange. Click release control. Now take a look over on the left and you'll see add relation to vertical. Now watch as the circle is blue right now, which blue is an indicator of underdefined geometry. Watch it change color, it should turn black. Doesn't look like it moved at all because it was actually in alignment. It just wasn't tied down. We basically tied it down. Uh, also, another piece of advice for my new users out there, especially those of you taking my class, avoid, when you go to relations here, avoid this one. It's, it looks like a boat anchor, it's fixed. Uh, it is good for some advanced purposes, like if you're importing geometry from somewhere, a DXF or DWG file, for example, and you want to lock something down the way it was, that's a good method. Um, there's other tricks out there too, but for my users, uh, for my students, please don't ever use that in my class. Uh, we, we might touch upon it in the advanced class, but for the most part, if you add that, you're going to have so much frustration, especially those of you who are taking this online, because it locks down that geometry. And a lot of times students can't figure out how to unlock it. So just be aware of that. You don't want to anchor things usually. Hit the green check. 
All right, we're, we're fully defined. Now, last week, we took a look, and especially in the lab, I think we looked at um, trimming. And normally in the book, I talk about trimming here, but uh, we actually covered it last week. So I want to show you now some other functionality here. Now, this functionality has been in SOLIDWORKS for 20 years. But if uh, as long as I've been using it, when I first started using it, it wasn't there. So it's really kind of a neat thing. Um, and I wouldn't say it's 20 years. It might be less than that. But anyhow, we're going to leave these contours in here. And I want to show you how you could use those contours without trimming them and still get a revolve feature. Here's how. Go to the Features tab. Go to Revolve Boss Base. Now, you won't see a preview because notice we didn't put in a center line. Normally, we use a center line. We learned that from Exercise 2 two weeks ago um, and because that's the revolve or spin center. But we don't really need it. That center line is really uh, it's only there if you have like geometry that's offset from it and it's going to create a void or a hole in the center once it's spinned around. There's no hole in the center right here just yet. So we're not worried about it. So here's what we could do for the axis of revolution. You could go ahead and select. Uh, actually, let's first we'll select that later. Let's first take a look at selected contours. Click on the selected contours. Now this enables you to click on multiple contours like this one here, this one, than that one because those are all three that we want. If you miss selecting one of those, you might have a gap or an opening somewhere. So just be aware. Now click back on axis of revolution and select this right edge that we want to spin around and you'll see it wraps around. So selected contours, um, I have some, I had discussions with uh, users about this and some of us like it, some of us don't. I still want to show it to you. It can be advantageous. Um, I used to be on the side of that kind of sloppy geometry that's left over. I like to trim my things out and there might be users out there that feel the same way. So just be aware wherever you work, it might not be acceptable to do selected contours. So um, it's up to you. The real Thing I used to like to teach most of all was just to trim everything, make sure it's one contour. But that functionality is there if you want to use it. And if uh, if you're the boss, then there's no question. Hit the green check. All right, click over off of that. Now we're going to go ahead and add a sweep that's going to look kind of like an elephant trunk. So select the front plane, start a sketch. And this is for the spoke, by the way, that we're going to make. And then we'll pattern it. So front plane, start a sketch, and uh, Control-8 will bring us to that front view orientation. Remember, you could hit the space bar, too, if you want, and hit the front view orientation, however you want to do it. There's a dozen ways. And now let's go to the center line tool. Now, off of the origin at the bottom middle of this hub, drag it straight up and get it to where this little the colors break here for the gray where you see the underside versus the top side so right about there it doesn't really snap to a true center we're just eyeballing it right now but we're going to add a dimension so go to smart dimension and drag that to the right here just to get out of the way and put in 1.75 now i know you're thinking well, we put that one in there earlier to specify where that circle was unfortunately um, I don't know the way to use it. If someone else knows of a way to use that and snap to it, by all means, other than going to a quadrant on the outside, which that's obvious. But we, we need this, what we're going to do to make the spoke actually on the inside. All right, so we have that geometry. Now, take a look up here. Find spline and hit the little arrow to the right of it. You'll see spline, you'll see style spline and equation-driven curve. Um, these three items, uh, there's different uses. Like for example, uh, an equation driven curve, I've seen where that's been used for gear teeth and things like that. Um, and so it is a useful tool. We're not gonna use it ever in this class. But uh, the next one is style spline. Now style spline, when you're designing something free form, like if you're drawing a, a sleek body of a car, and uh, that's a very nice tool that's going to give you nice elegant shapes and, and it gives you control points that you can actually grab pretty easily and adjust. Then there's just spline. Now, um, these splines are actually non-uniform rational B splines, initially based off of polynomial splines, which those of you remember 
math back in the in college math you might uh, have talked about poly polynomials but anyhow um the the nerve is a non-uniform rational b spline and we're going to go ahead and use those to make a sleek contour for our spoke now in the book i don't use a spline i actually have analytical geometry which is lines and arcs but i thought it necessary to start showing this early because things are just more ergonomic these days it seems lately so anyhow not really but still it's good to know we're going to go with the easier of the two to use style spline we'll use a later a later exercise but um this the regular spline the good old spline tool that's been there since solidworks has been around we're going to use that because it's pretty easy to use although it doesn't the kind to shape it not as uh, nice as the, the style spline okay go ahead and get to this vertex over here of that center line you just drew when you get the orange dot click drag it and let's snap it to this quadrant on that hub click now drag it out and you could use the parameters box on the left just to get close i don't want you to type anything in there but like drag it out maybe like see it says uh, minus 1.669 or something like that uh, around about there 1.7 1.8 is fine click and notice i'm horizontal now drag it up and look at how the contour starts adjusting um, again nine uniform rational b splines are control curves that essentially uh, mathematical behind them uh, the mathematics behind them is actually controlling that slope that you see there and the weight as they call it all right anyhow let's go ahead and drag this up maybe about two and a half um, on both of those click drag it over here to the left uh, about minus three ish and by 2.7 somewhere around there click and one more to level it off now if, if it's starting to fall off the screen you could hit the f key and then it will give you a little bit more space all right and then flatten this out a little bit just like i have here at uh, minus 3.5 ish by 2.7 ish so click now hit escape all right so you can see our curve um you can grab these control points now here's the thing when you grab those points or the nodes some some people refer to them that um you could stretch things out now when you do that be aware little arrows appear i don't want you to touch those today stay away from those little arrows those apply weight and could actually put too sharp of a bend in your curve and it might error out what we're about to do so you want just use the, the standard defaults that they have in there so don't tinker with those little arrows um, but they are nice to add weight to the curve now let's uh, go ahead and hit rebuild up at the top now the rebuild button we talked about this i think day one actually it's a not quite to this extent we'll go into it right now a little bit rebuild essentially will exit you out of the sketch that you're working won't delete it it just leaves it there it grays it out and if you think of the sketches that you're making they're kind of like layers on top of each other each new sketch you could go in and you could edit those sketches or not or it could start new ones um, but anyhow that's going to get us out of the sketch so hit rebuild the green looks like a traffic signal up there all right now oh one last thing sometimes you'll find yourself in a challenging state of solidworks where you're just getting frustrated and you just want to kind of exit out or restart but not with restarting solidworks try hitting rebuild sometimes it will kick you out of whatever you're in and you could continue on with your your task so just that's a little piece of advice as well all right now we want to make a plane a new way to make a plane last week we uh, touched upon offsetting a plane today we're going to take a look at making a plane perpendicular to this curve so we could draw a profile and sweep it along so to do that let's go ahead and rotate this a little bit so you can see it i just i'm holding down the middle wheel and dragging down to the lower right a little bit okay let's go and i want you to find reference geometry up here and find plane now you'll see there's first reference second reference third reference now what we're going to do we're going to let it fill in for this as we just click what's required now by the way this is probably the most uh, advantageous 
way to make a plane. I mean, there's several ways to make a plane in this SolidWorks, and we're going to explore them. This is one of my favorites because you can make a plane at any angle just by drawing a sketch on, on another plane and then basing, uh, making new planes off of that. Now, here's what you need. We need to select the vertex where the plane is going to contact. So select this point. That's the first thing. Notice it went to second reference now. It's blue. It's looking for input. Go ahead and select the curve now. And there it is. You should get a plane perpendicular to the curve. Go ahead and hit the green check mark. Now click on the edge of that plane and start a sketch with the quick launch. And I'm going to keep it in this isometric view. You could go normal too. Remember, uh, Control-8 will do that. But uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and select the Circle tool and find that endpoint. Now, if you're unable to snap to that point, you might have to rotate or go normal too. Go ahead. And once you have this and you see both and you see the origin, get that orange dot, click and drag out a circle about 0.2 to 3. And then go to Smart Dimension and Dimension the Outside to a half inch. Actually, let's make it 0.75. Make it a little bit bigger. I know the book says a half inch. Uh, we do a little bit, uh, we do more of a tombstone shape, but we're going to make this uh, a little bit different. Okay, so we're at about 0.75. Now, if some of you have very dramatic curves, be aware this might fail, especially at that large of a size. Let's just to be on the safe side because I can't see what everyone's doing on their screen. Double click on that 0.75. Let's change it back to 0.5. If this doesn't work, you could always go back and edit this circle just by double clicking on it and change that to even 0.2 or flatten your curve out more. Your curve might be too jagged and then it intersects when it sweeps along. So that could be a problem. Okay. Now let's go to features, the tab, go to swept boss space. All right. The first thing it's looking for is the profile. Go ahead and select the circle. That's our profile. And it automatically went to the path input. So the path is now blue here. Select the curve. And you should see it make its way into the actual model. Go ahead and hit the green check. Now remember, if, it, if it's failing, like you're not seeing a preview and you have input in both of those, it might be that half inch diameter is too big. Try to change it to a quarter inch to 0.25 if you have an issue and then rerun the sweep. Go ahead and hit the green check. All right, now let's hide that plane. You could click on the edge of the plane and remember there's the hide button, the little eyeball. We're going to learn how to pattern now. Actually, we've learned how to pattern a couple weeks ago when we patterned the ribs with exercise two. So this is a bit of a review. Select the sweep from the model tree or feature tree right here. And because that's what we want to pattern around. Go to the little arrow underneath linear pattern. And look at all these different types of patterns. There's linear pattern, circular, there's mirror, curve driven pattern, sketch driven, table driven, fill pattern, and variable pattern. So just know there's a lot of patterns, methods. Go to circular pattern. And make sure it's set to equal spacing, 360 degrees. Let's bump that up to five for five instances. And it's always inclusive of the original. So five, it's going to be the total. Now select the outside surface of the hub. Don't select the donut shape up here. This one usually doesn't work. Other CAD systems actually it works in this CAD system. It doesn't, but uh, go ahead and select this surface instead. One of the, it's, will, it'll work on the chamfered surface or it'll work on just the straight cylinder. Once you have that, you'll see a preview. Go ahead and hit the green check. And now we have our spokes. Now let's go to the front plane of the feature tree and start a sketch. Hit your space bar and go to front view orientation, go to the circle tool and locate the midpoint of the spoke on the left hand side here. When you get to the midpoint, drag out a circle, smart dimension it at one inch. And now 
we're going to need to put in a center line. Now there is actually a center line in there automat uh, already from when we did our cylinder. Any cylindrical object actually has what they call a temporary axis. Um, you could go to view and hide show and you'll see temporary axes and you can select it. Um, but then it's annoying because there's a lot of them in there sometimes and it could clutter your screen. So I don't show that much anymore, but uh, we might see it in the future of uh, exercises. But go to center line and at that origin, click and drag up a vertical center line. And now go to features and revolve boss space and hit the green chip. All right, so now we have our hand wheel. What we're going to do next is we're going to go ahead and add fillet. So go to the fillet tool and make sure your fillet set to point two. And here's one of SolidWorks really neat strengths. Uh, most CAD systems can't do what we're about to do here. Go ahead and select the whole hand wheel and it will fill it all of the intersecting spokes automatically. Most you'd have to go in and click on every edge there. I go ahead and do it on the hub as well. And you can select this surface here, the chamfer surface, and we've just added fillets just about everywhere. So surface on surface on surface. Uh, normally you could select edges too, of course, but I just wanted to show you. All right, let's rotate this around to the bottom side. So you're looking at that opening there. Now what we're going to do is um, we're going to put in a counter bore right here. Go ahead and select that surface. We're going to center it too. And then you'll find the hole wizard. Now, if you hit the little arrow under hole wizard, notice there's hole wizard. There's advanced holes and there's threads. Thread tool is really nice. Um, I don't have a video yet on it, but I would recommend seeing it. I do threads in my videos still kind of the old way, um, the original way. But this thread tool is great for standard threads. Very quick and very easy. And I hope to make a video soon for it. But I'm sure there's tons of videos out, out there on YouTube for those. Okay, but we're going to use the whole wizard today. Now you'll see there's all the there's a whole library right here. There's counter bore, counter sink, standard drill hole. Here's a straight tap, tapered tap, which our national pipe thread would be included in that. You've got um, legacy holes, so you can have specialized holes and make your own little library there of those. And then you see counter bore slot and counter sink slot, and finally slot. We're going to keep it on counter bore. Now you'll see the standards. Just keep it on ANSI inch. And the type, if you click on this, you'll see that there's a bunch of different fasteners. Now don't misunderstand that this is going to actually put the fastener in. It won't put it in here automatically. But if you have the uh, professional version of SOLIDWORKS or that includes toolbox, Toolbox is, is kind of like a library of nuts and bolts and things. And um, it will automatically put it in inside the context of an assembly. So just be aware. But if you add these and later on you select the edge, you could have it automatically put those in again with Toolbox, which we'll take a look at uh, in the advanced class. All right. Now, so we're going to stick with binding head screw. On the whole specifications, it probably says double O if you've never used it before. So scroll all the way to the bottom, go with a 3 8 inch. And notice the fit, you have close, normal, or loose. Go ahead and put, let's go with close. And scroll down here a bit further. The end condition, instead of through all, make sure it's set to blind. We're going to have it drill down an inch and a half deep. So put in 1.5. And then these are some other settings you could tinker with if you like. We're not going to touch those, but let's now go to positions, the tab up here, go to positions. Move your pointer onto that surface and you'll see you could position one anywhere you want on that surface. Um, you could, don't, don't do this yet, but you could click in multiple areas, adding a whole bunch of holes in different locations, and then you could position them with dimensions. But this one, we're going to dimension, we're going to position it right on the origin, which is dead center. So go ahead and click. And then look at that. You could hit the right mouse button because it has a little green check mark there to apply it. Or you could hit the green check mark in the upper right and then click off of it. And there it is. Now that actually does have an annotation that follows, follows it. So uh, when you go into a drawing, you can actually call it that annotation pretty easily. 
uh, one other thing, let's go over to materials, right click on materials, go to edit material, and let's go with chrome stainless steel. And remember, we usually go with megapascals here or MPA. And we can see yield strength is 172, tinsel strength is 413. Hit apply and close, and it adopts the properties of that material. And that's about it for that exercise. Uh, make sure you save that. And what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at the lab. Now, lab four is a challenge. It's a very good challenge. So this is uh, this is what you might see out in industry. Most of the parts I've given you are pretty generic thus far. They're, they're not very, they're not particularly difficult to model. This one has some significant dimensions that you have to follow. So those of you who aren't fluent with reading a print, this will help you learn to read a print. And mind you, these prints are not very good. I my my background was mostly modeling. I did prints as well. I used to actually draw on the board back in the eight the eighties. And so my my drawings, I do a lot of the auto dimensioning and things like that. So they're not always the greatest, but everything is here that you need on this particular drawing. So you should you could find it. it may not be the best drawing, I'll, I'll admit to that. One of these days, maybe I'll update it and fix it. All right, so what we're gonna do is we need to make this enclosure. And you can see the, the bottom arc is 0.75. Now, again, you might say this looks awfully familiar. It's using the same technique we learned with exercise three and later lamb three. Lab four incorporates that same shape that the head had, but it adds some additional angles to it that you see there are 115 degree angles. And then a big, uh, as I called it, the alien wear type head. So uh, anyhow, what we're gonna do, we'll start that off. So we have 0.75 for the bottom arc, the top arc. And oh, by the way, if you wanted to, you could download this. Usually up here, there's download. And then you could go over here to uh, rotate. And I'm gonna go ahead and rotate counterclockwise so it's easier to see. All right, so from here, we're gonna go ahead, let's see what this, this radius on top here is one and a half inches. We have a 23 degree angle on these sides and then 115 degrees. So let's give that one a shot. Go to new part and hit OK. It's symmetric, so we can select the front plane, start a sketch, and use a center line to start you off. And make it about two and a half inches in height, and then change that center line to just the object line, or just line as they call it. On the left here, click and drag one up about an inch and a half or so, and then another one, maybe about an inch, at a steeper angle click and then hit escape. Now you could drag from right to left to, to capture everything and then hit mirror entities. Go to tangent arc and put the tangent arc in at the bottom. The top is not tangent, so try something else. In this case, go with three point arc. Click here and connect here and then have that bow out like so, and then hit escape. Let's put the dimensions in. Smart dimension, the bottom arc, it's gonna be 0.75. Now, sometimes I've seen students who drew it in such a large scale that when they put this dimension in, it gets an error. What you might wanna do, if this is one of the times you might want to actually use the do not click on thing that I talk about. So like if I click on this arc, I hit escape, by the way, I click on this arc and you'll see dimensions here. Sometimes you can plug in closer dimensions to squeeze down or scale them all. It tries to auto scale, but sometimes the algorithm, I think, has some difficulty depending upon the geometric conditions that are on the sketch that you're drawing. So just note that sometimes you can change it here or you could actually just click on the lines and squeeze them down yourself and then try adding the dimension later. It happens every once in a while and it can be frustrating, but just uh, be patient and keep trying. All right, smart dimension, the top arc now, that's 1.5. 
And then this angle here is going to be 24. And then this angle here is 118. And then the distance between the two, let's find that drawing. Let's see here. And we have, let's see if I can zoom up a little bit. All right, we have 1.25 from the center there to the center at the bottom. So let's put that in. So from center to center. Now this center might be difficult to see because there's a center line on top of it. Look for the horizontal little blue cross there. Click and then drag this out. And 1.25. All right. Now hit escape and we grab that center at the bottom, drag it down. Oh, you know what? We're not done yet. I'm still missing a dimension. Okay, let's see. What, what am I missing here? Let's see. 1.5, 1.25. Ah, here we go, the angle. One inch from that corner to the center point. So don't forget that one. So this corner right here to the center point should be one inch. Now it should be locked down. So when we grab, after we hit escape, grab that center, drag it up and let it snap in. And now it's fully defined. You can lay these dimensions out. So something that you could read a little bit better. So if you need to change it, you or someone else needs to ever change it, they're readily stacked and available and easy to read. Let's go to Features, Extrude Boss, and let's look at our drawing. We can see here it's a half inch thick, and the draft is 25 degrees typical. So let's go ahead and type in 0.5 here, and then draft. I just want to verify that. Let's see, 25. Okay, this way. All right, hit the green check. Now, this one we can, because it's broken, we can put the big fill in on first, unlike our lab last week. And that fillet or that radius right here, it's a half inch. And then there's a chamfer of 30 degrees by 181. So we'll put that one in. So Right here, that should be a half inch. Hit apply. And I go to chamfer underneath fillet. And it's going to be 0 0.181 by 30. Select this edge here. And there it is. Hit the green check. Okay. Now we're going to shell it out. Rotate this around the back side, go to shell, and let's find where that shell is. And typical wall is 60,000, so 0 0.06. Select this face and then hit the green check, and it should shell it out. Now, if you hit the green check without selecting a face, it's shelled. It's just that you didn't select the face to be opened. So if that has happened, you can't reshell it. So you have to actually edit the shell. You have to right click on the shell, edit the feature, and then select the face. Another thing you could do, you could just hit undo, get rid of it, add another one, or you could delete the shell by selecting it and hit and delete on your keyboard if you've run into some issues where it's not working. Because I've seen it quite a lot over the years where students shell it, but they don't remove that back face. So they have difficulty with that. Okay, let's put in that pattern of those openings. Select this face here, start a sketch, and let's go normal two, or front is fine. Let's go with the center line. And I wanna put it on the center here. Go to the regular line tool, and right about here, click and drag out a little angle. We get to use that same technique that we learned in the last exercise for making the head of the ratchet here. So we got that line, uh, hit escape, and then click and drag a fence around them both from right to left, and it selects them easily. Otherwise, you have to envelop everything. And 
Now we can just go ahead and hit mirror entities. And let's go to tangent arc. And you just need a tangent arc on the top and on the bottom. Once you have that, let's take a look at the drawing again. And we need to have a radius at the top of 0.2 and a radius at the bottom of 0.1. And they're spaced 0.5. And then there's this uh, bolt circle here that they're aligned to. And let's see, where is that dimension there? Oh, here it is, 0.7. So 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Let's do the bottom, the smallest one first, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. And from this point to this point, 0 0.7. All right. Now we could use the sketch uh, to actually make a pattern. Let's give that a go. We'll do a sketch, a circular sketch pattern. So over here, first select the geometry you want to pattern. So in this case, you can select um, this surface in here. It's like a light grayish surface. It will select the geometry. And now you could go to circular sketch pattern. Now, you want the center to be located over here. So you could grab that center and just locate it right there. These, I believe, are 24 degrees off each other. Or maybe not that. Um, oh, yeah. Put in two. There we go. And put in a select dimension angular spacing. Put in three. Now, I'm going to show you just this one side, adding these. And we're going to cut them. And then we're going to mirror them over to the other side. Um, there are several ways you could do this. I'm showing you two ways, giving you one, uh, two methods basically in this case, just so you can see how they're done. Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll actually just mirror these over. So hit the green check. Oh, and make sure you dimension radius. Hit the green. Okay. Now what we're going to do, we, I guess we can mirror those over, I suppose. Um, but Instead, let's just make sure we let's just go to Features, Extrude, Cut. And you want Through All. All right. Now, select a Cut Extrude. And hold Control. And you'll find there's a right plane in the middle. Select the right plane. And then go to Mirror. And you should see it mirroring to the other side. So now you've just seen two techniques. You've seen a circular pattern. I should say circular sketch pattern. And also we've seen actual mirroring here. OK. The next thing we're going to work on is there's a boss in the center here. So I'm going to select this face, start a sketch. I'm going to go and highlight the edge here, which highlights the center point. Drag off a circle about 0.3 and a half or something like that. And let's take a look at the drawing here. That indicates it's 0.835. So let's go to Smart Dimension, 0.835. And the extrusion depth of that is right here. It's kind of hard to read, 0.3. So we go to Features, Extrude, 0.3. I should say Extrusion. 0 0.03. My apologies. 0 0.03. Not nearly that big. All right. Now there's these little details that you'll see in here, these little cutouts. And again, because I have, I don't want to make a huge drawing here. I Everything I put on something that could be printed out on an A size sheet, which is eight and a half by 11, uh, you'll see the dimensions are really squished together. That's why I said these are not the best drawings. But we can see over here on this backside view, we're one inch in height. I'm sorry, not one inch, 0.1. And then 0 0.05 
wide. So that's the rectangle that's centered. And then it's located, let's see here, 0 0.371 from center. So let's put that in. And what we could use for this one, select that face, start a sketch, hit your space bar, and go to front. Go to the, uh, let's first draw a center line. Find the center, drag it up. Now go ahead and find, we're going to use the center rectangle tool here. Center rectangle. And somewhere on here on this edge, click and drag out a rectangle. And let's dimension that. This is going to be 0.5. I'm sorry, not 0.5, 0 0.05. And this is going to be 0.1. So that changed that. All right, and then it's located from the center. So click on this bottom edge to that point, and that is going to be a dimension of 0 0.371. All right, now we could go ahead and cut that. Go to Features, Extrude Cut, Through All. We also have a fillet feature that's in there. And the fillet, you can see right here, it's a radius of 0.1. So let's go to the fillet tool, make sure it's at the 0.1, and select this edge right here. Hit the green check. Now that we have that geometry, we could go ahead and we could put our fillet of 0 0.03 around this entire edge because we needed those edges so that we could align things. So I'm putting in later. So right there. I guess we didn't really need the edges. We could probably gotten by without it. Okay, so now that we have that, we need to pattern it. And if we're looking at that, you see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 instances, 360 degrees around. So we could select that fillet and the cut extrude, go to circular pattern for the uh, pattern axis, just select like this face here and increase that to 15. Hit the green check. Okay, and now here you'll sometimes get this, unable to create a pattern, decrease the number. Um, sometimes this happens. Try geometry pattern. And again, we get a little error message. So we need to do a couple different things here. Uh, we might have to put the fill it in later, or maybe this outside fill it in later. There's a couple different variations of what we might need to do. And let's see, let's turn that off. Cut extrude and fill it. Let's delete that fill it in there. Maybe I had the wrong. Oh, you know what? I had the wrong fill it. There we go. I had the wrong fill it selected. So you might to correct that, just cancel out. Let's let's start over again with that one. All right. I accidentally selected fill it three, which fill it three is that 30 thousandths fill it that travels all the way around doesn't want to pattern that. That's fine. So let's go back to circular pattern and select this little box up here for the direction. Select that outer surface here. And we're going to, uh, then the features, the pattern. You could actually select this sidewall and then this fillet. Now increase it to 15. You could type in the value if you, if you like. Hit the green check, and there we go. All right, so my mistake. Now let's select this face, and the rest of this little logo, I just had fun with it. It's, you don't have to put it in if you don't want to. I don't have any dimensions for it, just eyeball it. And I'm gonna go to extrude cut, and I'm just gonna have it go 0.02 deep. 
There you go. It's just a fun little, it's like the, the moon in front of the uh, earth. Okay. Now let's go on the back side. Top's done. Select this face, start a sketch. You can click on normal two for that. And let's look at our drawing. On the inside here, we have some bosses. You can see here there's um, 0.175 diameter, three places, one, two, three. And the height here is given over here, the 0.375 for the height off of the floor of the shell. And there appears to be a taper. And there's also a cut of the hole, 100 thousandths by 100 thousandths. So 100 thousandths diameter, 100 thousandths deep in there as well. So let's first get these in. And I believe there's draft on here. I don't know if I specified that. So you don't really need to put it in unless it's specified. But we'll put it in just to show you because it might be on this print. Usually you want draft on a plastic part. Otherwise, it doesn't pull from a mold very well. Okay, I'm going to go to the circle tool. Now, this one's really easy right here. Let's draw that there and then draw one right about there. Let's go to the center line tool. Okay, I actually added two center lines there. Sloppy sketches. Let me delete one. Okay. And we'll mirror this across. I'm going to click, hold control. I hit escape. So make sure you hit escape. Click, hold and control that center line and that line. And let's go to mirror entities. And now we can position them. The bottom one doesn't need to be positioned. Oh, one thing. Let's make them all equal too. So I hit escape, control select one of the circles on the side and then the one at the very bottom and make it equal. Because the two are symmetric, because they were mirrored, we don't have to select all three. You could if you wanted to, but you don't have to. All right, and we'll put in that 1.75 diameter for one of them. Or I'm sorry, 0.175. I need more coffee today. All right, it rounded it to 0.18, that's okay. Now we need to uh, position. So let's look at where that's located. So we can see it's 0.125 offset from the center here, and then 0.75 from the center. So from here to, let's select the outside of this edge here and then get it over here to the, the right. And it's gonna smart dimension. Make sure you get the vertical smart dimension. Click, and it's gonna be 0.125. And now click on the center point to the center line, and I'll be, 0.75. All right. Now, just to show you, if you missed what I did there, I actually selected the outer edge and that selected the center of that, which is what we wanted to get. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go to extrude. And this gets, gets extruded 0.375. And let's go ahead and add a degree of draft. And hit the green check. Now go ahead and select one of those faces, start a sketch, and there's, uh, you could just draw these in. If you want to mirror them, you could too, but like, uh, let's see here. That's one, two, three, hit escape, click and drag a fence to surround all three and make them equal on the left. And now add a dimension to one of them. 0.1 features extrude cut and we're going to have a cut down 0.1 and let's add a degree of draft on that too Hit the green check and so now we actually have the little holes that are in there for snapping together to the mating part now we need to put in there's a little uh, boss there for something. So let's go to sketch on the surface, hit the space bar, go normal two, draw from the center there. Now remember, you can wake up that center by highlighting this edge. You don't even have to click, drag out a circle and then another circle. And let's take a look on the drawing. One's 0.5. The, the ID is 0.5. The OD is 0.6.
I'll go to Features, Extrude Boss, and let's look at what that's set to for the depth. Over here, we could see if we follow the little tracer line, extension line, we're looking at 0.13 for the height. Hit the green check. And we're done. Now, there are ribs you could put in there if you like. Uh, you don't have to in this case. Uh, just for this lesson, we've done an awful lot. This one is a very challenging one to work on. It's a good one, definitely for a portfolio piece. There's a lot of things that you had to do to add to enhance this. All right, that's it. And that concludes exercise four. Welcome back. Today, we're going to take a look at exercise five with SOLIDWORKS 2020. Exercise five actually has to deal with bottom up assembly modeling. Now, bottom up assemblies is essentially taking parts that were already built and assembling them. So, there is something called top down assembly modeling where you're actually building parts inside the assembly using geometry from other parts. Uh, this is not that. That's actually going to be covered. We're going to start to cover that in its basic form in exercise nine. So if you want, you could go to there, take a look at that. Um, as for this, this is just bottom up. So let's begin. As you can see on the screen here, this is actually the assembly that we're going to put together. It's a collection of parts that make like a U joint assembly here. And we're going to go ahead assembling it to make it where we can actually do something that's called dynamic assembly motion, where we'll actually be able to grip this handle and rotate it around. But I'm going to show that to you once we do it. Um, with this one, I have this in just a review viewing mode. So I'm, I'm not going to do that just yet so as a preview. But let's begin. All right, first of all, you're going to want to go to the uh, vertani1.com. So I'll start this off there. So, so V is in Victor, E R, T is in Tom, A, N is in Nancy, U, X is in X ray, and then don't forget the number one.com. Should take you to this web page. If not, try typing in it again. You might have put in the wrong spelling. All right, now. We're going to go to the actual part files area. We could go to instructional manuals and there's uh, the information on that, but we're not going to really need to right now. Let's go to part files. And we're looking at the red column. It's always the SOLIDWORKS files. So you'll find the very top is exercise five parts. Go ahead and select that. And it's going to give you this little message. Couldn't preview files. It's in a zip file, which is zip file is a compressed file format. So we're going to have to do a little bit of work to extract the files. So uh, go ahead and hit download right here. And if you don't see download here, up here is a download button as well. Click on download and it should download in the lower left corner, depending upon what um, browser you're using. You might actually have it up here, down here, but here I have it. I'm on Google Chrome. I'm going to go ahead and click on sheet metal bracket.zip. And what we'll see here, we'll see all the files. And all you have to do is click on one, and you could select them all just by holding Control A, and that selects them all. So the Control key and the letter A. Or you could Control select each individual one, which would take a lot of time, which I don't know why you'd want to do that, but. That's another way. Or you could window over them by just clicking and dragging uh, a window around them all. Okay, and there's other ways too. Uh, hit Control now, C to copy. And let's go now to the... Um, now, in earlier videos, I started in the Documents file, a SOLIDWORKS Basics folder. If you don't have that, feel free to start it now. Uh, as you do parts, it's a great little area. As you can see here, here's my collection of parts. It's a little portfolio that I've generated in making these videos. Um, and what you do is you right click and create a new folder. And we'll go ahead and label this capital E5 for exercise five. Double click on the folder. And while inside there, just click in the screen and hit control V as in Victor. And it should paste them in there. Now, if you'd like to see larger uh, pictures of these mo uh, these models here, click in the lower right corner. That's a quick way to see what each part looks like. 
Now, you could squeeze these down and don't grab the assemblies out of there. We actually want to build it from the ground up. So just leave that where it's at. Let's go to SolidWorks now. And once SolidWorks is launched, you could go to New or File New. Now go to Assembly. This is our first time using the Assembly tools. Click on Assembly and hit OK. Now what it does is it brings up uh, this uh, the open dialog box. You can browse here and locate your, your files. It actually is going to the last area I worked in. But I'm going to hit Cancel just for a moment there. Now on the left, you'll see it says Begin Assembly, and you have uh, Create Layout. Now Create Layout, another name for that from other systems, um, it's called actually Skeletal Modeling, where you can actually draw out curves on planes or 3D guide curves, 3, 3D curves, I should say, and then attach parts to it and even build it and uh, to design your envelope or the actual, like for example, if you're designing an automotive and uh, automobile engine and you have the belt, the serpentine belt, you could actually position drawing just a sketch how that belt is going to be put in and then start building the parts around it, like the alternator and the compressor and all those other neat things. So skeleton modeling is really cool. We don't really get into it in the intro class here. There are videos on it, uh, not typically mine, but um, we do look at top-down modeling, uh, which is kind of uh, related to skeletal modeling. But uh, for the most part, I don't do a whole lot of that in here. So anyhow, let's get started. Just um, hit the red X here because I want to start by talking about the assembly. First of all, you can see the assembly one is listed here. Um, you have the history sensor, which we don't go into right now. That's something we'll talk about maybe a latter day. But we have here front, top, and right planes. You can actually sketch on those. You can't actually extrude from them, though, inside the context of an assembly. You could actually edit a part inside the context and extrude from them. But um, pretty much we're going to use those to mate things up. You could draw out your layout sketch like we were talking about too. Uh, each assembly has its own origin. And then this mates, it's not really a folder, but it's a mates area. And actually it will contain all of your mates that you add. And mates are geometric conditions that you're applying to surfaces of, or edges of the model to lock them in. And basically as you glue or stick your parts together, or what we would call assemble them. So let's begin with this. Uh, up here at the top, and the, the you have the pull-on menus, which we're not really going to use for this one too much, but we have this insert component. Hit the little arrow underneath it, and you'll see there's insert component, new part, new assembly, copy with mate. We're just going to go with insert component, which is uh, the technical term is bottom-up assembly modeling in this case. Now, just as an FYI, the new part is for top-down modeling. We're not going to cover that until exercise nine, um, but note that in a general sense, most people do a combination or most designers do a combination of both insert component and new parts. So bottom up and top down. Very seldom do you see exclusively one or the other, but this lesson is exclusive. So to bottom up, go to insert component. And this brings us back to where we were earlier. Notice SolidWorks had that pleasantry that it came up and did it automatically for us so we don't have to go through the menus and do it. So that's kind of neat that SolidWorks does that uh, on, a, on a regular basis here. All right, let's go to the documents, the SolidWorks basics, and E5. Now if we want to see bigger pictures here, we could actually click on this little icon here and drag it up to maybe a somewhere around large icons. And we're looking for the very first part is going to be the sheet metal bracket. Go ahead and select the sheet metal bracket and hit open. Now you could see the parts just floating with your pointer anywhere you position it. What we're going to do is we want, I want to show you how you can position it to where it locks in its own front plane and its own top and right plane to the front planes of the, top, um, of the assembly. And basically that means it's locking in at the origin point and it, will disallow it from rotating and moving. And that's very that's a good strategy for your first part. It locks it down. So uh, to do that, rather than clicking just anywhere, 
click on the green check mark in the upper left. And that positions it right on the origin of the assembly. So your origin of the part and the assembly match up. Now here's where uh, some companies, when they're designing using the top-down method, they have a strategy where they always drop it in on the front plane of the assembly. That way, every part that they build in the context of the assembly shares the same origin. And if you ever get parts from a company that does that or work, designs in that method, you can actually just grab the parts and drop them in by uh, selecting the, the front plane every time and it will drop them all in at the origin and it just assembles itself. Now, note that by doing that, you don't get the dynamic assembly motion as a default with that. You, you might lose that, but you might not need that. Not all companies need dynamic assembly motion. Sometimes you're just trying to assemble it to check clearances and, and interferences and things. So now we're going to go and take a look at the feature tree on the left here. You'll see the sheet metal bracket is listed there. There's a little F in parentheses, and the F stands for fixed. The very first part, and only the first part, is by default fixed in space. And so if you wanted to, you could, and I don't want you to do this, but if you wanted to, you could right click on it. You would find float, and then you could actually relocate it or just have it floating. But think of it this way. Imagine we're building this and we're holding the bracket in our hand. And as you're putting the parts together, you have to have some way to fix that part down. Sorry, I'm shaking the desk here. And then as you rotate that handle on the top, all the parts will interact with each other. So it's a good strategy. Otherwise, if you're not holding that bracket down, when you go to rotate the handle at the top, everything's going to rotate, including the bracket. So uh, that's our strategy that we're using to prevent that from happening. Okay, now let's insert another component. Now there's several ways to insert components inside SOLIDWORKS. Uh, this is probably the most common and original way that it was done since I've been using SOLIDWORKS since 1997. Uh, but there's other methods over the years that SOLIDWORKS has incorporated into the technology, which are really pretty neat. So we'll take a look at some of those. Okay, so now we have to pick out the next part. The next part we're going to grab is the yoke mail. So select the yoke mail and hit open. And I want you to move your pointer out on the screen and just to the left of the bracket, click to release the second part, which is the yoke mail. Now, if you look at the little arrows to the left of these parts, you could hit them and you could see there's all the features of that part. If it's a native file, Sure enough, you're going to be able to edit all those features. I'm going to hit the little arrow to bring it back up. Don't need to see all that stuff, but I just wanted to show it to you. Now, let's take a look at Move Component right here. Go ahead and select Move Component. Now, grip this part with your mouse button. Hold it down, click and hold, drag it, and you'll see you could drag it through the other model or models if you had them up there. Okay, there's nothing stopping it. Now, move it back. Move it back away so it's not contacting the bracket. Now take a look at some of the options here. Now under here you have a free drag. If you have the little arrow, you could position them by delta x, y, and z. You could actually type in explicit values for x, y, and z to position it uh, if, if that's what you desired. There's um, another, a couple of neat things in there. And then you also have rotate. Hit the little arrow to the right of that. And go ahead and grab the part and you'll see now it will rotate. Now, right now, it's just positioned to rotate around its centroid, the center of the model. So you could click and drag. And sometimes that's helpful to get it into position before you start mating, especially, especially if it's somewhat of a complex mate you're applying. Uh, you don't necessarily always want the part going in upside down and then flipping it. And there are tools that help you to, uh, to work through that. We're going to see those. Okay, but let's make sure it's pointing up like what, what you see here. Now, uh, let's go back to move, hit move, the little arrow there. And so now when you drag it again, you're just, it's just floating. Okay, now there's options. There's standard drag, which that's what we're set to. Go ahead and select collision detection. And you'll see below some additional options up here. There's all components or specific components. You'd be able to select them. That's useful if you have a very large assembly and you're just trying to test the uh, if there's any collisions or interaction between the parts within the proximity of the part you're working with. 
you don't need to have them all on because it takes up system resources that way. So you could actually select these components and you'd be able to select like, oh, I want the bracket and I want this and this and that part. But if you let them all, especially if you have thousands of parts, it could slow things down. So that's a nice optimization feature. Let's just go to all components because we only have two parts in here anyhow. All right, there's stop at collision. Go ahead now, grab the part and drag it and try and collide it with the bracket. And you'll actually hear, sounds like someone hit the side of a 50 gallon oil drum. Okay, and it actually stops. All right, so there's collision detection. Now there is under evaluate, there's actually a clearance and interference detection as well. Uh, those are for static bodies. What we're doing here is dynamic. So just be aware you could select those. And once you have a bunch of parts made, that have been mated together, you could select interference detection and say, show me inter any interferences and it'll show them in red. And I'm going to try and remember to show that to you later. It's pretty easy and it will highlight in red where those areas are. Okay. Um, now physical dynamics, go ahead and select physical dynamics. Physical dynamics, you could actually like uh, check a gear mesh with it, but uh, newer processors, it's probably pretty, pretty neat to see. Um, on the older systems that I used to work on, it was rather slow, like the meshing of gears would take a long time. Uh, a good example of this was I saw a demonstration once someone designed a pool table and they had the cue ball and they had all the balls out and they were mated tangent to the surface of the the pool table. And they went ahead and they grabbed the cue ball with their mouse and they dragged it through the balls and it pushed all the balls out of the way. Now be aware, it's not going to do any kinematics. There's no moments of inertia. There's no um, friction. Those things you're not going to see with this tool. Okay. There are tools that you could get that are add-ons, which is SOLIDWORKS Motion, that will enable you to do those types of tests. Uh, they're not the easiest thing to set up necessarily. Once you get used to it, of course, it's not bad. But we're not going to cover that in this class. That's an advanced, it's, it's a different module. So just be aware of that. Uh, actually, that would be under SOLIDWORKS Motion. All right. And that's a really neat product in itself. So for kinematics and dynamics, what we're looking at here is just, just dynamics. Okay. Um, now, go ahead and select dynamic clearance and click on the two parts and then hit resume drag. And this will just tell you how close in proximity they're coming between each other. Okay. And so it, it can be very useful again if you're testing out your assemblies and such. See how close things are coming. And you could even uh, set a distance like, okay, stop at a specified clearance. So let's say we want to stop within 0.5. So within a half inch of striking that apart. There you go. As, see, as I push it, once it gets to that 0.5, it stops. I can't get it any further. Okay. So anyway, you can hit escape. Just wanted to show you those tools. They're pretty neat. Now we're going to go ahead and learn how to mate. Now mating is establishing relationships on the surfaces or edges of the models to attach them. And very similar to the uh, sketch relations that we saw, only in the 3D. So this is how you can do it. Go to the assembly tab, find the mate tool. By the way, if I'm talking rather slow, it's later in the day, you could hit on YouTube the little fast forward 1.5 and skim through. My coffee's already worn off for the day, so just be aware I might be getting a little slow here and tired. All right, so go to the mate tool here. Now there's a little paper clip you see. Click on mate. And here you can actually see the standard types of mates. There's also advanced mates, which we get, uh, and mechanical mates. And we see, like, uh, for example, we we'll use the gear mate in the advanced class. Um, we probably won't touch upon the advanced mates or mechanical mates in this intro class. We're going to use the standard mates. Okay, but those are all really impressive. Watch videos on them if you want to learn how to do those. I don't have, personally, I don't, the only thing, I don't have any videos on those. So, all right, let's go ahead. The very first thing we're going to do, we're going to let it pick 
the best choice for what we select. So see this pink surface right here on the yolk male? That belongs inside this hole here. So go ahead and select this surface. Now before you apply this, or before you click on that surface, be aware, depending upon the location of your model, yours might turn out a little different initially than mine, but don't worry. Okay, so just give it a moment. Don't, don't hit undo just yet. All right, now take your pointer. Now hover over this surface. Now we've talked about surfaces and edges. To the right of the pointer, you'll actually see, if you're truly on the surface, you see a blue square. That's an indicator you're touching the surface. Now, if you move it slightly to an edge, you see the edge turns orange, and then you get a little line to the right of your pointer. And you might think, well, what's the difference for mates? They do make a difference. Uh, sometimes you want a face, sometimes you want an edge. For this, we're going to do mostly faces. So in fact, what I'd like to do is customize our interface so that we don't accidentally select an edge. Here's how. Right click in the upper right corner of the screen where there's actually the ribbon, but there's no icons on it. So the gray area of the ribbon, just where I click. Now go to, uh, hold on a second here. Oh, you know what? I can't do it just yet. I'm going to have to turn off mates. Hit the red X on mates. All right. Now we can right click and you'll see customize. Click on customize. Now you can have icon size. You can change the icon size. All right, uh, tool tips gives you the information as you hover over things. But let's skip over that. Um, let's go to, uh, let's see here, commands. Or, no, uh, no, we'll go to toolbars. And I want you to find, let's see here, selection filter. So go ahead and select selection filter and hit the OK. Now it pops up at the top on here. On older versions, it seemed to appear at the bottom. So um, I actually prefer it on the bottom. So the one way you can move this toolbar is see the little dot, 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 dot on the upper left there. Get your pointer over those dots. It'll, your pointer will turn to a cross with arrows on it. Grab it with your mouse button, hold it, and just drag it down here to dock it down there. So it's out, kind of out of the way. If you don't have a lot of real estate on your screen, you could close it later on. You could actually pull out and hit the little X. Um, all right. So now let's select this one, filter faces. And notice the fast key for filter faces is X. So later on, if we remember to turn off X, because we might want to select edges, you could just hit X or you could go back down here and disable it right here. Select all filters or disable it by turn them all off. Okay. So filter faces. Now, if you go over an edge, you can't get it. Okay, so just be aware you're going to need to turn this off later on. And X was the key. Click on this pink surface here. Now move your pointer over here. And notice I didn't select the mate tool in advance this time. So I'm going to have to hold control. So just if you don't pre select a tool, just note you have to hold control for multiple selections. So select that face now and release control. And now let's go to the mate tool. It should move over. It'll actually jog over and appear to be in position. Now yours might be a little higher, might be a little lower. It's okay. Um, it's just one of the constraints that we've added. Now what you're ultimately doing here is you're removing the degrees of freedom, or at least as many as you can. Sometimes uh, when I used to work in industry, we'd remove them all. Sometimes we didn't need to see dynamic assembly motion. Sometimes the assemblies don't have motion, like an electronics part, like uh, if you're designing a phone internally, there's not really much of any mechanisms inside of that phone. It's all digital. So it's microchips and they're static. So a lot of times you don't need to apply dynamic assembly motion to items. All right, so anyway, here we have this. Go ahead and hit the green check. Hit it one more time, the green check. And now grab the part and drag it. Now you'll notice you could swivel it by dragging left and right. Drag it down. You could drag it up. We've essentially removed some of its degrees of freedom here. Okay, remember there's always six degrees of freedom. You have X, Y, and Z, and you have the ability to rotate around those X, Y, and Z. So those are the three. 
So the rotation around X, rotation around Y, and rotation around Z equate to the additional three. Okay, let's move this down and get it to where the legs are visible. Now, I'm in an isometric view. If you're not, if you've rotated, hit your spacebar, just go to isometric. Okay, now go ahead and select this surface right here. And notice when you go to the surface, you could go right to mate. Go ahead and select mate. And the part turns transparent so you can see through, which is very useful if you have very large assemblies. Rotate this with the middle wheel. And remember, if you hold the wheel down like it's a button, move your mouse forward. It should rotate underneath. And then go ahead and select this underside of the sheet metal bracket. Now, when you click on it, it should apply a relationship of coincident. All right now, the last one I forgot to show you was actually concentric. It picked it. Um, so SOLIDWORKS little AI going on here is actually quite good. Probably the best in industry from what I can tell. All CAD package out there have their strengths. This is one that's really pretty neat about SOLIDWORKS, which you're going to see in a minute. But anyway, go ahead and hit the green check. All right, let's hit our space bar and go back to isometric or control seven. We'll get you back there. Now hit the green check on the mate tool and grab this leg and drag it. You'll see now it no longer travels up and down. All right, so we it just can swivel. So we removed all those other degrees of freedom. We only have one degree of freedom here to revolve or rotate around the Y axis. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and add another part. So let's go back to insert component. Now, note you could go to insert component, but I think I'm going to start showing you some other methods that might really work well, especially if you have multiple screens. This works well. Now, I only have one screen on currently that you could see. I actually do have a second screen, but I'm only capturing one. And on the other screen, I had this, I had my actual documents up. I'm going to go to, uh, this is just, um, basically uh, <clears throat> Explorer. You could go down here. You can middle click on it to open a new one. You could go to Documents, SolidWorks, Basics, the E5 folder. We could enlarge these so we can see them better. Now I'm going to show you how you could just drag them from here too. Now I've seen students get overzealous and they grab all of them and drag it in. Now just be aware if you have a lot of parts you could be, uh, you could, might crash your system. I've seen, seen it happen. I haven't seen it in a while, but I've seen it happen from time to time. And uh, don't, it's just Windows sometimes does weird things. So just be aware, maybe just one at a time until you get more uh, familiar with this environment. But we're looking for the spider hinge. Go ahead and grab that spider hinge and you can just drag it right over here. That's pretty good. And just drop it there. Now let's go ahead and we're gonna mate this. So the first mate we're going to add is between this hole that coincides with the, I shouldn't say coincides, it's a perpendicular to this blue face here. So select that hole, go to the mate tool, and select the blue hole on the leg. Hit the green check. And hit the green check on mate again too. And let's see what we just did. Now you can pull this out, all right, you can pull it in. Now, what we want to do is add another mate, but make sure you add it between the blue face, blue flat face this time, and the blue flat face that's in its line of sight. So example being, you wouldn't want to select this blue face on this opposite side to that blue face, because guess what? It's going to pull through and it's going to be floating on the outside and intersecting partially into the leg. So just make sure you look at your selections before finish this. So go to mate, select this blue face right here, and then you're going to rotate. Again, I'm just doing that with the middle mouse button, pushing it down, and select this face here. Now, if you did it the wrong way, like where it's actually floating on the outside, you have this tool right here, flip mate alignment. I'm cautious about using it because sometimes if you have other mates, like I already have a mate on there of concentric between the holes. And I've seen it where it's worked before, it actually flipped it, and I've seen it where I flipped it and it's errored out. So I'm just running on the side of caution here. It might work just fine if you hit the flip button, but in my experience of 
over the years. Sometimes it just doesn't behave the way that I would expect. So uh, it's great that they have the flip tool, but I'm just not going to use it here. I don't need to actually. Hit the green check. And let's hit the green check again over here. Rotate this around. Notice to the right of your pointer, you have that little symbol. If you ever have that little symbol and you're trying to select other entities, you might have just reached over your keyboard or you might have accidentally hit the X key. So just be aware. Now you know how to turn off. You just click over here to turn that off. Okay, now let's grab this and you'll see this rotates and it's positioned between the legs of the oak. Let's drop in the next part. Go to insert components. Now you could go and do it the way I just showed you where I bring up the, the other method and drop it in. Um, in fact, let's show you another, another method. Okay. Eh, no, you know what? We'll save that because there's some advantages. We'll save it for one of the pins that's going to go in here. So I'll show that to you. It's really pretty cool. All right, let's go back to browse. Sorry. All right. Now, what we're looking for this time is the yoke female. Go ahead and select yoke female, hit open, just drag it right over here. And you can see now we have red hole to red hole uh, to this hole along that red surface. And then the red surface here to the red surface on the back side. So let's go ahead and do those. Go to the mate tool, select this gray hole right here. And I, again, I have a lot of students that don't use their zoom. And I'm not sure why. Uh, think of it. Like I used to like to play darts or build uh, darts. And what if someone gave you the opportunity to say, I want you to get a bullseye and you could go right up to the board. You're going to go up to the board and you're going to stick that in the bullseye. So don't be afraid to use your zoom. There's nothing hindering you. You don't have to have it way zoomed out. Zoom up on this stuff when you select it. it just makes it a lot easier. This is teaching this for 22 years. I'm just saying that because I've seen a lot of students follow this one up. Okay. Now select this red hole. It doesn't really matter. Each Any red hole on that uh, yoke female will work. And you'll see it will align. Hit the green check. Now let's rotate this around and select the red flat face of the yoke. Rotate this so that you're looking at the other side. Don't be lazy and select this side. That's not the way to do it. You got to rotate it around, get this side so that it contacts. Hit the green check. All right, looking pretty good here. Now let's uh, grab this plunger down here and drag it up a little bit. Notice I'm rotating around a little fast here now. I'm assuming you kind of know how to use the tools pretty well. So uh, forgive me if I'm going a little fast for you. If you were keep, if you would, if those of you who've gone through the, the studies like exercise one, two, three, four and the labs, you're way up to speed. Some of you I know don't always have the time to do that, so it might be going a little fast for you. Okay, now select this pale green surface on the underside of that plunger. And then go ahead and select this surface right here. And notice on the left, it actually selected parallel. That's one it hasn't done yet. It's done coincident. Coincident is face-to-face -face contact. Um, Parallel allows it to align itself, but at whatever distance it is. So parallel is a very useful thing. And SOLIDWORKS AI automatically knew to do that. Um, the latest and greatest systems out there, as far as I know, SOLIDWORKS is, kind of holds the crown right there. And that's why I said this is pretty impressive that it could do it. SOLIDWORKS is the only one that I've tested within the past couple of years that when I do this particular assembly, it knows to automatically pick parallel for us, which is really nice. Uh, not all systems can do that, but I'm sure they will. They might already do it for all I know. Uh, okay, hit the green check. And hit the green check again here. Now, those of you wondering what this is exactly, it's a widget. It's just a, a mechanical U-joint to show how to mate and it's really not much to it. It's, I just had a little fun design in it. That's all. Okay, let's uh, hit the space bar. Go to you can go to this little poly polygon right here. It's kind of a backwards isometric view. Grab this yellow flat face here and drag with your mouse button to press and make a little circle. And you can see this is what we call dynamic assembly motion. 
All right, you can see the parts interact with each other. Even though we don't have the pins in there yet, it's still working, it's functioning. Because those degrees of freedom have been removed and because of the mates that we've added. All right, let's add some pins. Now, this is where I want to show you a really neat little capability here. If we go back and we bring up Explorer, remember, it's just down here. You can middle click, bring up a little window, go to your documents, and wherever you put your files. I put them again, my documents, SOLIDWORKS Basics, E5 folder. And here's a red pin. And I'm going to zoom up with this up on the screen. Now, watch this. This is, uh, oh, you know what? Just double click actually on the red pin. What it's going to do, it's going to ask, uh, how do you want to open this? Select SOLIDWORKS Launcher and hit OK. Now it's going to open up the pin here, zoom up on the pin. Now it's opened up by itself. Now go up here to Window and file, find Tile Vertically. And now it should spread the two out. So we just opened up the pin by itself. And this is just another method of inserting parts. Now there's a neat advantage, a distinctive advantage you have with doing it this way. It's not always practical to open every single part, by the way. But if you have it available, this is what you can do. Watch. I'm going to zoom up on this hole right here. I'm going to grab the shaft of this pin. And I'm going to drag it to the hole, the red hole. Notice to the right of my pointer, and notice where, exactly where my pointer is. It's on the actual red surface of the hole. And I get two little cylinders stacked. That's a good thing. It's adding a concentric mate automatically for you. Release. And then hit the green check. Now, you can maximize the assembly. You could click on the maximize button here, or you could double click on the blue bar at the top. Either way. Um, now, grab that pin, and you could drag it in. Kind of get it in there like so. All right. If it rotates on you, that might happen a little bit. Just rotate it back or whatever you need to do. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want this pin to be stuck in here to where this surface is aligned to that outside surface of the yoke. So here's what you can do. I'm going to hit escape. I'm going to go to mate and let's see what SOLIDWORKS picks out for us. Now note, you could pre-select what you want here if you knew exactly what you're doing. But for a learner, watch this, this is kind of neat. Click on that blue surface there. Or, uh, not blue, it was red, now it's blue. Now select this surface that I'm hovering over on the yoke. And it pushed it in. Now look at what it picked for us on the left. I picked tangency. So again, that's pretty neat that the AI kind of picked out what the best solution was for us. Mind you, it's not always going to do it right, but in these cases, uh, it does a nice job. All right, let's hit the green check. The green check again. I'm going to insert the parts the more traditional way. Uh, you know what? Actually, let's bring up however you want to bring up the next one. Now, the blue pin, drag that in close in proximity to the blue hole. All right, now I'm going to show you another technique for mating. Now, you notice I dragged that red pin in, but we had opened up that pin. We went to window tile vertically, and then we dragged it in. Um, and you get that auto mate. Now, here's the auto mate that we're going to use, but you have to hold the alt key down on your keyboard. So hold alt. Now, grab the shaft of the blue pin. And if you're not zoomed up, it's going to be difficult, so I'd recommend hitting Escape, zooming up as close as you can to these before trying it. Okay, if you're ready, now drag it into the hole. Now notice I'm holding the Alt key and just getting it into position. Release the mouse button first, then release the Alt key, hit the green check, and you just added a mate. So the Alt key can add a, a selection of mates as well. All right. Now, the tangent mate, I'm going to try it. I think last time I tried it, I don't think it automatically worked. So I'm going to hold Alt and see if I could get this. So Alt, drag that to the surface. And sadly, it doesn't. So that's asking a lot, though. OK, so don't get me wrong. I don't think any system can do that. But let's go at it more 
um, the regular way, the mate tool. Select this face here, select this gray face of the yoke male, and it picked tangent again for us. All right. So I really encourage y'all, um, once you build a part, if you're going to try it again, try different methods like that, like where I just tried to see if that tangency worked, because I can't tell you how many times, even though I read every with every release, SolidWorks, uh, every year they have a new release and they have anywhere between 150 to 250 new features or enhancements that they add. And I'll scan through them. I don't do them all. They're, they actually, you could watch their uh, webcasts on it, but uh, it's very useful in this type of situation. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and hit the green check and rotate this. And here we could see there's some holes in here. There's actually some uh, that we want to put in a set screw or set screws. So let's go to, um, let's do our other method here, bring this up. And, you know, we could just double click on the set screw and then zoom up to it. Go to window, tile vertically. Oh, and I have that red pin, which we don't need. Close that. Uh, you could save it if you like. And now let's go to window tile vertically again. And zoom up to the hole. Grab the thread. Now that's a cosmetic thread on that surface. So hold control, grab that cosmetic thread and drag it in. And sometimes you'll see that the actual, um, the, the wrong face ends out. Like see here we have the set screw, with the little, um, hex in there. It turned out just fine on mine, but on yours, sometimes you have to flip it, uh, move it around. Um, if you're using the other method, actually, oh, actually, I believe the tab key will pop it in and out. Let's see here. Or you could use this one right here, the flip mate alignment. So you could use it afterwards if you like. Hit the green check. Now this surface here, let's see if we could use that alt trick. Alt, select the surface to that and Oh, let's uh, pause in here. All right, so it actually ended up, um, it took a second there, which was uh, interesting. So I'm going to hit the green check. I'm going to try that again. Uh, this time I'm going to try with the tab key. Uh, you know what? I don't have to hold alt when I drag this in, by the way, because we have the, the sides separated. So my apologies. Again, my coffee's worn off for the day here. It's getting a little, it's, only, it's near five o'clock, near quitting time. Okay, I'm going to drag this over here and try hitting the tab key and you'll see it will pop it in or out. And you can see there's no hex in there, so I have the tab to get in there. So I'm going to hit the green check, drag it down a little bit, now get on that surface, and now you have to hold Alt, drag it to the surface. Now there is a tool that enables you, if this were patterned, which I don't believe it was, but uh, there is actually a way to drop a uh, fastener into the original and then have it follow the pattern and automatically do it. But this is just good practice for you. That's a more advanced lesson for a future date. So let's uh, try again. So grab this, drag it here. We don't need to hit the tab key. Lock it in, hit the green check, grab the surface. And what key do we hold? the Alt key. Drag it to this surface here. Oops, I held Alt too late. Oh, there it goes. Okay. And then finally, the last one here. Drag it over. Release it. Green check. Now hold the Alt. Depress your mouse button. Drag it to that surface and align it. Okay, so you got some good practice. I'm going to close that set screw. And I'll save it. Do you have to save it? No, but in this case, I'm saving it. All right, now we could go ahead and bring in the handle. Now the handle, what's unique about the handle, it's actually a sub-assembly. And meaning, i.e. it itself is an assembly, just a small one. And sadly, when I made this, I, I named it, I named the shaft of the handle, handle. So you have a handle part, you have a handle 
top and then you have a handle assembly. So it might get a little confusing here. So my apologies. Let's go ahead and insert that. Let's go to insert component. And uh, if you don't see the handle here, note these are the quick filters. Like you could filter assemblies and then there's the handle or filter parts or whatever, you know, both. So I'm going to click on the handle, hit open, drag that up here, click to release it. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and add a mate between these concentric faces of the pink shaft here and the pink hole. So go to mate, select this pink face here, and then the pink face right over here. Those of you who are uh, colorblind, my apologies, my son's colorblind, so that might be difficult for you to see. Hit the green check. Now drag this up a little bit and then release it. Make sure that this box is cleared out. If not, right click and clear selection. Now see this little flat. Now there's two, uh, there's a yellow surface here. That's the flat surface you want. That's for the keyway. Without the keyway, this won't work. So you have to select the flat surface. Now be careful. This is a rounded surface. Stay away from that one. The flat yellow surface. Click on that and then rotate this around and make sure it's the flat yellow surface for the key on the shaft. Okay, it should align those two, hit the green check. And finally, a mate. Let's go with a distance mate. We'll pre-select it. Now you don't have to pre-select it, by the way. You can post-select it too, but let's pre-select it just for, for the heck of it. Set it to 0 0.01. We're gonna have a little distance between the top and the bottom of the top surface of the bracket to the underside of the handle shaft. So select this surface here, rotate around and select that green ring right here. And hit the green check. And look at that, there's that little gap that you see between, that's what we added. Now that's a very realistic approach. Remember when you're designing things, you design in tolerances. And SOLIDWORKS does actually have tolerance stack analysis. So you can do Monte Carlo simulations on stack analysis, uh, roll up, roll down. Um, we're not going to cover that. That's an advanced, there, that's a whole module in and of itself. Uh, there's videos out there, I'm sure. I don't ever cover that, although I got training for it. Um, it is really neat stuff. Those of you who need to do to tolerance stack analysis. Okay, <clears throat> hit the green check. All right, so now we could do our test. Grab the handle, drag it, and if everything rotates, you did it correctly. Okay. Now what we're going to take a look at is how we could animate that. Let's say we want to make a little video on how this works. Okay, what you do to make a video, go click on Motion Study tab at the bottom. Now you have some um, tools like for Animation Wizard. These are really nice. It enables you to do things. You even have um, gravity, motion study properties, contact, spring, and motor. We're going to use motor. Now over here you have a component direction. Go ahead and select this boss right here. And make sure you click on it, highlights blue, and you'll see a little red arrow. And it's going around. Now over here you have the ability to flip it. I don't think if you click on it, I don't think you could flip the little arrow from there. You have to click over here to flip it. Okay, uh, there's rotary motion. There's also linear motor. So if you're doing uh, a hydraulic cylinder or pneumatic cylinder, you could do that too. Okay, now the constant speed, we'll leave it at 100 revolutions per minute. Uh, notice there's distance, oscillating, segment, data points, expression. There's a lot of really amazing stuff you could do in here. Okay. Um, now with that, let's go ahead and hit the green check mark. And you'll see on our timeline, it's going to run for four, uh, five seconds. And now we could go ahead and zoom out here and we could hit play. And there you can see it rotating. Now it's a little on the jerky side, but um, let's try and fix that. Now over here, you have animation wizard. Let's try the animation wizard. Click on animation wizard. Now notice you have rotate model. Now that's to rotate it literally in space. So if you wanted to add that, that's the only option we have here. But it, we're going to learn how to explode things 
on the lab in just a few minutes here, um, you would actually have the explode and collapse available. So you could show how things are assembled or disassembled. Um, you could import uh, these uh, motion paths and things like that. Um, we're not going to go into those details, but hit next. And we could say, oh, let's rotate around the Y axis and the number of rotations. Let's have it set to one clockwise. Hit next. Now this is going to overlap our existing video and the duration. We'll have it for 10 seconds and the start time will actually start it a little bit after our other thing here. So the start time, let's set it to um, only one second. Okay, so it almost starts like it'll, it'll sit there. You'll start seeing the, the handle rotate and then it gives us one second and then it starts rotating itself. And the handle will probably start. It'll handle only last five seconds. So anyhow, so it'll rotate for an additional five seconds after that. Hit finish. And let's hit play again. Right over here. There, this is play from start. And so we see it rotating. And the parts actually rotating and the assembly is moving. Oh, and it actually kept on and extended our rotation. Um, I didn't expect that, but I should read up on it better next time. Okay, so, and these can be adjusted, these little arrows you could adjust and say, let's say you want something to move and another thing not to move. Oh, and you know, also I forgot to put in a second blue pin there. I just noticed that. So uh, if you want, make sure you put that pin in, those of you who are doing this from home. All right, since we're done with the motion study, to get out of the motion study, oh, one, one last thing, to record. Hit save animation right here. Now you have the ability, you can save it in that same folder. We could call it E5 video, and you could save it as a Microsoft AVI, a Flash, uh, MPEG-4. There's a whole bunch of uh, series of images if you want to recompile them in another software. Uh, and remember, you can make very large, you can make 4K images and things like that. So there's a lot of really neat things you can do here. I'm just going to go with the Microsoft AVI. It works almost every time. And uh, We'll see the render. Now, this is neat. Some of you might not have PhotoView 360, remember. It's in SOLIDWORKS Premium or Professional. Um, anyhow, if you don't have it, you won't see it. But those of you who do can actually have it photorealistically render each frame. So it's crystal clear and it looks real. Almost looks real, so it's pretty impressive. It can do that. Uh, note that it takes a long time because, as you've seen before with the render, it takes a long time to render each image. Now I have 32 threads running here, so I theoretically could probably do a quick one. I'm gonna, I better not. It's gonna, it still might take a while. Now the image size and aspect ratio can make a difference. You could make it like 800 by 600. I don't need it to be particularly super large. Okay, and we have frames per second. Now, 7.5 frames per second is pretty bad, uh, poor quality. Though, again, the reason why it's there is so those of you who have slow computers could get a video done really quick. I'm going to make it 30. Like old television sets used to have a refresh rate of like 29.8 frames per second. And so I'll go with that. But those of you who are gamers, of course, know you could get way up there, 60 frames per second, 120 if you want, uh, for that liquid smooth appearance. Just note that stacks time exponentially. So it could take a long time to render those. Go ahead and hit uh, save here. Now the compressor, you'll see it has several different compressors here. I have some additional ones because I use uh, software from TechSoft Camtasia to make these videos. And so I have these other compression methods. The Microsoft Video One, if you're unsure about something working, Microsoft Video One's old. It works on pretty much any computer. The quality is not going to be great. You could set, you could improve the quality, set it up a little bit higher. It's not anything to write home about, but it works every time or pretty much every time, unless you set it, the quality too high. Let's go ahead and hit, um, We'll leave the compression quality. We'll bump it up to 100. And there's underneath configure, just um, temporal quality ratio. I actually don't know much about that. And you can see how old this compressor is, 1990, 1992. So that's why it works pretty much on everything. Go ahead and hit OK. 
Motion study results are the date. Do you want to recalculate them? Yes. All right. So it's making the video. Now you see it actually recentered itself and it's rotating here. And it's recording the video as we make it at 30 frames per second. So it should actually be quite smooth when we look at the video and preview it. Imagine it having to render each frame though. That could take a long time. But if that's what the job is doing, then that's what you have to set it to. Okay. All right, so let's take a look now. I'm going to go to my folder. And there's the video. I'm going to double click on it. Oh, I'll be darn. It says the video format's not supported on my computer here. Um, anyhow, I'm not going to go through and redo it. Um, but note that you could select a different compressor on that list and it will work. Surprisingly, it didn't uh, give me an error message on this is Windows 10 latest edition. So I'm not sure why. Uh, apparently, it's just not supported anymore. OK. Now let's do the lab. The lab, again, those of you who are learning here, I recommend trying the lab on your own. But there are some differences here. So if you want to step through it with me, Watch me do it first and then try it on your own. That's not a bad strategy. Okay, so if you go here to part files, this time you're going to want lab 5B. There used to be a lab 5A. I took it out because it was really basic. And lab 5B just seems to do a nice job. So lab 5B, download it. Again, it's compressed. And interestingly enough, it's actually the assembly for the part that you did if you did lab four, which is out of the last exercise at the very end, it's an MP, Bluetooth MP3 headset. I scaled it up in size just so I could keep the dimensions easy, but just be aware that's what it is if you're wondering what it is. Okay, here's the lab 5B. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to go ahead and select these. Remember, control A will select them if you want. Right click. You could cut them out of this zip file. Also, as you could go up this direction too. I actually just find students find this easier. You could click on compressed folder tools and select a new directory. Some students might like that. Just be aware. I, I do it this way just because of 22 years of teaching this. It just seems like it resonates better with many of the students. So I'm going to cut these out of here. I'm going to go to my, uh, let's see, the SOLIDWORKS basics. I'm going to make a new folder. And I'm going to call it L5A. Double click in there and paste. And I actually believe they are in a folder. If you were to ext extract them, it would extrude, extract into an L5A folder, but not a big deal. OK. So we can see here there's the parts. Um, and interestingly, oh, there it is, the L4 front bezel. Now, those of you who are in my class and you're turning in your assignment, note that that L4 front bezel, if you use that for your lab, technically that would be considered plagiarism because that's actually mine. You need to make your own. This one is very different than the one that you made um, in terms of the enhancements that are on it. So I'll, it stands out like a sore thumb. So if you're thinking about using any of my files, be aware plagiarism, is, its penalty is failure of the course. So just spend the 20 minutes to make the model. You'll be a lot better off. OK, so uh, let's get started here. Now, I don't think I need to go back to model here, but I'm going to File New, Assembly, and hit OK. I'm going to start to assemble that. Now, the drawing is actually in the uh, instructional manuals. So if you go back to Vertanu 1, instructional manuals, go to SOLIDWORKS Basics. And it should be page 40 something, I believe. Oh, no, here it is. Oh, it's actually page 63. All right, and so there's the assembly. If you want, you could download it, and then you're, you're able to actually rotate it. Let's see, is there a rotate here? Nope, no rotate. So you can see here's the back, here's the front. This is a light pipe. Uh, here's the batteries that are stacked in this little battery shield. There's a little tab on top of there. There's a circuit board. We've got to put those together. There's no movable parts in this, by the way. So don't worry about dynamic assembly motion. 
Okay, so I'm going to go to Browse here. I'm going to go to SOLIDWORKS Basics, L5A. And I'm going to take the very first part. Actually, I'm going to take the rear bezel, L4 rear bezel, and just hit the green check to drop that one in. Now I'm going to go to Insert Component, and I'm going to grab the... I'm going to enhance the size of these so I can see them better. Okay, there's the L4 PC board. Okay, now you could drop that in. If you were to hit the green check mark, it might actually snap right into place, like I was telling you about that little trick. But I'd like you to learn how to mate them. Take the time to learn how to mate them. So I'm going to click over here. All right, now to mate this, remember I showed you the little trick for the Alt key, or you could use the mate tool. So if you use the mate tool, select mate, select the underside green surface of the circuit board, and it's going to rest on one of these posts. Hit the green check. Now you can select this surface right here to the post here. Now this will spin, so you have to lock it in. So the gold ring post, or the gold ring hole is the one we want to lock it into. So this hole here to the surface here, and that should lock it down. So now at this point, we could add some of the additional parts. So let's go back, hit the green check mark there, go to insert component, and select the battery shield. Open that up. Click to drop it right there. Um, now let's try that Alt trick. Hold Alt, grab the outside of the battery shield, and drag it to this surface on the outer surface, the OD of that rubber grommet. And it should go with concentric by default. Hit the green check, drag it up. And this next one, I would just go to Mate. Select this surface here on the top of the rubber grommet to this surface right here. And that should get it sitting on top. Now the battery stack. Insert component, find the battery cell, open that up. Um, if you get this, it's just the font. Is it? I don't have that font anymore that was on the logo on the battery. So just use temporary replacement font. Hit the green check. All right. And so now with the battery, we'll mate the underside surface of it. This is what I was talking about. Like the logo on there uses a font that I don't have anymore. So hit the green check here and the green check there. Now you could select this ring to this outside surface to lock it in position. Now you can stack those if you like, uh, additionally just to practice, but I want to show you another little neat technique. This is an advanced technique of patterning the battery on top of itself. So click on the battery. That's what we want to pattern. Go to linear component pattern up here. Now the spacing, set the spacing. These are 30 thousandths thick. So 0.03 and click up here for the direction. Now the direction is just a vector. So this line off the edge of the battery shield we could use because it goes straight up. Uh, now it's pointing down. So we'll just have to hit over here the little reverse switch. And now the number of instances bump that up and you'll start to see them stacked on each other. And let's see. Maybe they're not 30,000 thick. Let's see. Point oh, maybe they're 60,000. There we go. Sorry. Point zero 0.06 thick. So point zero 0.06, four instances. Make sure that's flipped so it's pointing up. See if you flip it down, they're on the underside. And hit the green check. So that is a linear assembly pattern. Now let's bring in the next part, insert component, the connector, drop that right there and drag it up a little bit. Let's go to mate. Now you can select through a part by right clicking and you'll see the select other and it will select the underside. Rather than rotating, that might be easier for some of you. And then go ahead and select this top surface here, hit the green check, select this concentric surface to the outside surface. There we go. Hit the green check. Now this little notch here, I don't have that actually 
position. It should be positioned straight forward. If you really wanted to, uh, the smart thing, because there is a little notch for it to fit in, is to align it to the notch and the actual uh, cover. But you don't have to do that. All right. Now, insert component. We're going to grab the light frame. Open that up. Drop that in. Now, here's the thing. The transparent components. This is transparent because it, in real life is transparent. Notice if I try and select it while I'm while it's over the actual other parts, SolidWorks defaults to selecting through transparent objects. Here's the trick to select transparent objects if there's something behind it. Hold Shift on your keyboard, and then it will select the transparent object first. So just be aware that's a little trick um, if you need to move it. All right, I'm going to get this over here. I want to align this. Cons uh, actually, I can just align this to the, the posts. Now, these posts are going to align to the openings on the uh, antenna array. So I'm going to go to Mate. I can select the outside here to the hole to align it. And then uh, you probably want to align this one too because it is free floating still. So you could get this face here to that hole. Now you got to select the underside to this surface. So I'm going to rotate around, select this little underside right there to the green floor. And there it is. It's locked in. Hit the green check. Insert component. Now, if you want, you can try to align the L4 that you built and see if it fits. It'll actually tell you right away if it's if you didn't design it right. But beware, there are some design enhancements I had to make on the L4 cover that we're going to use that's in this uh, group of assembly of uh, this assembly. So it is a little bit different, but the size technically is the same. And I think you could made it up. All right, let's give it a shot. L front for bezel. Drop it right there. And I'm going to go ahead and go to mate, select this surface. And you can select this surface right here. The tapered surfaces actually will function. All right. Now we need to align. Uh, let's align this concentric face here to this face. And finally, close it up. I'm going to actually, there's a little gap. So I'm going to select this little ledge to the top of this surface right here. Hit the green check. And we've got it. Now let's explode it. To explode an assembly, what you do is right over here you have Exploded View. Select Exploded View. Select the front cover first. It really doesn't matter what you select first, I suppose. Go to the Z arrow. Now you have to be careful here. Make sure the arrow itself turns blue. Whatever arrow you're going to pick for a direction needs to turn blue before you start dragging. Otherwise, it'll drag it in the wrong direction. So especially working in an isometric view like this, it's difficult to ascertain exactly for some of you users uh, what direction you're pulling it in. So drag that forward. You see a little ruler. Drag it out about three inches. Now grab, uh, now before you do that, hit done over here on the lower left. Now click on this part. Grab the Z arrow, make sure just the zero turns blue. Drag it backwards about three inches. Hit done. Now we want to select the light frame. Anyone remember the trick? What key you have to hold? Shift and allows you to select it. Oops, I actually selected everything. I'm going to, um, right here, I'm going to hit this undo. Okay. Got to drag that one back again. Three, three and a half actually this time. Hit done. You could also select the transparent object with nothing behind it and it will allow you to select it. I'll drag that forward. Hit done. Grab this part. Grab the Z, drag it backwards. Hit done. Remember, if you forget, fail to hit done, hit undo up here just one time. Don't hit undo too often. Okay, click on this. Drag that back. Done. And we'll break up these batteries. One. And this is good practice for you. 
two, done, three, done, and click on this. And now we're really done, so hit the green check. Okay, so we have our exploded state. Now there is also, under exploded view, you have exploded line sketch. Click on that, and you could select like this outer ring here. And you can see the little arrow. Flip the arrow by clicking on it. Oh, darn it, I got a double arrow. Um, let's clear this out, hit clear selection. Select that edge. Now what we want is that to flip. Let's hit reverse, there we go. And now select this edge here, and you'll see it go straight through everything. Okay, hit the green check, and that gives us our exploded line sketch. Now, let's animate it. Go to Motion Study, and we're going to go to Animation Wizard. And look at that, we have Explode or Collapse. So if you want to show how something is assembled, go ahead and select Collapse. Hit Next. And the duration, let's have it nine seconds. Start time, we'll have it start immediately at zero. Hit finish. And we could hit play. And there we could see it. Now it's remembering my 30 frames per second. So it's very smooth right now. That piece of now you could also have it reciprocate and do other things. But let's go ahead uh, and actually, let's give it a shot. Watch this. Go to Animation Wizard again. And now if you wanted to delete that last path, if you don't like it, you check this and you could restart over again. But now watch this. Now we'll have it explode. Hit next. And now the duration is nine seconds and it starts after it's finished collapsing. So it's gonna re-explode again. All right, and so let's hit finish. And now it's added the reverse. Let's hit play again. So we see it, uh, now it's exploding. We should hit play at beginning to see the whole thing. I'm gonna hit stop. Now to record it, just go to the animation wizard. Oh, I'm sorry, cancel, that's that uh, little film strip right here, animation. And you could set it up, let's go again, 800 by 600. I don't need it really, I don't need a large format. We'll do 7.5 frames per second just to get it done. Uh, the aspect ratio. Uh, four to three, and hit save. We'll just keep the same name. I'll use the Logitech video. Let's see how that compressor works. Hit OK. Yes, so let it recalculate. And basically it'll run through. It's gonna take a long time. I'm gonna end it right there. That concludes exercise five. Welcome back. We're going to take a look at exercise 16, I'm sorry, exercise six today. And with that, it's actually creating a two dimensional layout drawing. And we're going to look at the detailing aspects of SOLIDWORKS. So there's no part modeling today with respect to this drawing. Uh, the lab, there is actually a part to model up. So let's begin. First, go to vertani1.com. So V is in Victor, E R. T is in Tom, A is in Apple, N is in Nancy, U, X is in X-ray, and then don't forget the one, dot com. Go to part files, and you're gonna go ahead and select the exercise six part. Now, uh, those of you who might have older versions of SolidWorks, you could scroll down and use the old version. The old version, I think, dates back uh, maybe three or four years uh, or so. Okay, but uh, they're basically the same part. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and go to the instructional manual to show you our plan, what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to go to the instructional manuals and SOLIDWORKS basics and get to page. Sixty four. Sixty four starts this exercise and let me show you what our plan is. This is what we're going to try and, or this is what we will create today. This drawing, a front view, a top view, a right, right view, an auxiliary view, an isometric view, a section view, a detail view. So the first half of this lesson is devoted to 
views. The second half will be adding these dimensions, like there you can see an inspection dimension, and we're going to bring in dimensions from the actual part model uh, by retrieving them. And we're going to try some other things out as well. Now the lab is actually building this part and I'm going to go through it rather quickly after we're finished with this. And again, anytime you do these labs, my recommendation is that you, you pause my video. Try it on your own. And then if you get stuck, watch the video. Because I, I just plug in the dimensions really quick. Some of the dimensions I put in aren't even correct because uh, the intent is really for you to try these on your own. When you get a job in industry, as some of you might know, there's no video to show you how to do your job. So the best thing right now is to learn how to do these independently. But the exercises we do together. So let's begin. All right, so if you have that part file downloaded, uh, by the way, when it downloads, you go back to the uh, part files and exercise six, you should see it appear. You can just hit download and the lower left corner, if you're using Chrome, you just click on it. It should launch inside SolidWorks. If not, go to uh, SolidWorks Open, find your download directory and find the exercise six or E6 drop it in. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the little arrow up here, make sure you tack that in, go to file. Now there's several ways to do this, by the way. This is just one of the methods I'm showing you that I think is very convenient. Go to file and find make drawing from part. Now what this does is it's going to bring up the sheet size and format. And you can see here there's A ANSI landscape, there's portraits, there's, we're looking for just A ANSI landscape. Those of you in my class, uh, everything's on A size. So if, you, if I do have, ever have you printed out, you could print it out on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Go ahead and hit OK. Oh, by the way, in there, you could select the different sheet sizes for your company. Uh, there, you could customize those as well, or you could even select a blank sheet and put in the parameters. Um, Okay, so here we have the drawing, and you can see it's broken up into quadrants. We have A2 down here, B2, 1B, and A1. Um, over here on the right, one of the advantages of going the route that we took is actually, um, you'll see there's projected view here. Normally that, I, sh I should say, uh, never mind, uh, there's standard three view, I should say. Standard three view normally Back in the day, that's what we used to drop in front, top, and right. You could still do that. But by going to File, Make Drawing from Part, we get this view palette on the right-hand side. Now, the view palette, you could select multiple parts. Like, let's say we didn't want the Exercise 6 part. We could click on something else. You could uh, refresh it if you're not seeing what you want. But what we're looking for specifically is the front view. And there we see it. Just grab it with your mouse button. Hold your mouse button down while you're hovering over it don't let go drag now that into the screen to the lower left corner here and get it pretty close down there release it but we're not done yet now push your mouse forward and you'll see it will unfold a top view go ahead and once you get that unfolded a little bit there click now move your mouse to the right and there you have your right side view drag that far to the right we need some space here and then if you go straight up above that, you'll get an isometric view. Go ahead and click. Now we have the views we want. You could go ahead and hit um, escape. Now to move these views, you just simply hover over the edges of, there's a little profile around it, a box I should say, and hover over. When you get that those little orange edges to appear, click and hold and now you could drag that so the isometric view will drag right into the view here uh, i should say into the sheet quadrant 1b and these views if you grab those edges and hold them with your left mouse button you can drag up and down with that one this one drags left and right notice i can't drag that up or down by right clicking i could unlock the view and move it but we we're following the ANSI standards here. We want that to unfold the way we're seeing it. So just leave it as is. Now, we do need to make a little extra room here 
because we need to have a top view here as well as an auxiliary view, which would fit. I should say it's section view, not a top view. This is the top view here. An auxiliary view, and we're going to have a, uh, a couple other things that we're going to drop in. So let's shrink this down. Now, we could click on any one of those individual views, and on the left, you'll see there's properties for it. For example, you could change them to shaded with edges. Or my preference, I would like you for my students to use this one right here, which is hidden lines removed. Notice there's also hidden lines visible. If you click on there, you can see the hidden lines. And there's times you're going to want to do that too. But let's just go with hidden lines. And here you could turn off the sheet scale and you'd be able to specify the scale for that specific view that you have selected. And there's other options here, which we're not going to discuss just yet. Now, if you want to change this for the whole sheet and have all the views update at the same time versus just one individual view, this is what I'd like you to do. Hover your pointer over the tab in the lower left corner here where it says Sheet 1 and right click. And now you'll see Properties. Go ahead and select Properties. Now with properties here, you could actually change the sheet name. You could change the scale. See, it's at, currently at one half. Now what SOLIDWORKS does behind the scenes, actually in the tools options menu, you could adjust this, but it actually is set to, there's a little equation built into it where it looks at the sheet size that you supply it with. And then it looks at the part that you supply it with and it calculates the, the best fit for standard three views, front, top, and right. So they're not too small, they're not too large. And it picks from these standards, like, you know, we have a half here. But let's take a look. Now let's say, typically we don't want a third scale. You could go down to a quarter, but that's gonna be a little small. But just so you can see this, let's go ahead and change it to a one third scale. So change it to a three. All right, now hit apply changes. And you'll see now that they're, they're all smaller. Okay. Now let's go back down to the sheet one tab again and right click and go to properties because there's more that I want to show you. here. Okay. There's also the type of projection. There's first angle and there's third angle. Third angle is what we use here in the United States. Um, in Europe, certain parts of Europe, England, they might use first angle, which actually flips the direction of something. Uh, let's use my phone here. Let's say this is the uh, the front. And within the United States, when you unfold the view above it, it'll actually uh, show you the top. And in some other countries that use third angle, it'll actually show you the bottom. So it's just a, a, a variation of what we typically do. All right, so I'm, we're going to keep it at third angle, though. And we have the ability to also decide maybe that sheet's too small. Maybe we might want to go with a larger size sheet. And so you could select from this list and it will actually update everything. It's quite nice. Go ahead and hit cancel. All right, let's move these down a little bit. And we're going to proceed with the next type of view. We're going to actually create an auxiliary view next. So find up here auxiliary view. By the way, model view and projected view. Model view, um, just to show you this really quick, we're not going to use it, but if you click on model view, you could select the part file or a different part. Let's say you want to have multiple parts inside of the same drawing. It happens sometimes. Uh, but anyhow, you could select it by browsing, and then you just go to next, and then you could select the view that you want from that, like here's front, top, and right. So it's a little generic, doesn't give you the actual image of the model. Uh, except on a preview down below, but um, that's what that's for. So we're going to cancel that. Projected view is what we we witnessed earlier when we dropped in the front view and we were able to unfold the top and a right view. That will allow you to create project, additional projected views off of any view. But let's go to auxiliary view. Select this little edge here of the actual flange because we want to unfold off of that. 
and you should see it will dart off to the right here. Get it somewhere in the center and click to release it. And now we have an auxiliary view. Now we're going to go ahead and make a, a, a section view. So go ahead and click on section view here. And notice what happens. This I'm glad this happened because this is a common mistake I see with my students. And I, I just repeated it. The last view we had selected, it automatically dropped in the section view for that. And we don't want that. So hit escape on your keyboard a couple times until it disappears. I would recommend pre-selecting the top view because that's what we want to section. And now you could go to the section view icon and you'll see it's inside there. Now, this is going to give us a vertical section view. We don't want that. But look at over here, you have cutting lines. You have horizontal, you have auxiliary, and you also have a line. So we're going to actually go with horizontal. So click on horizontal and get the tip of your pointer to the center of that, what looks like a bullseye. And when you get the orange dot in the center, click, hit the green check, and drag off your view here. Click to release it. Now, SOLIDWORKS is pretty strict in that it sticks with the ANSI standards or whatever standard you select. Uh, for example, in the options menu here, you can see this if you go to document properties, I'm set to ANSI. Um, I could go in here and I could change that to uh, the ISO standard or the GO standard, whatever you want to set it to. And it will actually update all of the dimensions so that the arrows look per standard for that, okay, as well as um, any other things that might be on that drawing or annotations. But I'm going to cancel there. Now, I've seen it where people like to see this flipped, where we would actually see that bell housing flipped reverse. So what you can do with that is over here on the left, while the view is still in a selected state, you could hit flip direction right here, or you could just double click on the arrowhead or the, not the arrowheads, but the actual arrow line here. Now, when you do this, you'll get cross hatching that appears on the view. Notice the view didn't update. That's what it's letting you know. The cross hatching is just to let you know that it hasn't updated yet. And to get it to update, you want to rebuild. And so right up here, we have the rebuild button or control B as in boy. Go ahead and hit it. And now you'll see it has flipped. And now click anywhere off of that to display it properly. Be aware that if you don't update your views or hit rebuild before you hit print, let's say you're going to print this out, that cross hatching will show up in the drawing indicating that that view has not been updated. So uh, it's a good thing that it does that actually because you might not realize that you made a change and then all of a sudden you send that drawing out. Whereas here it actually puts that cross hatching in that view. So just be aware that you need, you, you might want to hit rebuild if you see that. Okay. So we have our, our view there. Let's zoom up to that view. I'm taking my pointer and I'm hovering in the center and keeping it in the center as I scroll my wheel toward me. And that way I could zoom to that region. Now I want to show you how to change these, uh, section lines. Get the tip of your pointer, and you have to be very accurate here, get it over the section line and click. And on the left hand side, you'll see it brings up a library of area hatch fills. Now turn off the checkbox for material cross hatch. Depending upon the material that you selected, if you did select it, it will actually um, put in the proper cross hatch according to the ANSI standard. We didn't really select any material in advance. So it just goes with the generic, uh, what they call iron brick stone. But let's go ahead and if you increase this scale, you'll see that the detail gets finer inside there. You could also adjust the angle if you want by hitting the angle. And you could go with solid or none or go back to hatch. Now there's also, you could apply those changes to the specific component. So the whole component will change over any sections that appear. There's that region, just the view or the specific body because SOLIDWORKS enables multi bodies inside parts. You can actually treat it almost as if it's like an assembly by changing the cross hatching. Anyhow, go ahead and uh, just let's keep it at component. Notice there's layers, layers we get into a little later um, but uh, not right now. Okay, hit the green check. 
Now zoom out a little bit and actually I'm going to pan over here. If I hold my uh, control key and I hold the middle mouse button down or the wheel, if I push it down like it's a, a button and control, I could pan this over to center it. Now I want to make a, a detail of this area and that's going to zoom up on that region. So find detail view right here and hover somewhere in the middle there and click and drag out a circle. Click again and you'll see your detail view in a preview state waiting for you to click to position it. So I'm going to click and position it right there. Now the little C that's here, you see you can move that around just so you don't have it over a line. However, over on the left, while that is still selected, that C, you could go over to the per standard and you could select from a small library of broken circle with leader, no leader, or connected. Try connected. You'll see it will connect the two with a straight line. You have with leader. And for the midterm, you will be, I'm going to ask you to change something to, to with leader. So just try and remember that one for the midterm. It's worth 10 points. All right, and so there is our detail view. Now, the detail views are intelligent too. Let's say, see, we, we're coming up with a scale of two thirds, which is 50, or uh, it's double what we had for one third. So maybe we want that to be one to one. Now, you could double click on this text and actually type in over the two a one and over the three a one, and it will update. It's actually intelligent, that note. Uh, but there's actually, rather than doing that, if you just click on the view border here, on the left, you could go down here and select from a list of standards. Notice one third isn't on there. That's not a typical standard. That's why I chose it, just to show you you could customize it if you wanted to. Be aware you probably wouldn't want to use one third on, on a drawing, but just use it as an example here. Go one to one. Hit the green check. All right, and so we have our detail view. You could also grab the notes and you could drag them in a little closer if need be. Now, let's say we want to um, look at this view here. Take a look at this view. Now, as you zoom up, and when I used to work in industry, I worked for a firm where we made a lot of prototypes. And so we'd have to create drawings. And I actually worked in the shop for some time. So I'd be working on the lathes and the mills. and Sometimes I'd get a, a drawing and I just couldn't ascertain by looking at the drawing what some of the edges were because we were, we were using solid models back in that, at that time. And I don't have a very good example here, but see how these edges are all object style, i.e. They, they're not dashed in any way. There's no representation as to, to let me know that that's, that's a fillet, that's a tangent edge, which really wouldn't be seen on the real model. And so, as a courtesy, it was very nice when the engineer started to actually do something like what I'm going to show you here. By right clicking in that view, you could go to Tangent Edge and change it to With Font. Now you could remove it, but it, that too doesn't look quite right all the time, especially if you're the guy out in the shop working on this part, because sometimes it's like, oh, what, what are we looking at there? This makes it a lot more easy for the, the guys in the shop to ascertain what they're looking at. At least it did, it helped me. And it's a nice courtesy that I pass on to when I, when I design something. So um, you don't have to do that, but that, and, and again, no, only do that if your company acknowledges that that's okay. All right, so you can change those edges. Now to do multiples of those, like I could click control and select many of these views and do the same thing, then right click tangent edge with font and they'll update. There is also in the tools options, the ability to set that to as a default. Now, this view right here, it's acceptable at many companies now to actually have that shaded. The only time they didn't shade things was back in the days when they had plot, like pen plotters. And so it was very difficult and time consuming to shade. But now with inkjet, you can actually shade this view usually. And again, check with your leadership at your company and make sure this is okay. But you could click on shade with edges or just shaded. And that's a very useful image quite often for, again, the, the, the guys working on the bench. <clears throat> Don't, I would not recommend shading the other views, even though it looks really nice. 
it's not necessarily accepted in all companies. So be careful with that one. Don't shade all the views. Hit the green check. All right, now we're going to go ahead and move on to the second segment of this. Now, you have the ability to change other entities. Other, we're going past views. Now, oh, by the way, there's all these other types of views that you see up here. We're not going to go into those. This is a basic introduction. Um, so if you want to see, you could check out different videos for those ones. All right, now we're going to take a look at another option here. SOLIDWORKS divides this drawing into two, you might say, I don't like to use the word layers because layers refer to something that's in other CAD systems for putting multiple variations on the same sheet. This Imagine a sheet of imaginary glass sitting over the drawing template. See, right now, like this A or this 2 or this uh, the border, maybe I want to change the color of the border or add additional information in the title block or break break it out a little bit more. Here's how. You could either right click on any opening on the drawing or go back to the sheet one tab and go to edit sheet format. Now what that does is it takes off that imaginary sheet of glass as I called it and enables you to go in here and select this. Like let's say I want this to be a different color. We don't have the colors up. Let's bring that up right to mouse button click up here in this gray area away from icons and go to customize and what we're looking for is the line format check line format and hit okay it generally appears in the lower left corner and here you actually do have the ability to set up layers in the traditional CAD sense um, but we're not going to cover that just yet now what we have, um, when we go in here and we click on entities, we could generally go in and we could change the line color. Let's see here, um, the border, it's not, it doesn't like that, but let's say we want to change this border here, these lines. And this also works on the drawing with the, the views, but I could select those entities. I could go over here, I could change the thickness. I could also change the color. Let's say maybe I want that to be something that will stand out. Let's go with a green. Hit OK. And now once you click off of that, it should appear. And we could now right click. Oh, and by the way, uh, to break these boxes up, you could just go to the sketch tools. And let's say we want to break this in half right here. You could draw on additional geometry and completely alter the title block if you like. Now, let's get out of this. The way to get out of it is in the upper right corner here, you have, it will edit the sheet, which basically puts that imaginary sheet of glass with our drawing views over this to protect it. Or we could right click in the center of the screen, go to edit sheet there, or right click on the tab down here and edit sheet. And there's our views. So never panic. If your views disappear, just remember that little button in the upper right. That's usually the easiest way out. And we can see the green update and the additional box that we broke out there. Now let's take a look at adding dimensions. Actually, let's add a dimension to this view here. Let's go to Smart Dimension. And let's say we want a dimension from this, this to this point here, or this edge. I'm going to hit Escape. Try that again. There we go to that edge. All right, now there's not a lot of magic there. We've been building parts, and that's the same way we dimension inside part files. Not going to spend a lot of time showing you how to do that, but that's an example. You could add dimensions that way. Now you could also go in here and click on those dimensions. You could adjust the, the distance gap between the lines. You could flip the arrowheads by clicking on the arrowheads there. Uh, obviously, we don't want that. You could also adjust the leader length and things like that. 
Let's just leave that alone for right now. Notice it's a light gray. It will by default print out in light gray to let you know it's a reference dimension. Its value can't be changed. So if we just double click on it, we get the ability to go in here and we could put in bilateral tolerances and all those fun things that we saw in earlier um, videos here. But um, let's move on here. So this view now, let's let's extract or retrieve the dimensions that we actually added to the model. Some companies like to do this, some do not. So just be aware, wherever you go to work, check with the management to make sure you're doing it the way they want you to do this. So on, what we're going to do is we're going to go to annotations and there's something called model items. And this is basically to retrieve the dimensions that you already dropped in there. Go to model items. Now you have the ability to source of the selected feature, the entire model. Be aware you select the entire model. When you click on it, you're going to get a, a cluster of dimensions that you have to funnel through. May not be the easiest task. So feature by feature might be a little bit easier. Uh, and then over here you say bring up the dimensions. Uh, there's whole, whole wizard, whole call out. Um, tolerance dimensions and things like that. All those things could have been added to the 3D model and then you could call them up here. You have annotations like notes, surface finish symbols, GD and T. Again, all those things could be added to the 3D model and then later in a drawing called up. And then you have reference geometry and sometimes you just using surfaces that might be imported from someplace. You might want to see them. You could turn it on that way. But let's go ahead and select right in the center of this part. And now you can see the dimensions that it's retrieving. These are the actual dimensions and how they were laid out by the designer of the 3D model. So this is why I've been encouraging my student, you guys over the past several weeks to lay the dimensions out how you might want to see them on a drawing because they come up that way when you retrieve them. And it can save you a lot of time and it's just easier to interpret what you're looking at versus a cluster of dimensions that are just floating everywhere. So I'm going to hit the green check mark. And you have the ability to move these dimensions. These dimensions, their value can be changed. So um, you can actually click on them and change them. Now this 25 radius here, let's bring that up there. Now we can see the arrowhead might be undesirable. You could flip the arrowhead if there's enough space or it flips automatically. And you can adjust those dimensions there. Now this 0.13, we probably want to see that with three decimal places. So we could go ahead and change that to three. Whereas other dimensions, maybe not. But also this would be like dimensioning the hidden lines. And if you, many of you who make drawings know that that's a big no-no. You'd never want to dimension the hidden lines. So that belongs maybe in a different view. And here's what we can do. Zoom out. Now you can actually move that much of the time to a different view, as long as that view is parallel. If the view isn't parallel to how it was drawn out, like for example, if everything was drawn on the front plane, and then all of a sudden on the right view, you wanted to bring up these same dimensions, there's a high likelihood that you're not going to be able to see them because they're relative to the view. You're only seeing what's parallel to the view here. Okay, now here's how to move a dimension. And actually, um, you don't typically want to copy a dimension unless it's two different sheet. So copy would be holding control. Remember, we don't, we don't want to do that here because it's on the same sheet. You don't want duplicate dimensions. Hold shift. Get your pointer over the point one, two, five. Depress your mouse button once and hold it. Drag while you're holding the shift key and holding the mouse button down. Get it to the center of the view that you want to drop it in. Don't try and position it right away until you release it first. So release the mouse button first, and then you can release shift once you see it there. Now you could go in and you could adjust where you want to see that view. And there we go. <clears throat> Let's try that one more time. The 17 degree dimension here. Let's, uh, let's actually try the control key just to see you. This is what not to do really for the same drawing. So just be careful, but control, grab the 17, drag it to the center of that view, release the mouse button first, then release control. 
Now you see it kept the 17 down here, which we don't really want. So you could hit delete on your keyboard. Bring that 17 dimension here and you could proceed to drag down that line. And now let's say we want to actually have a center line in here. Here's how. Go to uh, hit escape a couple times. And on annotation, you'll see center line. Click on center line, select this edge here and this edge here, and it will actually create a center line. And I'm going to hit escape. I'm going to drag this down. Now let's say we want the CL on there. Let's bring this down a little bit. The CL symbol for center line. Here's what you could do. You could go down, um, you could go to the note tool. And right here, you'll see the little C, uh, add symbol. Click on that. And the first thing you see is CL. But there's other symbols in there, too. So just be aware. There's a lot of neat little tools that are buried. Go ahead and take that and just drop that right there. Now, it brings up the uh, formatting. So if you want a little bit smaller, let's go with maybe um, nine points. And then click anywhere off of it. And then you can relocate it so that it's centered. All right, so let's move on here. So we've seen how to add dimensions and retrieve dimensions. Oh, let's try and add this 4.75 diameter to the top view. Hold Shift, drag that in. And you can actually drag a cluster of dimensions if you wanted to. Now we have the 4.75 over here. Now here's the thing. If you click on that, let's go to the Leaders tab, and you could set it to Diameter. and Oh, I'm sorry, not there. Uh, right click on it and go to display options. And you want display as diameter. Now you're going to drag it out again and it actually gives you the diameter. And it, uh, more typical how you'd want to see it versus a linear dimension. Okay, let's say we also wanted to uh, delete or hide a dimension, you can actually click on dimensions that are, maybe you don't want them here. Like maybe you don't want this. You could hit delete on your keyboard. Now by clicking on delete, that doesn't actually delete it from the model. It just deletes it from the view. And you could retrieve it again if you'd like. Um, and here's another option. You actually do have the ability to go up to display. Uh, there's actually a hide show dimensions and you can turn them on and off and such. But now let's drag these in. You can pop that arrow in a little bit. Now these two dimensions, we see that um, they're a little bit big and also they don't fit well for the size of the drawing. Now it's a 12 point format that we have here, but let's say we want to change it to maybe something smaller, like maybe nine. Here's what you could do. You could go to the gear up here, go to document properties, go to annotations and go to font. And first of all, let's change this. Um, instead of 12 points, I'll click on points. Let's change it to nine. Well, yeah, we'll stick, we'll change it to nine. Hit OK. Notice you could change the um, attachments, the arrowheads, and things like that too from a library. But let's go to detailing. Uh, let's see. Oh, go to dimensions. Now the annotations were just for like notes and such, but now let's change the dimension font too. Go to font right here and change it to points. And let's change that to nine as well. Now here's more information on the arrowheads. So if you want to make them smaller and things like that, you could adjust that size. You have the ab ability to have dual dimension display. So millimeters and inches, and it will put one or the other in brackets next to it. Uh, you have the precision for the primary precision. You could say, let's say you want three decimal places um, or dual precision. This is again for the uh, dual precision. So if you want to see that as well. Um, and I think that's about all we want to cover right now in there. Let's go ahead and hit OK. And you can see things have tightened up a little bit. So it looks a little bit nice tidier. Now this these dimensions here, let's say we want to rotate those. Again, it goes against the NC standard here, but if you select both of these holding control, go over to leaders, 
And at the very bottom, there's a checkbox, Custom Text Position. Go ahead and select the third option, and you'll see it will rotate them 90 degrees. Also, if you're making an inspection drawing or inspection dimensions, let's say this 2.5 inch, you could click on that. And over on the left here, you have Inspection Dimension, and it'll put a little bubble around it. And we can drag that out here, and run out of room. Same with this one here. Okay, now up here, let's say we wanted to, again, we don't have a great example here for ornate dimensions, but I'd like to show it to you. If you go to the little arrow underneath Smart Dimensions, you could find, let's go with Vertical Ornate Dimensions. Now, the first thing you have to do is locate the zero. So if you select this, you could drag the zero off, or maybe over here, click, and now every edge that you select, it'll get the center, and then it's it's going to make it driven in this case. That's fine. And put that there. You could hit Don't Show again if you don't want to see that. Now, when it says it's a driven dimension, that means its value can't be changed. And we can see that by the color. Now, if you don't want that to print out grayscale like that as a reference dimension, when you go to the file print, you can actually specify just black and white versus grayscale for the print and thus those will all come out the same color. Now down here you do have a color display mode too uh, if you want to turn colors off and things like that. Okay, now these little uh, arrows for the, let's hit escape. You can move this and actually squeeze this down a little bit. All right, so now we've seen how to add dimensions. Let's add some annotations. Like for example, let's add a note. Go ahead and click on note. And you'll see there's options in here for that note. We were here before and we actually select the center line, but let's go ahead and drop that right inside here. And I'm just gonna type out, and I know we have exercise six below, but let's just go ahead and type it out in here just to, to show this again. Or we could type bell housing, I suppose, underneath title and hit escape. We know how to edit that actually somewhat because remember as I right clicked anywhere, you could go to um, edit sheet format. You could click on this. Now this is an intelligent note. This actually draws that information from the part that you inserted. So you could customize this bill of materials. It's more advanced. There's videos on it. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now though. But if you wanted to, you could delete that note. Now I could right click and edit sheet to get back out, or I could have clicked on that little icon that was right here a moment ago. Now, surface finish symbols. Go ahead and select that. And notice you could drop it on edge, you could drop it on uh, surface. It does go normal to that edge, so if you wanted. And over on the left, you have the symbol layout. You could put in like JAS machine required uh, for the next one or whatever you're looking for and all the notes that might be required to go in there as well. The whole call out. Now for this one, let's zoom up to this area right here. Let's get this out of the way. So we're gonna need some room and go to whole call out. Now, Depend upon what you want. When it's a counter, a counter board like this, you might want to select the very outer edge and it grabs everything inside and goes from the outside in and it even gives you the number of entities that are in there. So let's drag it over. And so that's a very nice feature. You could get full notes on all the, the whole types. There's also the datum feature. You could put datums in on edges, things like that. GD&T, or Geometric Dimension and Tolerancing, you could select this. Now this isn't 100% um, intelligent, so just be aware, I'm just dropping this information in. So for like you have a symbol library here, let's go with concentricity. Uh, you could put in tolerances, you could put in notes, and any sort of additional information that you might want. Um, and again, I'm just typing in garbage here just to show you how it works. 
And from here, I could go ahead and just drop it floating out there. I could drop it near a dimension or if I drop it on a dimension. And let's move it to, uh, let's see, let's get, let's drop it on this dimension here. Oh, it's not doing what I was expecting. It used to drop and attach to a dimension. I'm not seeing that do that. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Let's hit escape. And you can see that that dimension, the GDT is now tied to that dimension. You could control drag off a copy of it. You could delete it. You could attach a leader to it. And do whatever you want. <clears throat> and there's other options in there as well. So that pretty much concludes uh, the basics of detailing for exercise six. Now you might want to pause. I'm going to go ahead and make the drawing and we have to make the model actually for lab six and that's in the book. And so if I bring that up here, that is on page 74. And if you want to rotate it, you just download it. And then once it's up, you just click on it. And now you have the ability to rotate it. And let's get to that page there. Okay, so with this drawing, as you can see, and, and I'm probably going to botch some of the dimensions because my intention is not to show you exactly how to do this. I really would like you to do it exactly to the print if you can, or as best as you can. Watch the video in the event that you get stuck. Also, those of you who do it, you could go back and watch the video and see better ways on how it could be done, perhaps. All right, so this is an enclosure. It's shelled out 50,000 wall thickness. Um, the back side's shelled out. The front is just uh, has this little detail on the side. And we see it's two and a half, six inches high, and it has a zigzag in it. So let's begin. Start with the part file first. So you're going to build the part. Go to the front plane, start a sketch, and start off. We can start with the uh, two and a half inches right out there. It's going to go up like so. It's going to jog a little bit. It's going to go back up another two and a half inches across. Jog down. We'll get that angle. We could follow parallelism. See, I got the little symbol to the right of my pointer. It locked into parallelism. Click and connect. And now if you didn't get parallelism, this is what you could do. You could control select these two entities and select parallel if you didn't get it. Now you see I have my symbols up. I'm leaving those up right now just so you can see them. You know, I'm going to turn them off. I'm going to go to View and Hide Show and Sketch Relations. Now I'm going to add the dimensions. I'm going to make this 2.5, 2.5, and it's six inches for the height. And then the angle we have to specify, which is 45 degrees. So from here to here, put in 45. Now you'll notice that on the drawing, there are that I have that I supply in here, there's some gray dimensions. Typically, when you see gray dimension, it may or may not need to be added dependent upon how you model it. Um, that usually means that I didn't actually use that in modeling. But it is four inches thick. Let's see here the um, we have a theoretical sharp corner there of 2.75 from the top. So from here to there, 2.75. And it's not a theoretical sharp corner yet, not until I fill it in. So, and then let's take a look at that drawing again. The next one is 1.75. So right here. All right. And all we're missing is the specification on this one, which Let's see. So that height, and it should mirror the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and from here to here, 
oh, sorry, wrong side, down bottom to that point. Well, that doesn't look right. Hold on a second, let's take a look here. Okay, I missed the, the dimension here from, from here to here. That is going to be three inches. And you can drag that out. Okay, so we have the base done. Let's go to extrude, and this is four inches thick. Now, what you might want to do is instead of blind, have it go mid plane and type in four inches so it goes half on each side, two and two. Hit the green check. Now, let's take a look at the next largest feature is are these radiuses. There's a 0.5 here, here, and TYP means that it's typical. So anywhere where we see a radius and it's not called out, be 0.2, uh, 0.5. So let's put those in. So go to the fillet tool, 0.5, and select this edge here. And let's turn on full preview so we can see it. That one, this one right here, and then this one here. Now be careful not to get faces. You don't want the whole face like that. Okay, so I want that just like this. What you want. Now there's a chamfer, and the chamfer that we see here is 45 degrees by 0.2, and it wraps around. So go to the little arrow underneath fillet to find chamfer, and 0.2, and it's already set to 45 degrees. So select this edge, and make sure full preview's on. And now we have that done. Now we need to shell it. So rotate the backside, go to shell, and set it to 0.05, and select these four faces on the backside. And it should shell it out like that. Now we need to put the details in on the side here. Select this face, start a sketch. I'm gonna hit my space bar and go to the front view orientation. And we could use the parallelogram tool. So click on parallelogram, click up here, down, and across. Okay. And we're going to make this, um, let's see, that, uh, hold on a second. Let me delete that. I want to show you the right way to do this. Back to parallelogram. Click here, draw it at an angle like so, and then straighten it out. There we are. Now click on this, and there's a quick launch, make horizontal for the bottom line. And now we should be able to add the dimensions according to the print. So up here we can see the actual print. It's offset, by the way, a quarter inch from the left. So let's put that offset in first. So from this point to this edge, should be 0.25, that locates it. And let's see where the value is, how far offset it is. So it's one inch from the top. So from this edge to here, one inch. And now we could start zeroing in on the other parameters on this detail view that we see. Okay, we're 45 degrees, a quarter inch in height, and the Theoretical sharp corner, TSC, that's what that means. From this corner to this corner is one and a half. So from here to here, get that straight up. This would be 1.5. From here to here, that will be, we'll drag that in the upper right there, 45. And let's lay these out a little bit better so they're easier to see. All right, and the height from here to here should be 0.25. Now you could add the sketch fillets. The sketch fillets on this, we see are 0.06. It should have a TYP on there. So let's go to sketch fillet, 0.06, 1, 2, 3, 4 corners, hit apply. Now we're going to do a linear sketch pattern for this. So you could click and select that. Oops. Cancel the sketch fillet. Then you could click and drag that around to select that. And we're going to go to linear sketch pattern. 
and we see it's on the x-axis, but we only want one on the x-axis. We want, I believe, six on the y. Yep, six. And they're spaced 0.4 apart. We're seeing that. So right here, type in 0.4, and we have to reverse it. So right here is the reverse direction, and there we go. Um, also, dimension the Y spacing, and that should be it. Hit the green check. Now we could just cut those through. So go to Features, Extrude Cut, Through All. The part is done. Let's go ahead and save that. And save it as E6, or I'm sorry, L6 for Lab 6. L6. And now we could go to File, Make Drawing from Part. We're going to put it on A, ANSI Landscape. Hit OK. We're going to grab the front. We'll drag off a right, a top, and an isometric. Okay. We'll make a section view right here. So select this view, go to drawings, go to section view, get it right in the middle. There's the midpoint. Click, hit the green check, drag it to the right, like so. Let's get the detail view. Get it right on the middle point there. Drag this out. Drop it right there. And uh, it's a little too small. So let's drag this out even further. And let's try and mimic what I have there. This is actually a leader, A. So, um, and actually it doesn't need to be A because I did the section view first. So don't worry about the, the lettering on there. Instead, select with leader. There we go. Okay, now we could start inserting the actual dimensions. Now don't worry about the scale that it doesn't match up with the other drawing. That drawing was done in an older template that had more space. Even though it's the same size, the actual border wasn't quite as tight. But let's go now to Annotations, go to Model Items, and we'll do Selected Feature right here. Got that. And then let's see if we could select there. There we go. We got that. And I think we're in good shape. Hit the green check. Now you just have to lay these out maybe a little bit nicer than they are. They're, they're really uh, in a mess here. Now this one inch dimension really belongs over here. So remember the shift, grab and drag it into this view. And make enough space so that everything fits. And if you need to change it all, go to the gear Go to the Document Properties and Dimensions, Font, and let's set it to 0.062 for the actual font size, which is half the original. So that looks a lot better. Straighten these out and like that. Remember I said that should have TYP on it. So over here, we can put TYP period so we know that or you could put four places. I said, oh no, we want, want four places. I'll put TYP. And then uh, any other areas here, like this is the pattern. You could put the note in there. You wouldn't necessarily do that on a real drawing here. I have that here just for my students pretty much. Okay, and don't forget your name or put down lab six. Again, this is a great little portfolio piece. Uh, you could actually put the dimensions in better if you like. Um, and remember this little trick here, you could control select these, right click, tangent edge with font, and then click on this one here and shade it with edges. And you can finish off anything else that I might have missed. And that concludes exercise and lab six. Welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at SOLIDWORKS 2020 and exercise seven. Exercise seven deals with uh, 
a fan that you would see for what they call muff I should say a, a grill that would go on a muffin fan. And here you could see, uh, hopefully it's focusing in on there, it's a little grill that would go on a fan that you might see on a computer or a heat sink that would go inside of a computer. The one we're going to build is I'm just using very large sizes uh, just to make it easy to input the numbers and remember them. But this is basically our goal today is to create this. Now, when I was tasked with this back in 1997, I went out to a company that um, they actually made medical equipment and they needed one of these little grills designed. Not that they actually made these in-house. They actually ordered them from some other place, but just for their assemblies, they wanted it. And they showed it to me and I, I kind of like, Wow, really? You brought me all the way out here to uh, figure out a way to build this. And they're like, well, look closely. And so I, I looked very closely at the little foot pads here where the screws would go in, the mounting. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a wire that's bent in three different axes, multiple axes. So um, that was the tough part. The rest of it really isn't so bad. So what we're going to do with this exercise, I'm going to go through and just start off with the toughest part. We're just going to build that little segment. That's where I used to stop and I used to tell my students, okay, now I want you to build the rest of it because it really isn't that challenging. It's just revolve features and such. But I would notice that students would um, spend quite a bit of time and they would actually learn a lot too um, on how to build something like that. But I'm going to show you some best practices that I found over the years to make this ring pretty easily and with very few features. As you can see in the feature tree over here, um, there's not a whole lot to this. There's a couple mirrors, there's a couple sweeps, there's a revolve. So if we could keep the features down to a minimum, we could build it very efficiently. And this is an advanced lesson, I would say. Like I said, uh, a company that had multiple engineers who had been using SOLIDWORKS for some time needed to know how to make that. So we're going to see it. Now, other applications for this, other than just this little grill. Imagine making a, um, you know, any sort of tubing that has to be bent, like for, for example, inside of an automobile, maybe tubing for the uh, the different systems, hydraulic systems, pneumatic systems, exhaust. So, uh, so it's very good. Now, another tool that might typically be used for this uh, would be the 3D Sketch, which is under Sketch, and you see there's 3D Sketch. Now, it can be done in 3D Sketch, and I tried it. I actually found the method I'm about to show you a little bit more um, straightforward. With the 3D sketch, it was, it was it was a bit of a challenge, but there's there's ways to do it either way. But I thought this is a very nice, interesting method I'm going to show you where you could just draw a front and a right profile of that bend, and then SolidWorks will combine the two to make a 3D guide curve that you can follow. Uh, and what, once we're done, though, with this lesson, one of the labs, which isn't in the book, by the way, that we're going to cover is making like a, a, a tubular chair. And we're gonna, just going to, very basic, and we're going to use the 3D sketch tool because the 3D sketch tool is very important to know. If any of you are looking to get certified, certified SOLIDWORKS professional, for example, you're going to need to know how to use that. And so we're going to go through that. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. Now you can see with this model, you just turn off integrated preview here. But our strategy. And by the way, this is the rollback bar on the, the model tree here. I'm going to just drag this up. Um, we're going to start off with the three, developing the 3D curve from two sketches. And actually, I have perspective on, so let me turn off perspective. And let's go to front. We're going to start by drawing the front profile that you see here. And then we're going to draw the right profile. So that's going to be on the right plane. That you see there that has the bend on it. It's almost like it's the tool that you would bend the wire on to form it that we're developing with just sketches. We don't have to make a solid or a surface or anything like that. And then we're going to use the curve tool to combine those to make that 3D, 3D uh, curve that we'll use later for a sweep. And then you'll see we'll sweep that along and then we'll end up with this. And as you can see, the sketch that's contained in here is just a circle. And then it's swept along the actual guide curve that's internal. Uh, you see that in orange right there. 
Now, the next sweep we're going to do is to extend it out. Now, some students have asked, like, why, are you, why, why didn't you just do that all in one shot? We could have, but I, I like how we build it in a very small chunk that's more digestible. If you want, you could build this all in one shot, yes. Uh, but what we do is we extend that out, and then this sketch for this sweep is a little basic. It's seven inches, and then we have this 45 degree hook. And the reason for that, we're going to mirror it across. So 45 and 45 makes 90. So you end up with a elbow, 90 degrees. And it mirrored over the little wire on the other side there. Then we're going to use a revolve tool and we're going to revolve this. Now, a lot of students that I used to have do this would revolve a full 360 and then they would go ahead and they would make a pattern. Well, rather than pattern, or I should say, uh, yeah, a circular pattern. Rather than doing that, the strategy I used here, get rid of the pattern. You don't even need it. What you do is you just revolve 135 degrees on one side and 45 degrees on the other, because right here is where the sketch is going to be contained for that. Now here's the sketch with the, the multiple circles that are going to be revolved around the center right here. And so 135 and 145 makes 180 degrees. So it gives you exactly one half. And then you just mirror it across and you use one of those little flat ends of the revolve to mirror that. So that's the strategy we're going to look at today. And there's a dozen ways you could do this. Uh, this is just one method. So let's begin. Start off with a new part file. Select the front plane, start a sketch, and go to the line tool and right at the origin, drag up a vertical line about one inch, and then go over here to the center point arc tool. Hover above your line so you get the line of inference, and you're maybe about a half or three quarters of an inch above it. You don't really have to measure it. We'll put dimensions in a moment. Click, release the mouse button, and connect directly to the vertex of the line that you just drew a moment ago. Click again. Rotate it counterclockwise around and then get over to this side. And A should be about 300 to 330, around there. Again, we're just getting it close. Click and hit escape. Now, what we need to do is we need to align that center. You could do that with drawing a center line from this point to this point, or we could use a relationship. And that's what I'm going to choose to do. So I'm going to hit the F key first to zoom up so you can see this. Now, make sure you hit escape a couple times. Control, so hold down the control key, don't let it go. Select this line, and then select the center point. And over on the left, you should see coincident. Now, some people are thinking, well, shouldn't it be vertical? If we made, if we selected the end point that's, or the vertex down below, then yeah, but coincident, it looks at that line as if it's infinite, and it's just aligning itself to it. So we now have, applied that relationship so it can't sway left or right. Now we could go to Smart Dimension, click on the bottom origin, and click on the center point of the arc, drag it to the right, click. This is going to be four inches. Click on this arc here, drag it up to the upper right, one and a half inches. And now here's a little trick. And those of you who are in class, if you could remember this, I'll be really impressed. We want to go ahead and put in an angle for the opening here. And here's the trick. It's three points, and it's the only three points that are there. One, two, and then the center point. Click, and that's three. Drag it between the opening there, click to release it, and type in 15 degrees. So that's one method. Um, interesting, I had another method pop up someone knew of um, holding, uh, it's a key, I can't remember, but in, uh, last time I did this lesson and I posted it, someone had said there's another method too. There's And there's a very old way where you actually drew center lines and you could just dimension the center line. So you could do that too. And that actually, uh, for a lot of my students, they seem to find that actually easier sometimes than remembering these three points. But anyhow. Now that we have that, we, have, we need to put a bend in here, at this corner. So go to the sketch, fill it. And the entities to fill it 
uh, first of all, let's set this to one inch and select this corner right here and hit the green check. And there's the bend. All right, that's done. Hit rebuild or exit sketch. Either one is fine. Gets you out of it. Should turn gray. The dimensions disappear if you click on the screen and you're in good shape. Now we need to create a separate sketch that's perpendicular on the right plane for the bend that's going to take place. So let's select the right plane, start a sketch. You're going to have to hit the space bar or use your fast keys like a control four to go to the right view orientation. Now take your line tool, get down at the bottom, click when you get the origin, the little orange circle it, drag this up about an inch and a quarter, almost an inch and a half. Make sure it's vertical. Click, drag off to the right a one inch line at like around a 45 degree angle or so. Click, now drag a line straight up and try and match the line to the left of it so it's about the same height. Click, and then hit escape. Let's go to smart dimension. Dimension this line right here. Click over here and that's gonna be three. Now what we're gonna do is that's eventually going to have a bend in it. And we might want to dimension this on a print. So it's a good idea to say, like, eventually this is going to be a theoretical sharp corner once the bend or the, the fillet is put in. And so that dimension, you want someone to be able to understand what it is. So over here on the left, where we have dim text or dimension text, click underneath there, hit enter, and T, S, C. So theoretical sharp corner, and that's a preemptive. So click on that. All right, now let's go ahead and go uh, make sure smart dimension is on. Click on this angled line, and then click on this vertical line on the left and get in between. That's gonna be 130 degrees. Now click on this line here and drag it straight up. Now it's weird, the dimension doesn't center it on this one, so that's okay. And I know I've been touting, like, make sure your dimension center. Once you put it in, it will. So go ahead and click right about there. That needs to be one inch. You could drag that up like so. All right, there's one more dimension, and this one's the toughest one. The trick is click on this corner down below here, and now hit your left arrow key on your keyboard just one time, and you'll see, now you're seeing the actual front view sketch. And you're just dimensioning to the center point of that. So click on that, drag it over here, center it, click, type in two. And then over here again, hit enter T S C. Now, not all companies require you to do that. Where I came from, we used to have to do that just so someone would know. There's other methods too. Um, I don't I don't think that's an ANSI standard by any stretch of the imagination, but where I used to work, they used to want us to do it that way. So if you, you're not required to do it, don't worry about it. But anyhow, all right, now we have those, we have our bent wire. Now we need to put the radiuses or fillets in it. So go to sketch fillet and it should keep it at one inch. You could go ahead and select this one right here and this corner here and hit the green check. Now you'll notice since they were done at same time, there's only one, and, and you should note that on the drawing so that someone knows that both are one inch. And so over, uh, hit the green check mark on there. Now click on, not on the actual number, but click on the extension line of the radius. And over to the left here, hit the little arrow to the right. Now, the ANSI standard, you, know, you could put two X or X two for times two. Um, again, I like putting in two PLCS period for places um, where I used to work. We used to do it that way, but that is not an ANSI standard. Use the standard that your company is familiar with. Now that we have that done, go ahead and hit rebuild or exit sketch. Either one's fine. And if you rotate this around, you can see both sketches on, laying on top of each other. Now we could use, go to uh, insert up at the top, go to curve. Now, by the way, if you don't see insert, it's just because you uh, you don't have this tacked in. You have to hit this little arrow here and then insert and curve. But I'm going to tack mine in. I'd like to have that insert, curve, projecting. 
Now, notice you have sketch on the face or sketch on the sketch. That's one of the really neat things SolidWorks has is you don't need to, in some systems, you actually have to extrude the surface or some sort of model and then project it on top. SolidWorks cuts out that middleman. One shot, sketch on sketch. Go ahead and select geometry from both. So you can select this circle here and then maybe this line here just as long as it's one or the other, or you could select it from the, the feature tree over here, you'd be able to go in and actually select both sketches. Hit the green check. Now click somewhere and you'll see the guide curve now. All right. We're gonna now draw a circle that's gonna sweep along there to make this. So let's select the top plane, start a sketch, Go to the circle tool and you might have to rotate this so that you could see clearly the origin. If you're looking at it from a side view, it might be very difficult to lock it in. So rotate or just go to the top view orientation. Once I get this orange dot, I'm going to click and drag this out. I'm going to go to smart dimension and it's 0.5. Now you're probably thinking, wow, 0.5, that's pretty big. It is. This is a big grill compared to what this is. I just want to I didn't want to go and measure all this, so I just went ahead and I just scaled it very large with simple dimensions that are easy to remember, so I don't always have to look at the training guide. Which reminds me, uh, if you're trying to find where this is at or the training guide, remember you could just go to V E R T A N as an answer U X one. Make sure you've, you remember the one on there. Dot com and hit enter. And then you should be able to go to the instructional manuals, SolidWorks Basics, and it's like on page 80 or something. So anyhow. All right. So with that being said, now we could go to Features, Sweat Boss Base, select the circle, and then select the blue guide curve. And you'll see it sweep along, giving you a preview. Hit the green check. Now, for some reason, it, the center still stays on. So click on that and click on the little eyeball to hide it. Now, if you accidentally selected the solid model and hit it, you have to go over here, click, and then click on the eyeball to unhide it. All right, let's go ahead and select the front plane, start a sketch. The hard part is done. Let's go to the front view orientation. Go to the line tool, click on here, drag this straight down. Uh, it's about seven inches. Now, here's a little trick I'm going to show you. You notice with the line chain, you could continue on, but we need a tangent arc that's going to hook only about 45 degrees down, and it's going to be about one inch for the radius. Uh, actually, a half inch for the radius. So. Here's a little trick. Rather than going all the way up to the top and finding the tangent arc tool, this is kind of neat. And if I were to hire someone and if I saw them do this, I would be applauding because this is one of those little shortcuts. Might not seem like a lot, but it shows the level of knowledge that a person has of the software. Technical expertise is what employers are looking for. Now, Hover over that point just for a second. Now, and I didn't click, just drag it down and to the left. And you should get tangent arc. It automatically started that for you. So there's a lot of little tricks like that built into the software. Um, I'm not going to show you every single one of them. There's so many of them, but that's just one little example. Now, A should be uh, equal to about 45 ish. And then the radius, I just get it close to one. That's fine and click and make sure it hooks to the left a little bit. Hit escape. Now let's go to smart dimension. Dimension that at one inch. And then remember the three point challenge. Click one, two, and on the center. Drag that to the lower right here. That's gonna be 45 degrees. And finally click on this line and make that seven. All right, up until a few years ago, SolidWorks forced you to use a tool called convert entities up here. It didn't force us, it was just there weren't the options and enhancements that there are now. I still like to show it because I don't use it as much because 
they've done things like what you're about to see here. But convert entities is kind of like offset entities, but it's at a zero offset. So it allows you to select edges and entities, project them onto any surface, and you could use those and they're tied back to where you selected the original projection to come from. So it's a very good tool to, to know about. And so I'm kind of sad that I can't show it to you right here. I could show it. We could select it and select that edge of the circle and it would project it. And we would be able to sweep it. In earlier versions, those of you who might have a version that goes back a couple of years, you still have to do it that way. So go back and watch one of my videos from the past for exercise uh, seven here. However, a couple of years ago, SolidWorks always updating things, which is awesome. It's really great that they do. Um, so it eliminated the need for this. So watch this. Let's go now to features, sweat boss base. And the first thing it's looking for, look at that, the little picture is the profile. So it's actually a circle. Go ahead and select that edge and we could reuse it. Now, the next thing it's looking for is the path. Select the seven inch line and you'll see it sweep along. So just up until a couple years ago, you would have had to actually start a sketch on the end face of that circle, select the edge or the face of that circle and hit convert entities, which would have made a black circle that you could then sweep along the path. So here's just a great example of every release SolidWorks continues and all CAD systems always update too, just like that. But um, it's a very nice tool that they've enhanced on there. Hit the green check. All right, now we could go ahead and just mirror this across. So go to the mirror tool up here and the face to mirror across will just be that little end face right there. Now make sure over here, this is very important, very important going to repeat. You don't want features or faces. You could do it, but remember there's a couple features here. The easiest one would be to use bodies to mirror. And we're going to use bodies to mirror later as well, rather than selecting individual features. Saves time. So bodies to mirror. Select anywhere on the body. And it's basically going to mirror everything across. Now here you can see the preview. It just gives you the topology. So it's not actually giving you the, the edges, but trust it. It's, it's working. Hit the green check. And there we go. We have our 90 degree elbow. Let's move along here. Select the right plane, start a sketch, hit your space bar, go to the right view orientation. And the first thing I want you to do is get out your center line tool. Select center line, zoom up down here and infer to this edge. Now it's interesting. The first time I did this earlier today when I was practicing, uh, this didn't highlight the center point like this, this easily. So sometimes it's difficult. But what I did find is I just moved to the center and it found the center automatically. So somewhere, sometimes things, maybe the graphics, who knows, uh, could have had an effect on that. So if, as long as you could see that center cross with the circle around it, you're in good shape. Click and drag that to the left about an inch and a half and then hit escape. You've just now located what will be the center the center right here. Okay. And it's the intersection. It's the theoretical sharp corner. And then once we get to revolve around that mirrored across, we're done. Okay. Now take the circle tool and right in here, draw a little tiny circle, just like that and hit escape. Now you could go and dimension that at a half inch, but the rest of the wire, the wire is consistent throughout this. It's basically the same wire. There's no size difference. So what I would recommend doing is tying the wire for the rings to this, the wire that we used for the um, elbow. Here's how. Make sure you hit escape a couple times. Select this circle down here when you see the orange circle appear. Release it. Now hold control and select the circle you just drew. Go over to the left here and make them equal. Now, if the design ever changes to change the wire, all the updates. So from here, we're going to go ahead and now dimension. So go to smart dimension, select this, uh, select the circle and then select this edge, drag this off to the right, click to drop it. And we want to make that 0.245. Now you might think, well, it's a half inch diameter. Why are you making it a little shorter? The reason is this now, 
if you want this to be a true assembly and you would just have the welds that occur in between here, however it's welded on there, that's fine. You could make these all separate. When you revolve them, it will actually not merge the bodies. Um, and that's fine. I like to kind of merge them a little bit, so I'm dipping it in about five thousandths of an inch of an intersection. And if you zoom up, sure enough, you can see that little intersection. This will negate having multiple bodies. It will actually make everything one body, which might be good for 3D printing. Not that you're going to 3D print this necessarily, but in other applications, if you want them all to be merged, it works really well, um, even though 3D printing would typically at that Coincident will glue them together automatically. But anyhow, let's move through this. Now let's go ahead and select the center point of that circle again and select your center line. Drag this down here below the center line. You could drag it up, either one is fine. Click to drop it. And let's make that 2.5. And that's the diameter. So if you want, you can put the diameter symbol in. So we know that the center, if we were to measure the center of the concentric ring, it's two and a half inches. And then every single ring is going to be offset two and a half inches from each one. So now you can hit escape, click on this circle, and now we're going to use linear sketch pattern. Now be aware, the X axis, we should set that to one instance only. Go down to direction two, which is the Y axis, and increase that to four. And now set the spacing to 2.5. If you zoom out, you can see it goes all the way up to the top almost there. Now, one last thing, dimension Y spacing, just so it locks it in. If you don't dimension Y spacing, then it, it could adjust or you could put in a dimension later on. But dimension Y spacing, great tool. Hit the green check. Now, let's go ahead and hit escape. Select that two and a half, that's a center line that you drew because we're going to spin around it, go to Features, and Revolve Boss Base. Now remember, the first one is going to be 135, and then you're going to have to hit this checkbox, Direction 2, and that's going to be 45, and hit Enter. Now, it may be coming out reversed, like here I'll show you. If you flip this little arrow, it might look like that. Uh, most likely you're getting what I'm getting, which is this right here, full 180 degrees of the concentric ring. And that's what we want. Make sure you got that. Hit the green check. And now we just go to mirror. The faces to mirror, you just select one of these little end faces. It doesn't matter whichever one. And then go to bodies to mirror again. Select anywhere on the surface. Hit the green check. And you're done. Okay, so that finishes the exercise. Now we're going to take a look at the 3D. Sketcher. And the 3D Sketcher is a very nice tool. It's great for making tubing, wiring, um, an exhaust system, I suppose. And it's a little different, actually, a lot different than the strategy that we saw with this. So let's now go to File, New. And oh, by the way, feel free to save this first. Go to Save, save it as E7 for your portfolio. Now go to File, New, and you uh, for this one, I don't have this in the actual training guide. This is something I've added, and I haven't added a chapter yet for it. But this is going to be one of the labs. So let's go to Part, hit OK. And what we do instead of the step starting to sketch on a plane, we actually hit the little arrow under here, and we go to 3D Sketch. Now take your line tool. Notice that some of the geometry is not available in the 3D Sketch. Over the years, they've added a couple new ones here and there, uh, and they've enhanced it. They're always working on it, so it's uh, quite a good tool. Let's move our pointer to the origin. Click. Now we could drag straight down. Now let's say we're making the back of the chair first, or at least one side, and then we're going to bring it forward, down, around. So I'm going to bring this down two inches. This is going to be a small chair. So two, uh, approximately two inches right there. Click. Now I want to have it come forward because what we just drew is the side profile of the back of the chair. Now we need to have it go out for the seat. So here's the trick. And if you could remember this, 3D Sketcher is pretty easy. The tab key, just hit one time and it will flip it so it's now in the YZ. It's actually going in the Z direction. 
So uh, bring that up about two inches. Again, get it as close as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. Click. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to go straight down. I don't need to actually hit the tab key just yet because I still am able to go straight down two inches. And all these lines, by the way, will be two inches. Click. Now drag it across to the right. And again, we see we have to hit the tab key. So that will then change it to ZX. So it could go across to the right and make sure that's about two inches. Click. Now we want to drag it up. So hit the tab key again, two inches, click. And we want to drag it back, hit the tab key again, two inches. And those follow the lines of inference for horizontal vertical. Click. Now we want to drag it up and we're able to drag it up. So we don't really need to uh, do much there. Two inches, click. And now you don't have to hit the tab key if you're going to tag the origin again. It will actually go across by default. So click and hit escape. And I could have actually drawn the underside too, but I think you all will get the idea here. All right, now that we have this drawn out like such, now we could go ahead and put some um, fillets on here. So go to sketch fillet and let's set them to. 0.25 and select the corners. Oops. Hit the green check. If you rotate it, you could go, by the way, and, and go to Smart Dimension and dimension these things. And put in exact. Um, you could spend the time if you want to make it look really nice. Like I said, I don't have a written lesson down for this, so uh, it's up to you how you want to proceed with that. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're, we want to sweep along one of those entities. So since we no longer have a plane that's easily accessible, I'm going to show you a new way to create a plane. We're going to select the right plane. And you see the right plane is right there on the side. And we're going to select holding control of point. And now we could go over here to features, reference geometry. Oh, you know what? Um, actually, let's hit rebuild first. We want to exit that sketch. Sorry, hit rebuild. Now you could go to reference geometry plane. And what we're going to do, if you hit the little arrow here next to the part, select the right plane and then select that point. And what it will do, it will offset a plane per parallel to that point. So that's another method. That's three methods we've seen so far since we started this class. Last week we learned about on a curve, perpendicular to a curve, and the week before that we just learned about offset at a specific value. Now we can actually see another method here. Hit the green check. Now that you have that, click on that and start a sketch. Go to your circle tool and at that origin, click and drag out a small circle. Yep, mine snap. That's good. And let's dimension the diameter of that circle to, we'll just make it 0.125. You don't want to make it too big because the fillets are only a quarter inch. You make it too big, they'll intersect. All right, now we could go to Features, Sweat Boss Base. And by the way, if it's supposed to be hollow, you could draw another smaller circle, like maybe 0.1 or something like that on the inside, and it will sweep and make it hollowed out. All right, select the circle and select the guide. Hit the green check. And we could click on this plane to hide it. And now that's how you use the 3D sketch tool. And so if anyone could tell me what the key on the keyboard is to flip the axes, I'll give you a second. Think about it. One, two, three. The tab key. Just remember the tab key and you'll be in good shape. It's a pretty easy tool. All right, so moving along here, uh, as far as the training guide goes, the lab for today is this smoke detector. So I'm going to rotate this counterclockwise. I downloaded it already, so remember. If you download it, once it's downloaded, you click on it, you could open it, you could use the rotate tool. When you're inside Chrome, I haven't found a rotate tool yet. 
that's accessible without downloading it first. Okay, so here we have what's the smoke detector. We see a diameter. It's actually a thickness of 0.25 with a 0.1 thickness of that. Um, we do have, let's see here, uh, two and a half inches for the diameter of the actual unit. Or we got a chamfer on here. There's some little details for that. Okay, uh, and the chamfer is 0.1 by 45 degrees. So go to New, Part, and hit OK. And remember, this is where you might want to pause because I recommend you draw these on your own. These aren't terribly hard, but they're good. Just like doing puzzles all the time, you're going to very, get very good at them. So um, if you want to be a very strong modeler, try them on your own. And then if you get stuck, use the actual labs. Be aware I might not use all of the dimensions that are shown on there because I'm going through it very, very quickly. Also, those little mistakes and dimensions that I, I plug in whatever comes to mind, I could gauge when I grade your labs um, if you're relying too heavily on the actual videos versus trying to do them on your own. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and select the top plane, start a sketch and draw out the diameter of two and a half inches. I'm going to Features, Extrude Boss Base, 0.25. We'll go ahead and put the chamfer on immediately. So underneath Fillet, go to Chamfer, and the chamfer was 0.1 by 45 degrees. Select that edge, hit the green check. Now we're going to go ahead and select this face, start a sketch, and I'm going to go to the, the top view. And let's take a look at that drawing here. And we can see this is centered and the diameter is 0.75. So let's go ahead and get that aligned. Draw that out, dimension it at 0.75. And now you could draw a center line from here to here to lock it down, or hold control and select both centers and make them vertical so, well, so the lines. And now we need to put a dimension in. And that's uh, 0.625 to centers. So smart dimension from here to here, 0.625. And be aware every once in a while I do, uh, on the drawings, I'm not perfect. There might not be a dimension or there might be a dimension missing. And in the old days, as I call it, when I first learned, I learned how to do things on the drafting board, believe it or not, um, computers were just coming out. And so essentially you would actually take a, a scale and they call, a, you might have heard the term scale or ruler. They call it a scale for a reason because you can actually scale sizes. So whenever you see a drawing, you'd be able to calculate the scale, like, oh, that's four times that or whatever to get the actual amount. So you could go in and actually look at those dimensions and try to measure them with a ruler or scale and figure out what they are. So, and that's fine with me. There are a few that I, uh, I know I've had people relay back to me, oh, you're missing this dimension. I'm like, well, just, put in what you think fits best. And that's very common. You, I've almost never seen a perfect drawing. So just be aware when you're working with drawings, there's so many little details that can be missed. So, um, and anyhow, so let's go and extrude this, go to features, extrude boss base. And from here, let's see what we're supposed to make that. It's a 0.1 for the height. And now I'm going to go ahead and add a fillet. Let's see what that fillet is called on on there. Uh, let's see. Oh, 0 0.09. Select that edge. Get the green check. Then there's a couple patterns on here we want to chisel out, but some of those we will handle after it's been shelled. So I think we're ready to shell, actually. Let's see here. OK, 
Okay, yeah, we're ready to shell it. So flip it around, select the back face. Oh, it's not a bad idea to look for the typical wall. Well, the typical wall is 50 thousandths. All right, and so we go to shell. So 0 0.05, hit the green check. There it is. Now there is a little lip here, so select this face, start a sketch. Now you could draw the diameter, but I actually have an offset on there for a reason because I want to show you how to use the offset entities tool. So go to offset entities and the offset I believe is 0.02 and then it gets reversed. Let's just verify that with the drawing. You can see that over here. So the, oh, it's actually 30 thousandths. 0.03. Hit the green check and that depth It was 50.05, uh, so right there. So go to Features, Extruded Cut, 0 0.05. Hit the green check. All right, so we have that little lip there now. There's also a, a hole in the center here. Select this face, start a sketch. You could draw the through hole in. That's an easy one. And the dimension for that. Now you can see if you have dual screens, how nice it is. If you, you're able to put this on the second screen versus always having to go over it. Okay, that's a, a 0.125. And through all. So features, extrude cut, through all. Let's um, put in those features. Now select this face, start a sketch. Go to top there and let's look at the details that we have. All right, we have the cutout starting over here on the right. That's because it's dimensioned here. Not that you couldn't start somewhere else, but we're looking at a 0 0.05 centered. See 0 0.025 indicating the center of it. So 0 0.05 by 0 0.1, which if it's a square, it would be tangent to the outside edge. So here's how to make that. Let's, let's go ahead and put a center line in there. Not that you have to do this step. Now go to the, we'll use the center rectangle. Right about there. And let's bring it out a little bit like that. We'll dimension this. This is supposed to be 0.1. And this is supposed to be 0 0.05. And what I was talking about, where it says tangent, hit escape, select this line, and tangent to this arc right here. Oops. There. Oh. Got to get that orange edge and tangent. Now, um, here's something to call out. You'll see sometimes radiuses uh, uh, on the models look faceted, kind of like a diamond. And that's just graphical. Um, that's the graphics card that you could adjust. Actually, not, not really the graphics card. It's just the graphics inside SolidWorks. Where you could set that up, if you go to the gear here, and if you go to performance, let's see, there it is. And right down here is image quality. Click on that. Now, here's the resolution. And look at this. You could drag. Now, if you drag it really low, it's faceted. Now, remember, if you have an assembly with thousands of parts and you want to rotate it, like if you're doing a demonstration, it's a very large assembly, set it low. You'll be able to rotate it much quicker uh, because it's removing the polygons. And graphics cards are measured in how many polygons per second they can handle. You, we're talking millions of polygons per second now, whereas before it used to be like a million with uh, old graphics cards from the 90s. So... Um, you can drag this all the way to the right there. And then this is wireframe, which we're not interested in right now. But if you get it in the red, it's just warning you like, hey, it might slow down your system a little bit, especially if you're doing it on a tablet, PC or something like that. Anyway, let's go ahead and hit OK. Watch how the resolution here, I'll move this out of the way so you can see it. The resolution hopefully will sharpen a little bit. Hit OK. And there, it's not perfect. You can still see some facets, but we're zoomed up on a very small part. Okay, so we've made that tangent, and now go to Features, Extrude Cut, and this cut only goes up to a surface, and it's this surface right here. Hit the green check. 
and it gives us that interesting little feature. So select the side face. Now we're going to pattern it. Go to circular pattern. And now for the direction, you can select this inner ring here. And let's see how many we need. One, two, three, four, eight. So just reduce this to eight. Hit the green check. And there it is. All right, now we need to make those cutouts. Now this is actually really easy, but a lot of students think it's, it's harder than it has to be. Select this face, start a sketch. We'll go to the top there. Now take the, we could do a center rectangle. And I believe the first one aligns. And you can have it stick out a little bit like that. That's fine. And let's see what we have to do on the drawing here. So that first one's centered, which is good. We already have that. It's a 0.2 in width. And I do give you a 0.95 for a distance, which you could use if you want. Oh, and then it's offset 0.25 from there. So let's put those dimensions in. So from here to here, oops. Point two five, and then this point two. We'll actually just make this one inch. I have like point nine five. It's unnecessary, actually. You'll see what it's going to do in a moment. And we could use the center line like we did before to lock in this to ensure that it's horizontal. So make sure that's horizontal. There we go, and it turns black, so it's fully defined. We could have control selected those two points as well. It's up to you. All right, now we just go to features, extrude cut. And we'll cut that first one in there. So let's look at the depth. The depth of that cut. Oh, I actually have it here in parentheses, 0 0.06 DP. DP means depth. Now notice it makes that radius automatically, and that's where students are challenged. They don't realize it's automatic as long as you just extend it out. Now we just need to pattern that. So we select the feature, and these are spread out 0.15 by 45. Let's see, is that 0.15? Oh, actually 0.2. I have it too wide. So my mistake. So this is 0.15. All right, now we could select that, rebuild it actually just to be on the same side. And we could go to linear pattern. And for the linear pattern, the direction, select this edge because it's a straight edge. And increase that to 0.2. And then increase the number to 4. Now look at this, see that little feature, it's extending out. Again, students have a tendency to panic a little bit there, but watch what it does. It actually creates that interesting feature, which looks like it was a lot harder than it really was to create. Okay, now for the text. Select this face here, start a sketch, go to the top. You could use a center line here. for the text. And what did I put down there? I have a Castello. You can put whatever you want. I go to the text tool, select the line. SolidWorks. And I'm going to go ahead and change that font and go with something maybe a little smaller, maybe 0.1. And then I'm going to go with, I'll try Comic Sans. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and hit the green check, features, extrude boss. I'm going to make this uh, 0.03 for the height. All right now I'm going to do a little trick here, start a sketch. Not much of a trick. And we'll look at the ellipse tool. Click on ellipse and kind of center this around here. Click, drag out, and see it makes that ellipse. Now let's go ahead and get that center again follow it a little bit wider and then thinner on this end here. So make something that looks like that. 
and go to features and extrude boss base and instead of 0.03 we'll have just go 0.02 so it goes a little bit below it to give it kind of an interesting looking logo there or link whatever it not doesn't look that great and you can just have fun with that put whatever you want put your name on it and i believe that finishes that off yeah it looks like we got everything and that concludes exercise and lab seven welcome back today we're going to take a look at exercise eight which is making this uh, boat hull and uh, it's going to we're going to talk about sweeps inside SOLIDWORKS 2020. So let's begin. First of all, you can see this uh, boat that I threw together. It's not dimensionally correct. It's just uh, a visual. I'm going to turn off the uh, preview here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and design this boat hull. And then you get to design what's on top. I'll actually show you some of the, the pointers on how to create something like this. Again, this is... Uh, there's not a lot of detail in here. This is just kind of a, an aesthetic piece. So let's begin. Start with the new part file. Go ahead and select the front plane. And actually, um, I'm just going to go to View, Hide Show. And most of you probably have your planes turned on already. You just don't realize it. So you don't. you probably don't have to go through this step that I'm about to. I turned off my planes so I couldn't see them. But now I'm going to go to Hide Show, and I'm going to go ahead and find the planes. And actually, they are turned on. Never mind. Uh, what you could do here is you could click on the front plane and hit the eyeball, which is to show it. Now, we're going to create this boat via um, a series of lofts. Or, or, I'm sorry. This is going to be a loft, not a sweep. Um, and this is a series of sections that we're going to be creating. And you can see my feature tree here. Let's take a look at the loft here. So we're going to start off with this backside and actually turn off perspective. We're going to create that backside with these dimensions. And then we're going to copy it and enlarge it as it goes through onto a new plane. And that plane is going to be offset a specific distance. And then Another one will offset, as you can see here, about eight inches. And then finally, for the tip, we come off one inch and we put a little uh, point on it. And then we could actually loft between those sections and then mirror it over to make the boat hull. So let's begin. Okay, so I'm going to go, I selected the front plane and I'm showing it. Now, here's a cool little trick for offsetting. If you hold the control key down, get the tip of your pointer on the edge of the front plane, hold your mouse button down and drag it to the lower left here, and you'll see it will begin to offset. Go ahead and set this to six inches and hit the green check. Now zoom out with your wheel or hit the F key and grab plane one now. Now, not the front plane. Be very careful. Don't select the front plane. You're grabbing plane one that's right here. Look carefully at what I'm about to select. Hold control. Drag this forward. Now, yours may not behave as quickly as mine. I, I have a pretty powerful processor here. I know that when I've worked on my laptop, which has been on the weaker side, this takes a little bit longer for it to catch up. And this one's going to be eight inches. Hit the green check, zoom out, or hit the F key again. And this time, plane two, you want to get the tip of your pointer over the corner, or not the corner, but the edge of it. Stay away from the corners and the points. Uh, now I'm going to hold control, drag that forward, and this only goes forward an inch. And hit the green check. So now we have these three, three new planes, including the front plane that we have on here. We're going to start by drawing the back side first. So select the front plane start a sketch, take your line tool and draw, inferring to the origin on the left hand side, draw a line to connect it and then line down. Now you might be wondering like why didn't I just draw from the origin down? Then what happens is that you have a line chain. I would have to exit out of the line chain to draw the next line. So that's why I inferred to the left and drew down from there. 
Okay, we're going to go ahead and add some dimensions here. And if you're wondering where these dimensions are located, they're actually in the training guide, which I want to bring over here so you can see this. It's on the vertanu1.com webpage. So if you want to find this, you could actually just go to uh, V is in Victor, E, R, T is in Tom, A, N is in Nancy, U, X, and make sure you click on the one, or else it'll bring you to a different page. Rotani1.com, and hit enter. And then here you can see the web page, and the instructional manuals, and the SOLIDWORKS basics. And you should be able to get to, I think it's page 80 or something like that. Let's see here. Okay, page 83. You can see the offsets here. These are the dimensions for plane one, six inches, plane two, eight, plane three, one. And what we're looking at here now is the actual dimensions. So we two by five. So this one right here, I'm not two by five. Um, my apologies, the coffee's wearing off again. 2.5 by two. So this one's 2.5, 2 and then this one's 2. All right, now we're going to use the spline tool. Now, we've talked about the spline tool before. There's the style spline or the ordinary spline that's at the top. We're going to use the, the ordinary one, the spline. Click over here. Make sure you get the orange dot. Now, drag down at about a 45-degree angle, approximately and get about two thirds of the way to the other side, like just about where I am. Click, drag another uh, point over here about um, getting closer, click, and finally click on that vertex at the bottom, click. And you could hit escape on your keyboard. Let's put the other dimensions in. So this point here to this top line, that will be, let's see, 1.25. Okay. And the next one will be 1.5. So click on this point to this line here and make that 1.5. Now lay these out, spread them out so they're easy to read and stack them in order, just like I have there. 1.25, 1.5, two inches. Now these ones. Click on this vertical line here, click on the point closest to it, drag it down, click. That one's going to be 0.5. And then click on this vertical line here to that point, drag it down here, and we're looking at 1.5. And lay these out so that they're easy to read and that they're not overlapping because we're going to copy this and reuse it two more times. And if they're out of order, you might mess up your model. All right, so hit rebuild or exit sketch. Either one's fine. Hit your space bar and go to isometric, which is control seven. Now we want to get that sketch onto plane one. So here's my suggestion. Don't select it from the view screen or else it'll just take segments of it. Won't, won't take necessarily dimensions. Click on the actual sketch from the feature tray on the left here, just like you see what I'm doing here. Now one click, and now release it, and Control C is copy. Select plane one. Okay, look carefully at the plane I'm clicking before you do this. And now to paste it, hold Control and hit V as in victory. And it should have pasted that sketch there. Now on that sketch, and I've seen this happen before, normally you could, ed we want to edit that, make it larger, changing those dimensions. However, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. You could try double clicking on this curve. And mine seems to work just fine. It, it goes into edit mode, sketch edit mode. But if yours doesn't work, just right click on sketch two over here in the feature tree 
and there should be an edit sketch option. I'll actually rebuild to show this to you. So you can right click on sketch two and there's edit sketch. So either way is fine. If the double click doesn't work, don't worry about it. It might just be, it could be the mouse. It could be a number of things. Let's hit the space bar and go to the front view orientation. Grab this upper right corner of your model with your mouse button, drag it down and you'll see it, it's floating. We have to drag it back to the origin. That's the one constraint it doesn't bring over when it projects it onto another sketch plane. So drag it over, make sure you get the blue dot release and it should turn black. And remember black is good. We want it to be fully defined. If it's still blue, drag it away and try it again. If it's still blue after that, you could hold control, select the point that, that we were trying to drag, release it, and then select the origin. And on the left hand side, you see coincident or merge points. It most likely coincident should come up and you can select that as an alternative. Now let's go to drawing here and we need to at this point change these dimensions so as we're looking here the two inch is going to be 2.375 so over here double click make that 2.375 and I'm going to drag this over because I have dual screens and I think you get the idea that you want to be able to alter those all right, so we're at 2.375. Next one, the 1 1.5 over here, double click, is going to be 1.75. And the 1 1.25 is going to be 1.375. So as you can see, it's getting larger. See the gray profile there? That's the sketch that's on the front plane, which is the rear of the boat. Now, this next one, and it's when you're expanding, go with the largest dimensions first and you work, work your way down to changing the small ones last. So for this one, it's gonna be uh, the 2.5, double click, that's gonna be three. The 1.5 is going to be two, and the 0.5 is gonna change to 0.75. And you can see it's considerably bigger than the last one. You could go ahead and hit rebuild or exit sketch. Go back to isometric spacebar if you like. Now let's go ahead and click on plane two, and control V's and Victor. Otherwise, remember, you can use edit and paste as well. And it should still have the first sketch in your memory buffer so that you can get it on the proper plane. Now, this happens quite often where students select the wrong plane to drop it in on. Here's a little trick how to flip plane. Let's say I accidentally dropped it on plane three here. I'm gonna hit undo. Let's say I dropped it on plane three. I hit plane three, control V's and Victor. And it's like, oh, darn it, that's not supposed to be there. Here's what you can do. You could right click on the sketch in the feature tree. And there's edit sketch plane. Now select the plane you want it to go to, which was plane two. Hit the green check and it should have moved it over. OK, let's go ahead and double click on that or edit it. If you want, you could right click on it. You could go to edit sketch. That's another method. Hit the space bar, go back to the front view orientation, drag that upper right corner away from the origin, and then bring it back. Make sure you get the blue dot, drop it in. Should turn black again. Now this time we're squeezing it down to something smaller. So start with the small dimensions and work your way out to the large dimensions. So for example, right here we have, uh, we'll start down here, the 0.5. This 0.5, needs to be 0.2. So double click on that, make it 0.2. The 1.5 at the bottom is gonna to need to be just 0.5. And I'm just double clicking on these by the way. And the 2.5 is gonna be 0.675. Now these dimensions, notice they got tangled up. Before you start double clicking on them, lay them out in order. 1.25, 1.5, and 2. Start with the smallest. 1.25, that will be 0.2. The 1.5 vertical will be 0.375. And the 0.2, I should say the 2.0 will be 0.6. And if you like, you could lay these out a little bit better if they're 
being thrown about. Okay, hit rebuild. Go back to isometric, which is control seven. And now for plane three, we're gonna just put a point on it. So click on plane three, start a sketch. You don't have to go normal two for this because it's just a point. And the point tool, we've never used it before in this class, is right here if you look in the screen. Locate it right on the origin that's inside plane three. When you get the orange dot, click just once, hit escape, and you could go ahead and hit rebuild. Now we're ready to loft. Go to features, lofted boss base, and let's start from the rear and work our way forward. Now, it does matter where you click. So like, let's say we clicked in the upper left quadrant of this shape. See where I'm clicking? Okay. Now, just for the heck of it, so you can see what could go wrong if you don't locate the same region or quadrant, this is what happens. Let's say I go to the right quadrant now, and you see it twists. Easy to fix though. You just grab this green dot, drag it over to the left, and it will straighten it out. Okay, let's get this one. Click, and then click on the point. Now, don't panic if it disappears. What happens is that SOLIDWORKS has what they call a weight applied to the surfaces. And we just have to turn that off because right now it's adjusted to what they call one point of weight. So click on the start end constraints here. Now the start constraint is on the far back side. The, the uh, end constraint is on the front. So if you click on a set of default, go to none, all of a sudden your preview should appear. Now you might notice though, because of that weight that's on here, we have a bow that's occurring underneath there. We might not want that. Maybe we don't want any uh, weight on it. So instead of default, go to none and watch how it smooths out. Okay, hit the green check. Now we could go ahead and mirror this across. We want to mirror it across the side face. So go ahead and select that, go to the mirror tool. And you want, it really doesn't matter, features or bodies mirror because there's only one feature. So you could get away with just feature. You could just click on this face here, hit the green check mark and you have your bolt hull completed. Now, I have a cigarette boat that you saw that I modeled up earlier, and I'd just like to show you uh, and get you started on if you wanted to create that boat. Now, if you look at previous videos that I've made, I've made all sorts of different boats. So if you want ideas for like a sailboat, I show you a very primitive sailboat on, um, if you go back to, I believe, exer this exercise eight, on YouTube, type in E8 and like maybe um, 2018 or 2019 or even 2016, depends on how far it goes back. Some some years I skip doing it. So um, like if you go to 2016, I believe you'll see a sailboat. And again, it's not a great sailboat, but uh, it's just a very basic one, shows you how to do it. This time around, I'm gonna do a cigarette boat. Now with the cigarette boat, um, if we take a look at the planes and their offset, the offset is a bit different. It's eight inches for the first one, eight, eight, and then one. So it's just lengthened a little bit to give it more of that uh, long, elongated feature. So let's go back here. To change that, since the planes are available, just double click on this plane one. The dimension should appear right there, six inches. Double click, change it to eight, and hit this little rebuild button, and you could extend it. There we go. And I think that will work for us. That's what I used on the last one. Now, select this face and start a sketch, and we're gonna put a little raised surface for the uh, top of the boat. Now, you could go to offset entities, because we'll want it inward. And like point one works really well for just a light offset, if that's what you'd like, and again, you have the freedom to do whatever you like in this one. This is, I'm just showing you some different aspects. Hit the green check. I go to features and extrude this up just a little bit, like a 0.1. And you can see it's raised, but let's put a little bit of a taper on it. So go to the taper, actually a lot of taper. 
and we could go ahead and put in like 25 degrees Get the green check. Now let's um, go ahead and select this face here. Start a sketch. We go to the top view orientation. Since it's symmetric, I would recommend drawing a center line right at the origin. And I'm going to go over here to the three point arc. And I want to make that cockpit dart out a little bit. So I'm just eyeballing it right back here. Let's see, it has a very long, elongated front. I'm going to drag this out and get that uh, just a slight bow on it. Now I could control select this in the center line and make them coincident so that's that way it's centered. And then I could also hold control and select the center line and the two endpoints and make those two endpoints symmetric so they're equal on both sides. So if I move one side, the other side moves with it. You could put dimensions on this if you like. I'll just drop it in so you can see what I've got. I've got, um, oh, we'll just make it five inches. And now we could go ahead and take our arc tool again. We're going to have it kind of slope in this way and a little bit of a bow like that. And let's mirror that across. So control, hit escape, control, select that arc, and then this line here, and go to mirror entities. Now I could put a dimension on that too. And we'll just, we'll just make that nine. And then finally, we'll put another three point arc from here to here, and just a subtle bow right there. Okay, now we're gonna to go to Features, Extrude Boss, and extrude this up, maybe 1.25, maybe even higher. Actually, maybe uh, we'll go one and a half inches. Oops. All right, and turn on Draft. Oh, actually, before we turn on Draft, let's cancel there, and let's put in some sketch fillets. And I want to show you the effect that sketch fillets have versus putting a fillet after the fact, especially when draft is involved. So go to the sketch, go to fillet, and let's see what this looks like here. I'm going to increase that to point 0.1. Let's see. Uh, let's go with maybe, let's try one inch. That's a Bit on the dramatic side, maybe not so much. Let's go with 0.75. There we go. All right, hit the green check. Now we could go ahead and go to features. I'll hit the green check again. Extrude boss 1.5, and let's turn on draft. Now I have it at 25 degrees of draft, and you can see that the sketch fillet starts to converge. And that may be good, may not be good. Depends on what you're looking for out of the design. I think that's going to be okay for me. So I'm going to hit the green check because I'm going to chop part of that off. If you, if, again, if we take a look at this boat, you can see there's a, it darts down and then back up again. So to do that, I'm going to go to the right plane and start a sketch, hit my space bar. And actually, I'm just going to go to the right so it straightens out. And I could draw that in. Now, I'm going to take the line tool, and I'm sketching on the right plane. And I'm going to go down like this, and then up again. Actually, I'm going to put more of a angle on that, and then down again. Now, you could have it just sliced through this way. I actually kind of like to do something like this, where I have a solid cut through. And then I could go to Features, Extrude, Cut, and Mid-Plane, and just drag it out. Or actually, I'm sorry, through all both. Go through all both, that's just easier. Hit the green check. And now we are starting to get our cockpit. Looking pretty good there. Okay, another feature I had on there 
And by the way, the cockpit's going to be an offset in this cut. But before I put that in there, I want to get some of these other features placed. So I'm going to select this face and start a sketch. Now what I'm looking to do is you can see this curve design I have here as well as there. They're both done separately because they're on different surfaces. But to show you how that's done, I select that face and I started a sketch. And I'm going to go to the top view. Oops. And make sure you're in the sketch tool here. I'm going to draw in a center line. And I'm going to proceed. I'm going to take the spline tool. And I'm going to come off like that corner. Now, the more points you put in, the more control you're going to get. And if you're snapping to things, note that the control key will override the snap if you hold the snap. So you don't, you're not snapping to geometry so often. Notice control key deactivates the auto snap. Or it's actually auto relation. It's not really snap, but it looks like it's snapping. Okay, and I'm going to adjust these curves to make it look a little bit more subtle. And I can mirror that across. So I'm going to select it, hold control, select the center line, mirror entities. And then you could control select these edges. And this is where we get to use convert entities. Convert entities projects those edges and should seal that up. And then over here, we want to go ahead and control select these two edges. Now be careful, there's draft on it. You want the ones that are touching and hit convert entities again. And then go to trim entities and use your trim to closest and trim off this segment here and this segment here. And it should highlight that like that. Okay, now I could go to features and I can extrude that. I'm just going to extrude it very shallow, like 0 0.01 maybe. Yeah, maybe a little bit higher, 0 0.03. All right, so now we're going to make the cockpit segment. So I'm going to select this face, start a sketch, and we could actually do an offset entities for this. Just go to offset entities, and whatever thickness you'd like, just hit the reverse and hit the green check, features, extrude cut, and bring that down. Just make sure it doesn't go too low and through the boat. You can preview it by just kind of rotating it on like so. Now, if you wanted to go straight down and flat, you could do that as well. Um, you would, you could actually go up to a plane. So instead of blind, you could say up to surface. And I think uh, we don't have any surface there. But if if you wanted to, you could offset a plane. Okay, and now we saw what happened here with that fillet and how it gets smaller. It tapers with the draft. Watch what happens when I put a fillet around here later on. When you add a fillet after the fact, it comes out very different. It's constant. And in this case, it blew it out the preview. So I can only go with about 0.4 on this, on this edge. But now look at that, it's just straight. There's no taper. I mean, there's draft on it, but it's consistent versus this one is actually getting smaller as it goes higher. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and add some additional features on here. It's a little bit big. Maybe around this edge here. Get some fillets in on here. And maybe on that too. Okay. 
Now, if some of you are wondering how to get a steering wheel, the steering wheel, say we want to offset it, we don't want it in the center, you would select, and I'll show your right plane. There's my right plane. And I'm going to hold control and drag off a copy just like we did before. And I'm just eyeballing, in this case, maybe about an inch. Yeah, we'll just make it an inch even. See it's offset there. Hit the green check. And now we can click on that new plane and start a sketch. I'm going to go to the normal two button. And then I'm going to go ahead and so I can see into the cockpit, I'm going to go to hidden lines visible up here. And from here, I could draw in with the sketch tool where I'd want my steering wheel. And I'm going to have it intersect a little bit. It's going to come up here. I could go perpendicular. Depends how big you want your steering wheel. And then I want a little radius on it. So I'm going to use our trick for a tangent arc. Drag that down. And then get this connected. And just make sure that these two are parallel. And I could select this edge and go to Features, Revolve Boss Base, hit the green check. And when you look in there, you should have a steering wheel. Now, if you want to put additional details, you can. You can make an assembly. You could take the hand wheel, scale it down. You can do a lot of different things. Just showing you some techniques there. Let's go back to shade it with edges. Now to make the chair, you could select the floor, start a sketch. I'm going to make a little post and let's see, let's uh, get it aligned. Right about there. And notice I'm not using dimensions. I'm just having a little bit of fun here. So point one for the height and then you could build on that you could start a sketch oh, oh i went to edit sketch let me click on that start a sketch and you could take your center rectangle if you want you could center it extrude boss to make the seat and if you want, you could actually select this face and start a sketch and draw in if you wanted to use the uh, parallelogram. Click here, here. Draw in a parallelogram, features, extrude boss base. I made mine a little bit different. It's just all different modeling techniques. I could select this edge to have it stop. And so we got our chair. And then you can put fillets on it and dress it up a bit. And then the photorealistic rendering and such, like this was the, the exhaust. I just drew the exhaust ports and extruded them out. There's a lot of little tricks. But basically, um, that kind of gets you pretty close to making the rest of the boat. It does take time. Depends on how much time you spend on it but you can have a lot of fun with it with a lot of the different things we've learned. To see there, I've actually made a little control panel and uh, just extruded some features and such inside there. And then add your colors and you're in good shape. Okay, let's take a look at the lab that's in here. And for this one, we're just going to make the extrusion. There is a dimension missing, and it's right here. And I believe it's only 60 thousandths deep. So 0 0.06 for the height of that little lip that goes on there. But we can see this is the other half of the smoke detector that we made last week. It's a two and a half inch diameter. It's not shelled. That's the thing. It is hollowed out, but you're going to have to do extrusions to cut to shell. And here you can see section view showing there's a rib feature that's patterned around. And then this little feature for the nail holes or the screw holes for it to lock in. So let's begin. Go to new part and hit OK. Select the top plane, start sketch, draw your circle out. 
and dimension it at two and a half. Go to features, extrude boss. And as we look at the drawing here, the overall thickness is 0.31. Okay, the very first thing we should put on probably is the fillet at the bottom. And the fillet is 0.06. And now we could do the cutouts in here. So select this face, start a sketch. And the, uh, the ID is 2.4. So we could just draw that in the center. And then let's, ID stands for internal diameter, by the way. Extruded cut. And let's see here. So we have 310 minus 60 thousandths. So if you can't do the math in your head, you can type in here 310 minus 0 0.06. And it's 0.25. So just remember, you can always put in equations in there. All right, now let's go ahead and select this face, start a sketch. And the next diameter calls out is going to be 2.45. And what we're going to do is we'll draw a second circle, or we could actually use our little trick of convert entities. Like, so you can select this edge and hit convert entities, and it steals the edge and uses it. Now we go to features and extrude and cut. And this is the dimension I'm missing on the print. And it's 0 0.06 if I'm correct. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and put in one of those features. So I'm gonna select the um, the surface here, start a sketch. Oh, I hit edit sketch, sorry. Hit my space bar go to the top. And what we're looking to do here is make this interesting feature. <clears throat> so with that, let's see here, do I have a, I'm going to go ahead and download this. We'll just open it up and then that should give us the rotate. Okay, so what we're looking at here, we have a detail of a radius of 0.1 and the radius of 0.05, and it goes down here 20,000 steep. And look at that, so 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So let's actually go with a straight slot. Infer to the origin, click and drag this up, and there we go. And so we're looking at 0.1 and then 0.18 between centers. So actually, we can just dimension this. Now, to locate that, this is located, let's see here, 0.82. So from here to here, 0.82, and now it's located. Let's go to Features, Extrude Cut, and that first depth is only 0.02. And now we can select that. If you're seeing that, that's just a, a floor now. Start a sketch on that surface. And let's go to the circle here and infer. And this is going to be snapping to that size there. 
And then over here, we have a smaller circle. Or better yet, rather than a circle, just we'll use that tool again, the straight slot. And infer, it's going to be a little bit smaller, 0 0.05. And we could trim this out, or we could leave it as is. And let me just make sure I, got, I don't have this upside down. OK, looks good. And that just goes cut, it gets cut through. So features, extrude cut. And remember, it goes to selected contour because we didn't trim it. So we just have to select everything we want to cut through. Oops, let me edit that. Forgot to select through all. All right, so there we have our little feature. Now we need to pattern that or get that over to the other side. So I'm going to select those two features. Let me go to linear pattern. We could select this edge for our vector, put in only two instances, and then the dimension is given on that sheet of 1.5. Okay, hit the green check. So we have our little tabs so we can mount. Now we're going to go ahead and put in those uh, ribs. Now we're not going to use the rib feature because it doesn't go straight across. But I'm going to select, uh, let's see, take a closer look at how those ribs are developed. Okay, so they're 210 off of the bottom base. Um, so they're 100 thousandths off the top. So if we were to bring them off the bottom, If we wanted to use the actual dimensions that are given here, we could just select the bottom surface of the model, start a sketch, and then go to the top and draw one of those in. I'm going to go ahead and draw a center line straight across, and then I'm going to use the center rectangle and draw in a little rectangle here and snap it to this edge. Or actually, maybe intersect it a little bit, just so it's actually contacting. I guess we could go with tangent even, but that's all right. Let's take a look at what the next dimension is. And it's centered. The thickness is going to be 40 thousandths. And then the offset, it goes a quarter inch from the outer edge. So we go, we could click on that point to here. It's 0.25. And then let's actually, we can make this tangent to this edge. So that way it just fills in. And then this will be 40. 0.04. Now I can go to Features, Extrude Boss Base. We'll have it extrude up. And it was 0.25, I believe. Yep. Hit the green. Uh, actually, let's stop. Actually, I think it's 0.21. There we go. Hit the green check. And now we can pattern that. So we could go to Circular Pattern. It's already selected. Select the outer face. Set to 300 equal spacing, 368 instances. Hit the green check. And I do believe there might be another. Let's take a look. I think I might have messed that up a little bit. Oh, I, uh, I did actually. This There is a little tab that goes up the very top. So for that, we could extend this to the top and then make a cutout. That would probably be a good way. Or we could just have this come out 0.15. All right. Let's select the side face, start a sketch, and we're going to go normal two, and then go to pin lines, and we'll just draw that in. 
use the corner rectangle tool, get it down to this corner here. And I believe if we go, we don't want to get it on the edge because then it will extend outward. I think. So let's uh, have it offset a little bit there. And then from here, let's see, where does that end up? To the outside. Oh, 0.15. Okay, and we might want to put a little dimension in here just to make sure it never pokes out. We'll just make it 0.1. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 0.01. Okay, and let's go to Features, Extrude Boss, and Shade this so you can see it. We want it to go up to this edge and follow that edge. Hit the green check. And if I had put it on the original one that I extruded, let's see. Yep. Technically, I could drag the circular pattern underneath it and now edit the circular pattern because I just reordered it because of the timeline. And make sure I select that little face right there for that additional feature, that Boss Extrude 3, or I could have selected it right here. And there it is. And again, there's several ways. If you watch my earlier videos, I probably did it completely different. But that pretty much completes this lab, Lab 7. I'm sorry, Lab 8 and as well as exercise eight. Welcome back. In this exercise, we're gonna take a look at exercise nine in SOLIDWORKS 2020. We're going to touch upon what's called top-down assembly modeling. Now, uh, this one is a little disputed as far as if it's really top-down. In uh, my 22 years of experience, I would say it is just because it's, a, but it's a very primitive example of top-down. Most people think a top-down is very large assembly or a collection of parts that are built inside the assembly using um, attachment points and things that are in context to the parts. And that's essentially what this is. It's only two parts that we're going to work on. You can see it's a, it's a pencil sharpener. And when we're done with it, we should be able to like just change one of the parts and the other part will update with it. And that's the true power behind top-down assembly modeling is the ability to change something and have the other parts that it's based off of update with it without much effort. Now that too can have its drawbacks in the event that you want to use one of those parts for a different assembly and someone changes the original assembly and it can have a domino effect of change that may not be desirable. So you need to manage your files and there's PDM systems for product data management or PLM systems, product lifecycle management systems, that could vault and automatically rename new files as you make them when things change. And so you have revision control because that's key in trying to manage these files because change always occurs with designs. And so um, let's get started. We're gonna go to new assembly and hit OK. Now, on the left hand side, you'll see we have um, some options here. Just go ahead and hit the red X to cancel. And we've talked about an exercise five. We went with bottom up assembly modeling, which was making the parts outside and then putting them in. We're going to make both of these parts inside. The first part, honestly, we could probably build it outside of the assembly, but I want to introduce you to what it's like to work inside the context of an assembly. First of all, go to the assembly tab and underneath insert components, hit the little arrow and you'll find new part. Go ahead and select that. Now take your pointer and I discussed this in exercise five. If you drop a new part into the front plane every time, it will actually match the, uh, that parts, front, top, and right planes, which IE means its origin as well, with the origin and front, top, and right planes of this assembly. And some companies, that's how they do a lot of their work. Some companies not. So just be aware, 
uh, if you're working in a company already that has their own ways of doing things, make sure you talk to them on what strategy is best suited for the organization that you're working for. But we're going to go ahead and drop this in on the front plane. Now you'll see it will give it a generic name there. We have the ability, um, if you want, you could name them later by saving them or else you could actually click on here and give it a name right now. I'm just going to go ahead and call this the um, E9 front and then click off of it. And we could actually save it too if you wanted. That's another method. You could save it outside of the context of the assembly so that it's actually a separate part outside. There's a lot of uh, different ways you can do things now. And it's pretty neat. So anyhow, now that we have that in there, we're going to leave it in here. I want you to go to the center rectangle. Now what it did is it dropped our new part in, it locked it into the origin of the assembly, and it automatically starts to sketch on the front plane of the part that you're working on. You could back out of that by turning off, turning on exit sketch or rebuild, and then select a different plane or surface. But there's some advantages to this. And in this case, it, um, we're fine. Go to the origin, and we're in isometric view, so when you click on that origin, drag it out, it's going to look tilted, not to worry. That's just the 3D. And the X and Y are going to be around two inches. So click, go to smart dimension, dimension it two by two. Now go to the sketch fillet tool. Click on sketch fillet. And the entities to fillet, we're going to go ahead and make this 0.125. We're going to fill it with a sketch fillet, the four corners. Now we could do this later on, but it might make it a little easier to add them into the sketch. Now hit the green check mark on sketch fillet, go to features and extrude boss space. Now, if you're following along in the training guide, the training guide really doesn't give you a whole lot as far as instructions just to uh, do what we're doing now, but it gives you the drawings of these parts and they're super easy to build. These parts could be built the first day by a student first day usually. Um, and I'm trying to keep them simple for the purpose of you being able to focus on how assemblies work, and especially top down. And so we can see here two by two and it's uh, one inch thick. And hit the green check mark. And those of you wondering where those training guides are, they're at the Vertanu one web page. So you could go and just go to V as in Victor, E-R-T, A, N as in Nancy, U, X as an X-ray, and one.com. And then right here under instructional manuals, the SOLIDWORKS basics would bring it up. And then you would just go to page 90, and that will take you to this drawing. I'm going to drag mine over here. If you have dual screens, I invite you to. That way you could read the dimensions off of it. All right, now select that front face and start a sketch. And we're just going to draw a boss and a circles. The diameter of the circle is going to be 1.25. And then extrude that, go to features, extrude boss base, and the extrusion depth will be a half inch, so 0.5. Now select that face there and start a sketch. And we're going to draw a half inch diameter hole for the pencil. And so dimension that at 0.5. Now go to features and extruded cut and cut it through all. Let's go to the fillet tool now and put the fillets on here. So go to fillet. The fillet's going to be 0.125. Select this edge right here. Don't select the back edge. The back edge should not be filleted. In fact, that's one reason why I had you put the sketch fillets in so you don't accidentally select the back edge. And then select this front face and hit the green check. And there's one more fillet. Let's go back to fillet. It's 0.25. And it's just this edge right here for the pencil inlet. All right, flip it around. And now we're going to shell this out. Go to the shell command and it's going to be 0.1. Select this face to open it up and hit the green check. Now we're going to put a little lip on this edge. And so I'm going to show you a new technique 
Nothing so far that I've shown you today, with the exception of opening up and starting a new assembly, is really new here. So um, select this face. This, this is one area where it is. Start a sketch. Go to Offset Entities and set it to 0 0.05, but then make sure you hit the little check mark underneath it for reverse and hit the green check. And now here is where I'm going to show you something that's interesting. We go to Features, Extrude Boss Space, so it's to 0.25. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, that's a solid block. How are we going to shell that after it's already been shelled? Take a look under on the left here. There's Thin Feature. Set the Thin Feature to 0 0.05, and then hit the Reverse button, which is right above it on the left. And now we have our lip. Hit the green check. There it is. OK, now we could go ahead and turn off Edit Component. Now, this is where it becomes challenging for new users. When they are starting a new part, you first have to exit out of the old part because every part should be separate. So turn off Edit Component. And now what we can do is insert the new part. So I'm going to go to Insert Component. Oh, I'm sorry, not insert component. Hit the cancel there. That's for bottom up. Hit the little arrow underneath it. I'm sorry. Hit new part. And once again, we'll use that strategy of selecting the front plane. Now, note we could select this surface. Um, that just so happens to be where this front plane lies. Now, why would I select that surface versus selecting the, the front plane to drop it in? Well, the more that you utilize other parts, the more dependencies are linked together. And like I was saying earlier, if you ever decide to use one of those parts in a different assembly and you make a change to it or try to make a change to it, or someone else makes a change to its original parent objects that it was based off of, you can get the domino effect where a change will update that wasn't desirable. So if you could try and prevent that from happening, that's great. So essentially, when you're selecting and dropping surfaces to sketch on or off of other parts, you are making a web, kind of like a spider web. And the more of those you have, the more complex it gets. And just as a piece of advice, we're going to go with the front plane of the assembly here. Now, the part turns transparent. And some people like this. I actually think it's wor it works pretty well in many cases because then you can see through it. And, and by the way, these are the parts that the parts that turn transparent are the parts that you can't actually edit while you're editing the part you just dropped in, if that makes sense. So what we're going to do, we're going to disable transparency for a moment. See where it says assembly transparency? Click on that and change it to maintain transparency. That's kind, of, um, that's kind of the best of both worlds. And then zoom in and out, and it will refresh the screen, and the transparency is gone. Just remember, you could set this up in the Tools Options menu too permanently, or uh, in this case, it's kind of nice to have the best of both worlds. Turn it on, turn it off as you desire. OK, now what we're going to do, we are sketching on that same plane that this surface was started off on. So let's click on the surface right here. Now, this is where we actually want to steal the geometry from one part to the other, because this is a, a spider web we do want where basically, if we ever update that front cover that we just made, the part that we're building right now, which is the rear cover, will update with it. So select this face and hit Convert Entities. Convert Entities automatically converts the outer edges of whatever face you select. It could be edges that you could select too. It will update that. Now, we're ready to extrude it. Notice it captured all this. There's no dimensions on it because it's tied to the original front cover that we built. If that ever changes, this will update. So go to the features, go to extrude boss space, flip the direction, and let's have it go um, one inch. All right. And apparently I, uh, I hit enter too early. So I'm going to hit the little arrow. I'm going to right click on that. I'm going to edit the feature and one inch. Okay. There we go and hit enter again. So now you could actually see that part 
attach the other part. Now notice they didn't merge. They're contacting each other. It's a coincidence. And at this point, assembly transparency, you could go back to force transparency. And now you can actually see what's going on a little bit better with the other part. Okay, we're going to do a little neat little trick here. I want to show you something called the dome feature. And those of you who did lab two, the second week, already know about this little trick. So select this face, go to insert, features, and find dome. Now turn off continuous dome. And then use this little scroll bar and you can inflate it. Let's inflate it to about 0.5. And you can see what it's doing. It's actually going tangent to the side faces of the that are perpendicular to the face we selected to inflate. So just hit the green check mark. And now we have a nice little area. If, if someone's using this pencil sharpener, it could cup in their hand and it's not harsh, the sharp edges. All right, flip it around this side, and we're going to shell this now. So select this face and go to Features, Shell, and set it to 0 0.05, so 50 thousandths. Now, normally we might do 0.495 or something to give it a little bit of clearance, but we're going to go with 0.5. We're going to make it line to line. And plastic, sometimes you could get away with line to line, but beware if it's steel or metals or any metal, you, do not, you want to make sure you build in clearance. But this is an intro class. We're more focusing on the aspects of SOLIDWORKS than we are the actual design aspects of engineering. There's classes for that where you're going to learn that. So hit the green check. So now it's shelled out. What we're going to do now, we're going to build a clipping mechanism that enables the enclosure, the rear enclosure to cover. And then there's actually two little clips that will hold it in. Later on, we'll have to go back to the front part and put in the little notches for that so it all interacts mechanically. But let's go ahead and do that now. To do this, find, uh, make sure you're looking at all of the features on the last part you just inserted, this one right here. Now mine says part 12. Be aware that's because I've been using this all day and it just keeps adding new names and sequence. Part one, part two, part three, part four. So yours is probably gonna be part two, perhaps. Um, anyhow. Let's use the plane that's tied into that particular part. Now, could I use the plane of the assembly? Absolutely. Could I use the plane of the E9 front? I could. But again, those all of a sudden you're just shooting out webs and you got to be careful. You might overload. I won't overload it, but you uh, can get confused later on if you're not careful. OK, so the right plane, I'm going to start a sketch. I'm going to hit my space bar and go to the right view orientation. And we're going to go ahead and go to Hidden Lines Visible. Now with Hidden Lines Visible, you can see in a light gray the interaction of the parts right here. And we want to take our circle tool and find the midpoint on this edge. See that little midpoint right there? Click, drag out a circle, and smart dimension it at 0.05. Now the drawing has a radius of 0 0.025, so be aware if you're looking at the drawing, you have to double that because we're drawing a full circle. Now we're going to mirror this over to the other side. So if you recall, we need a center line to mirror across with. So draw a center line right at the origin, make sure it's horizontal, hit escape. And now you could click and drag a fence to surround both the center line and that circle we just drew and just hit, hit the mirror entities and it should mirror down at the bottom as well. Let's go back to shaded with edges. And if you rotate this, we could see those two circles just kind of floating there on the right plane, which is intersected in the center of the model. Let's extrude those. Go to Features, Extrude Boss Space. We want them to be 0.25, but from the mid plane, so they're 50 50 on each side of the plane. Hit the green check. And there, now we could actually see the little clips we just added. There's one on the top, one on the bottom. So we're done with this part. So turn off edit component. Now let's go ahead and we're going to edit this part to put in the recesses. But before we do that, I want to show you how you could check. Let's say you forgot to add that, or you're not even sure you realized that it's supposed to be in there. You could go to the evaluate and at any time you could do an interference detection. Click on interference detection. Uh, here's let's look at the whole assembly. You could do individual parts too. Sometimes it's 
you know, if you have thousands of parts, you don't want to sit there all day while it calculates the interferences. You calculate, and it highlights even with a little chime, and you can see in red that there's one, and then over here at the top is the other. So we have to make clearances for those on the front part. So click on this front part, and now we have to edit this part. And you could click on edit component. They're the same. I used the quick launch for edit part versus edit component, vice versa. They're the, they're the same tool. Okay, and we could actually see a little rectangle. That's actually the interference taking place. Now, let's hit the little arrow to the left of our part that's at the bottom here. So we bring up all that, all those features we don't need to see. Now hit the little arrow to the left of the E9 front. And let's select its right plane and start a sketch. Hit your spacebar, go to the right view orientation, and let's go back to hidden lines visible. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna select that. We're gonna go to offset entities and set it to 0 0.005, so five thousandths of an inch. That's, that's a very small amount, okay? But it's just enough clearance so that it doesn't stick together too much. It won't break. Now you might think you could do the one at the bottom. Unfortunately, you can't. You have to wait a second. Go to that one now, hit offset entities, um, 0 0.05. If you have to, if it looks like it's reversed than mine, you have to hit the reverse switch, but you shouldn't. It looks like it's working properly or as expected. Now go to the line tool and close these off from those black dots there and there and here and here. Now let's go to shaded with edges. And let's look what we're gonna do here. We're gonna to go to features, extruded cut. Now, again, we want mid plane, but instead of 0.25, let's go with 0.26, which is an additional 10 thousandths divided by two is 5 thousandths on either side. So point, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 0.26. And if you zoom up, you could actually see it's a little bit larger than the rectangle. Hit the green check, and there it is. Now, if we decide to run an interference detection, let's turn off edit component and go back to interference detection and hit calculate, no interferences. So we fixed our interferences. Hit the X. Now it can treat coincident as interference if, because that can be an issue. Like I said, sometimes with plastics, coincidence works okay, um, but with metals, not usually, or glass. Okay, now to um, do the ultimate test here, let's rebuild it. And we should be able to just double click on this back side or this front face here. We see the two inches. Now, if we did this correctly, we should be able to just double click on that two, change it to three, and hit this little rebuild button here. And if they both updated, you did it correctly. So that's the power of top-down assembly modeling in a nutshell. Again, not everyone agrees with me that this is considered top-down. It's because it's such a very simple example. But the concept of having sketches that relate to one another, in my opinion at least, uh, indicates that to me it is, it, it's scraping the surface of top down. It goes much deeper. And remember, this is an intro class. Most intro classes don't even touch upon top down assembly modeling until like uh, actually advanced classes. Okay, now when you save your assembly, now SOLIDWORKS has done some interesting things. You could save the assembly in the context, or the, the parts in, in the context of the assembly, or you could save them separately. So example being like, um, if I were to right now go to File, Save, and it's gonna save both these. I'm gonna hit Save All, and we'll go ahead and give it a name. I'm gonna call this D9B. And now you have this, you could save within context reference, uh, without in context references, or save with in context references. So here we have references update in the context of the saved assembly, you must rename components in the 
and the Save As with References dialog box before you save the assembly. So note when we're if we save with without in context, you might want that actually. You you may not want changes to occur um, in the event that you use those parts somewhere else. Um, in this case, there is a save as, and let's let me I'll show you how to do that. Let's save it without in context right now. And see here you have the ability to save internally inside the sub assembly or save externally. You can save those parts as external parts. That's how SOLIDWORKS used to work, where uh, you only have the ability to save the parts outside. So if you had to send someone your assembly, like another company that was going to work on it, you would have to send all the part files with the assembly and, and drawing. Whereas if you save internally, everything's in this one assembly file. And it's rather nice. So it again, it depends on your application from work. One of the places I worked at, we found file management was very challenging and we tried to save things externally. And also we broke all the references, kind of like the way we just saved this um, because we didn't want the changes to always occur. Another place had implemented PDM, and PLM, and those systems allow you automatically, when you save something, it saves a revision and uh, in that way you don't tamper with the original part. So there's a lot of complexities here. We're, we don't have, uh, in an intro class, I don't want to go into all those complexities. Again, just scraping the surface here. So let's go ahead and save them internally. That way we don't have separate parts floating around. Okay, and that concludes this exercise. Now for the drawing, which is your lab, you'll want to recreate this drawing here. Okay, with the front, top, section view, detail view, uh, isometric exploded, bill of materials. So it's just good practice. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to, I'm first, I'm going to explode this. I'm going to go to assembly because we need an exploded view. Exploded view, select this part, drag it forward. And I'm going to leave it at the three inches because I've already saved them broken. So basically, they, uh, we'll just leave it as is. Okay, so now that's exploded. I'm going to right click, I'm going to collapse. And now I could go to File, Make Drawing from Assembly. And we'll do it on an A size sheet. Now go ahead and select the front view, unfold the top view and give yourself an isometric view and hit the green check. Grab the isometric view, drag it over here. You could shade it with edges and then I'll, over here, hit show and explode a state. Now, if it doesn't appear the way you would expect it, take a look over here. You might've made more than one exploded state and then select the one you want. I'm gonna go ahead and click on these two and right click them. And I held control when I clicked on multiple entities, by the way. Go to Tangent Edge with Font, click on this one, go to Drawing, Section View, click in the center, hit the green check, and Auto Hatching, Randomize Scale, drag it to the right. Now we want a detail view of that region there. Click, click and drag out a detail view, drop it right there. And instead of per standard, just for fun, try Connected. Note that you could enlarge that region or squeeze it down. And let's put in some dimensions. So go to annotations, smart dimension. We'll go ahead and put a dimension from here to this point here, drag it down and center it. And let's make it an inspection dimension. And then from here to here, right there, make that inspection dimension as well. We'll probably have to move these out. Oops, look, uh, let me hit escape there. Let's drag that over here, move that over here. And now let's add one more dimension here, smart dimension. And from here to here, three inches inspection. Now we'll Add the balloons, go to balloon. Oh, that one I missed. 
that one there. Let's click on that, hit delete. And now the bill of materials, select the view, insert tables, bill of materials, hit the green check and drop that right up here. I know on that drawing, I had it down there. If you decide, if you have Excel on your system, try the Excel base that's a little bit smaller, you'd be able to drop it in the lower right there. And then go to note, actually it labeled it for us automatically. Uh, and that concludes exercise nine and lab nine. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Chris Sikor and I'll be your guide through this exercise 10 using SOLIDWORKS 2020. This exercise, what we're going to take a look at is a bit of an advanced topic actually, even though this is for the introductory class. Uh, we are nearing the end of the semester and this is what I used to call the, you might say, real world scenario, or at least as real world as you're going to get um, as far as uh, the documentation and such. Now, what this is, is it's actually a rather old MP3 player, as you can see here, you know, about yay big, and it would have been like a, a, attached to a, a belt hoop or something back in the day. Um, I actually designed this just for this lesson, I want to say almost uh, probably around 2003, so it's getting up there in age. One of these days, I'll update it. Anyhow, uh, it seems to do the job and getting students to understand like what to expect when you get out there into a, a job. And this one really kind of makes you think. It's uh, I throw it at you. I don't give you any instructions or virtual. I give you basic instructions that you might see from actually a manager. And uh, I'll show that to you in a second. And then you have to go ahead and do the tasks. Now you'll see that there's um, on here, and this is in the training guide, which is at vertanu1.com. You could, uh, it's just the uh, SOLIDWORKS basics training guide, and it's on page 94. Uh, basically, um, imagine you start a job and you someone throws you a project that's like more than, maybe there's only about 10 or 20% of it left to complete. And these are all the little details. So, um, and it's gonna be also bottom up, and top down, so a combination of the two. Like the bottom up segment will be a battery. You're going to put a double A battery in here, and so you could either model the double A battery or find one online. Most students who I've had um, who actually ask me like, what are the dimensions of the battery? There actually there is a drawing I have of it. But think about about it this way: you want to be very resourceful in the company that you go to work for. And if there's something like a double A battery, if you could look around the office and see if you have one and just measure it really quick, it's really just a cylinder and it has a little nub at the top. So it's just really two cylinder stacks on each other and you'd be able to model that up. Uh, the one I have on here is a little bit more detailed. But needless to say, um, I, I get a lot of students still online because I didn't always include the battery with the assumption I used to actually want students to model it up. And, I, and in fact, actually the first couple times I did this lesson, I would hand out a bunch of batteries and calipers and they would measure it. So those are the types of things that when you get out in industry, it, sometimes it is good to ask a manager, you know, and they might say, gosh, you know, we have one already saved someplace. But if not, just be ready, especially something that's this easy that you can model up or even look for the specs online. Um, you might not want to bother your manager because remember when you're hired by an organization, they're hiring you to make their job easier. And if you're asking them questions on how to model a, a cylinder with a little nub on the top, a, i.e. a battery, they might kind of raise their eyebrows and uh, they'll give you a, a free pass on a couple of those. But after a while, especially if you're new, you might not find yourself working there much longer. So uh, my little piece of advice is do as much as you can that when you can think it through versus always going to ask the manager. And that's a lot of what this lesson is about. And I'm going to discuss some of those aspects. All right, so we want to download this file. And where you would find it, just go ahead and go to Vertanu, V as in Victor, E, R, T as in Tom, A, N as in Nancy, U, X, and then one dot com. And then you'll go to part files. And it's going to be the exercise 10 in the red column. The SOLIDWORKS files are always in the red column. Click on exercise 10 and you hit download here. If you're using a different browser, your download button might be up here 
It depends on the browser. Sometimes it gets positioned in different places. But anyhow, you want to download it. It's going to be zip file compressed. So when it does open, you could open it with Windows Explorer. Like in this case, it's asking Windows Explorer. Sometimes if I'm in Google Chrome, it might, you could just open it up inside the files there. Hit OK. And now you have the ability to go to extract, or I've shown you shown you in other lessons where you just select everything or control A and then hold control and hit C for copy and then create a new folder. Right click on documents here, new folder. Oops, let's get in there. There it is, new folder. I'm gonna click on it twice to change it. I'm gonna go ahead and label this E10. And actually I'm gonna drop into my SOLIDWORKS basics folder because that's where I've been keeping a portfolio of things. And then just find the E10 folder. And actually I already had one in there. And you just right click on the folder and you just paste. And once you paste it, you'll get the part files in there and you can enlarge them. All your images may not come out the same as mine because I just saved them about 15 minutes ago when I was throwing this lesson together. All right, so what we're going to do, if you go into that folder, if you have SOLIDWORKS started up already, that's great. If, uh, if not, this should launch it. Just find the E10 import and double click on it. It should launch it inside SOLIDWORKS and update the assembly. Now, I'm going to turn off my real view. And what we see here is our MP3 player, and it's incomplete. Even though you look at it, it might seem complete, it's not. It's missing the LCD screen right here. Okay. It's also missing right here. There's actually a, a hole for a post that would be in there that would create a hinge. And uh, that hinge isn't capable just as yet because we need the post. So a little boss that's going to fit inside there. Uh, some of the other things, if we look inside, you're going to find there's other entities that we're going to have to address too. Now, this is actually spelled out in the, the training guide. So this is what you get. Now, I'm going to go ahead and rotate this. And this is what we call an in industry a red line and markup drawing. It's a drawing that basically goes through and uh, the manager takes a Sharpie red marker and literally or a red pen and circles areas, draws, draws arrows and tells you briefly what to do. So it's giving you your tasks. Now it's up to you to funnel through those or filter through what you know you can do that you're capable of and maybe saving the things you're not capable of for a little later on, uh, depending upon how complex the model is. What I mean by that is what I was talking about earlier. There's the AA battery, not just as made a AA battery into the socket. Again, you could spend some time, interrupt your manager, say, hey, you know where that AA battery is? Do, you, do we have one on the file system? Or knowing that it's a very simple part, you could just go ahead and model it up, finding one maybe on, just usually they're sitting around somewhere in a radio or in a clock and you could just pull it out and find a scale or calipers and measure it. Now here I've already made it for us, so we don't have to worry about that. So that would probably be our first thing to address. Now you see here uh, what I was talking about earlier, create this boss that holds the earphone case and it's like a, a case that swivels out so you can wrap up your headphones stuff them in there and close it up. Now we're not going to go into the engineering aspects of it, like, you know, whether it's a mushroom clip or all the details like that. We're just drawing the post so you get the idea of the combination or this hybrid of assembly, which is essentially top down and bottom up all in one. Then we're going to model the LCD screen. And that's actually just going to be on this circuit board that's right here, the PCB. And then we have to model in some of these details on the backside. So it says shell this backside out at a hundred thousandths, add a half a fifty thousandths by 0 0.1 inch high lip. All right, uh, with one degree of draft. Now I used to have everyone put the draft in. You don't have to do it. I can't even really see the draft on there. But in real life, you would put some sort of draft typically on there so it could pull from the mold. 
And then finally, you have add these ribs to hold the battery in place. So that's a cradle that you're building on the plastic, uh, the, the back side. And you can't see it right here, but on the circuit board, there's actually some circuitry, and then there's a cradle that's mounted on there that we're going to match it up to this so that we have a nice fit. And again, this is, we're going to, you're going to see some of the power behind top down assembly modeling, where you could actually take edges and geometry from one part to build the other part so that there's a very high tolerance between them. Okay. And so let's begin with the battery. What you want to do for the battery is roll this around, rotate it, click on this part and hide that part. And now you can actually see there's our cradle right here. And there's some of the circuitry. And, and this is not a real part, by the way. This is a widget. I just threw this together. So um, it wouldn't really look like this inside, I'm sure. It'd be much more simplistic. Um, Anyhow, what we're going to go ahead and do is drop in the battery. So if you go to insert component, and we're going to go ahead and find that E10 folder, and there should be a AA battery in there. Go ahead and open it up and get it close in proximity. Now, this particular file has the origins turned on. That's what those blue things are. We don't really need to see those if you don't want to. Just go to view and hide show and turn off origins. <coughs> Excuse me. And now we're going to go ahead and mate this. Now we've learned how to mate uh, with the Alt key. So if you hold Alt, grab either the, this face or this face, drag it down to that yellow face there, and it should snap. Now notice it's not exactly in place, but it is concentric. So release the mouse button first, then you could release Control and hit the green check. Now we want this backside face to contact the contact. So let's go to mate. I already have that backside face selected. Go ahead and select this gold contact right here and it should cut, it should touch it. Now you could do the other, other side, either one's fine. So that's the battery. Now we're gonna go ahead, flip this around and let's address putting in that boss. Now, first of all, the battery, let's uh, ask a question here. What do you think it is, bottom up? or top-down modeling that we just did there. And we've talked about both over the past few weeks. If you've guessed bottom-up, you're correct. Bottom-up is taking parts that are already existing and just dropping them in. So library parts, like also what would be included in there, like nuts, bolts, washers, those are library parts. So that would be bottom-up modeling. Now, here's what we're going, to, we're going to be editing this part. And this is really part editing inside the context of assembly. But at the same token, it is assembly modeling because we're going to base the location of our post centered on that hole so that it fits perfectly. So here's what I want you to do. Now what we have to do is we have to click on the purple part. And you want to go to Edit Part. Now, you always have to do this. And we've learned that from Exercise 9. So click on Edit Part. And so now we're editing the purple part. Now, one defining entity is that the part that you're editing on the feature tree always turns out the text is blue. So just be prepared to look for that. And you can see it's called the original here. That is the front cover and it's in blue. That's an indicator that that's the part we're editing. All the other parts are not being edited, but we could steal information from them still. So let's go ahead and notice you can select through the part that's over it because it's transparent. Now start a sketch. Now here, unfortunately, though, we can't select through it very easily. So let's hit our space bar and go to the front view orientation or um, just so it's aligned here. Let's go to front over here, control one. Zoom up to that region. And now let's go to either wireframe or hidden lines visible. I like hidden lines visible. And now we can actually see that area there and you're able to snap to it. So go to the circle tool and align to this, I'll hover over the edge and then it locates the center. Click and drag out a smaller circle and you'll notice we're in inches. I mean, I'm sorry, metric for this one. 
So go to Smart Dimension, and that's not a problem. And in fact, when we add our dimensions, you'll see that it's an ISO. So technically, this assembly was not in the ANSI standard, which isn't a big deal. I'm going to show you some neat things. First of all, you can click over here to drop that. And if we're not sure, if we know what it's supposed to be for um, inches and not metric, you could type in what you know. So for example, 0 0.120 and hit the green check mark. All right, now it was supposed to be 120 thousandths of an inch and you can see it's much smaller. So double click on that again. Let's do something different. 0 0.120 IN, type in I for inches, N, hit enter. And it converted it to 3.05. So be aware that just by typing in IN or even just the quote at the end, will actually convert it for you if you're if you're in that specific units, the other units, I should say. Now, at any time, you could go over here where it says MMGS, click on it, and you could go to IPS. We don't want to do that. We, we could, and it will convert over just fine. Now, be aware, those of you who worked on older systems, older systems had a tendency to rescale them. Uh, they're, they actually come out to a different scale. Um, and then you have to scale them yourself. SolidWorks actually does the conversion. So when you change it over, well, just like when we plugged in the number, it'll automatically make it the proper size. There's no scaling involved. So just be aware of that. Okay, now we could go back to shaded with edges and rotate this a little bit. And let's go to features, extrude boss base. Now let's go to, let's say five millimeters here. And we can see there's a bit of an intersection. That's okay. Technically, this would be designed better. It wouldn't have that strange little thing. It would, we would, the molding company would actually put a core pin that doesn't have that detail in there if you ask them to. So let's just pretend that uh, that like squiggly area is not there. Hit the green check. And there it is. We've just added a new post. Now when you're done, you have to turn off edit component. So make sure you go over here to edit component, turn off. It's no longer being edited. All right, let's look at our instructions from our manager. So we've taken care of the AA battery. We've created the boss. Now let's hit the LCD screen here. So for the LCD screen, it needs to be roughly the same size as that opening. And it's gonna be from the floor of the PC board, that green board there. And it needs to follow the contour of this purple exterior. So to do this, Here's what I want you to do. Uh, get it to where you can see inside there. Rotate it similar to mine if you can. And now, underneath the insert component, hit the little arrow and go to new part. So here we are at top down assembly modeling. Select new part. Click on the circuit board because it's flat. We can sketch on it. And now it goes to this transparent mode, which when you're more fluent with the system, it's not so bad, but for new users, especially in the basics class, let's go to assembly transparency and turn on maintain transparency and then rotate a little bit or zoom in and out for a quick second and refresh the screen. Um, you'll notice there's an opaque assembly and you're saying, well, why, why, why don't we use that opaque assembly that's over here? The reason um, I chose maintain assembly transparency because it's the best of both worlds. Notice right here, I'm able to keep this cover transparent and everything else is opaque, i.e. it's solid, you can't see through it. If we went to the uh, that other option, it turns it makes everything opaque, so you can't see through anything. So this is just kind of a nice little feature. All right, now what we're gonna do here is um, we wanna create this part similar to how these parts were created, not in the context of the assembly, well, in, in the context of the assembly, but not integrated into it. We want to rename it, in other words. Now, while the part is being edited, let's go to File, go to Save As, and it's just going to give a little message here. You could read it if you like, but watch this. Hit OK, and we're going to call it the LCD. Let's copy over the old LCD. Or you could call it LCD1 if you want, if you want to keep that other one there. Hit Save. I'm going to replace it, yes. And notice it's now listed as LCD. 
All right, so we changed it. And now that's a part floating outside of the assembly because we saved it like that. We did a save as. And remember, we had to be an edit component in order to do that per part. So that could be a solution for some of you if you're wanting to change out parts and things like that. Okay, or add parts to it. Now let's select this edge. Now be very careful. Make sure you're getting the edge and not a face. The, high, the way you know you're getting an edge is to the right of the pointer, there's a vertical line versus a blue box. If there's a blue box or square, you're getting a face. So stay away from the face. Make sure you get this edge and the edge will highlight in orange too. Click. Now we want to project that onto our green circuit board so we can actually do that. And oh, in fact, what had happened is I, oh no, I'm, we're still in the sketch, never mind. Okay, while that's selected, I released my mouse button. Now, if you go to convert entities, it's going to be the same diameter. And that's a coincident face-to-face -face fit, which it might not fit very well. You might want to have some clearance in there so when it's being assembled, it could be put together easier. So let's put an offset entities in there. Now, the offset, if you hit the reverse checkbox, you'll see the offset goes to the inside. And that's what we want. We want this lens, the LCD screen, to be smaller than the hole so it fits in. But not by a whole lot. We're just going to make the offset 0.005IN for inches. Hit enter. And it, it should appear to get a little bit larger. And you can see what that conversion is. It's 0.127 millimeters for the offset. Go ahead and hit the green check. And now let's go to features and extruded boss space. Now, if you were to extrude this by grabbing the arrow and using the ruler, you'll see the preview shows it's not following the contour of the purple outside surface. And we want this to be nice and smooth so if it brushes up against anything, it doesn't get caught. And if you put it in your pocket so it doesn't feel weird. Okay, so now instead of blind, Hit this little arrow to the right of blind and select up to surface. Now you just select the surface you wanted to go up to right here. And you'll see it will actually show you a contoured surface that it's matched. Go ahead and hit the green check. Let's put a fillet around that edge. So go to the fillet tool. Or better yet, actually cancel. Let's put a chamfer. Now, um, when it comes to aesthetics of a model, a chamfer versus a fillet. Um, if you're dealing with aesthetic, chamfers cast a greater shadow on something. So it's kind of like um, if you've ever seen actors and if you look at them up close and uh, for when a, a play is being done, they put a lot of makeup on. So you could see them from a distance and a uh, chamfer can kind of do that versus uh, a fillet doesn't cast as great of a shadow. So just from a standpoint of industrial design, we'll go with chamfer in this case. And it's just a matter of taste. Let's go ahead and set it to 0 0.03 and then inches. And this time put the quote in just for the heck of it. The little quote, which is right next to the enter key, shift and the little button to the left of the enter key. And select this edge and you'll see the little break in the chamfer. And actually, and here you'll see it's 0 0.03. Actually, let's increase that 0 0.06. Now, here's what's interesting, and I just realized um, the new part that I added because the way my computer system's set up, or my SOLIDWORKS is set up, we're in inches now. Remember, we were just in metric. That's because the assembly, the imported models were all set up in ISO standard, and a metric, MMGS. New parts, that it's not inclusive. If your system's set up for something different like that, you're gonna get the opposite. And that's okay here. In this case, if we knew what it was a metric, we could type in like 0, 0.0 blah, blah, and M for millimeters or whatever, or one or two millimeters. Okay, it, so hit the green check, and then we have our chamfer on there. Okay, let's turn off editing that component. So don't forget to turn that off. All right, now we're getting here. Um, the next thing is to work on that rear cover. 
So we need to bring that back. So find the base cover, click on it, and click on the eyeball, the big eyeball, to show component. And let's hide the purple part. Click on the purple part now and click on the eyeball with the line through it to hide it. And we'll leave these other parts in here and work around them. So for this next one, let's go ahead and select this face. And we want to go to edit part. So we are letting SOLIDWORKS know, hey, we're checking this part out. Let's work on it. So click on it. And the first thing the boss asked us to do was to put in a, a wall here, or a thin wall, and it's 100,000 shells, so 0.1. Now we have to make sure down in the lower right, you'll see it's an MMGS. If you like, we could hit the little arrow and change it to IPS. And now when we go to our uh, shell tool, it should, and sometimes you'll see because the assembly is in metric still, this is only adjusting the part we're editing. So we've converted that part to inches, but the assembly is still in metric. And so you might see like a discombobulation you might, of uh, the two systems. At some point you might see metric, some point you might see inches, just like we saw earlier. But let's see what it gives us. Go to shell and we're in inches. Okay. And point one is what we want. Click on this face and hit the green check. Now here you get a message, and this is actually common. Uh, the thickness value is greater than the minimum radius of curvature. The shell may not succeed, but could cause undesirable results such as bad geometry. Now, it will basically it's saying it's probably gonna work, but there might be bad geometry. And what does bad geometry mean? Well, bad geometry means that maybe there's a little segment somewhere that the face is missing. And normally we have watertight boundary conditions here with SOLIDWORKS. When a face is missing, it's no longer watertight. It has an opening in it or a crack in it, you might say. And so where that comes into play is if you send it off to a, a plastic injection mold shop to now make the molds for you, they use these models typically and they will actually use them to cavity blocks of steel. They might run into an issue where it says it cannot create the cavity feature or uh, remove that. And so that's one of the downsides of this, but they can sometimes, they can usually fix it. I used to get these a lot when I worked in industry. I worked in the mold industry for a little bit uh, and actually the prototyping industry. So I have a bit of experience in this field, but if we could fix it, that would be much better. So let's go ahead and just hit okay and let it do its job. But let's take this out of the assembly so we could look at it without all this stuff around it. And now what you can do for that, you could right click on the actual part, either in the feature tree or right here. And in the quick launch toolbars, the very first tool will be open part. Go ahead and select it. And now you might get this message, do you wanna proceed with feature recognition? And this is because it, this, this will usually happen if it's an imported model that may not be native to the software, um, we're gonna hit no. All right, and so we can see here, now there are tools for checking them and things like that. Uh, if we go to imported, <coughs> since it has a shell, we can't do it unfortunately, but if we left pre-shell, there's actually a little toolbox that allows us to work on it. There are other tools that we could look at it, but I'll tell you right now, usually and th the part looks actually quite good, look for entities like this. So what we have here, if we select that side face, when we shelled this out, the belt hoop had an issue. This has some uh, series of fillets and the minimum radius curvature was lost, maybe perhaps even at this point. And so it might create bad geometry for mold making. And in fact, actually, it's bad geometry for mold making anyhow, because it's an undercut. A mold typically, the most basic of molds are two part. They have one half here, one half here, and they split. And notice this hooks over, the mold couldn't split very easily there. Now there are ways of getting around that if you have to have it like that, but clearly we don't need it like that. Another, uh, so meaning we could basically fill it in if we wanted to. However, filling it in isn't always a good thing either. 
because when you fill in, and now we're talking about plastics engineering um, and design, that thick of a piece of plastic, you'll get sink marks. It'll actually sink in because it solidifies. And the more material that you have, it sinks in even worse. You might not want that. We don't want the part to be warped because it's sinking in. So you want to keep what they call a core inside there to keep the walls thin, to prevent the shrinkage from occurring. So here's what we're going to do. Select the side face, start a sketch, and draw, uh, actually hit Convert Entities. That projects all the edges on the inside there to sketch geometry, as you can see here. Now take and uh, take the line tool and click in here and draw a little box like this and have some geometry similar to what I have. So I'm going to go ahead and dimension this. Um, let's see here. We'll have it go in 0.03. Oops, I'm sorry, 0.3. And then we're going to go ahead and add an angle here. And what we're trying to add, and actually I accidentally selected, let me cancel that, selected the point. Let's go with 120 degrees here and 120 here. And what I would normally do is I would actually put a draft on using um, angles. But we'll, we'll just do it this way just so it's easy to see um, and add some dimensions here. So, And then the bottom here, we'll go ahead and make that 0.125. And then position this endpoint to this edge right here for that point. And go ahead and make that we'll make it, uh, point 0.14. That's to locate it. Okay, now we want to cut this little segment down here. And by the way, these numbers I'm just coming up with off the top of my head. Re reality, I would think them through a little bit more than this. Okay, so now we've opened up that little segment right there. I went to trim, trim the closest to open that up. I know it's hard to see, but now when we go to features, extrude boss space, we'll select this corner to go up to, hit the green check, and now we have our core in there. We could put draft on the sides too, which you'd probably be required to so that the core can pull out easier. Uh, not all the time though. Plastics sometimes are a bit more forgiving, but uh, in a case like this. All right, so we have it shelled out. We have our core in there. And it probably fixed any sort of issues there might have been in that little undercut area. And it will pull from the mold easier too. Now select this face and start a sketch. And we're going to use offset entities. And 0.05, hit reverse to get it on the inside there. And then select this inner edge and hit Convert Entities. Now, I know I showed you a trick where I didn't convert that inside edge, and that works great for linear geometry. Sometimes with the spline geometry, which is a little more freeform, sometimes I've seen some strange phenomena occur. So I'm going to close this gap. That's why we have those two in there. Now I'll go to Features, Extrude Boss Base, and we want to extrude this um, point 0.1 in height. And then also, we could turn the draft on too if we just set it to one degree. Now, if you see that it fails to show a preview, that might be an issue. So we'll turn it off again. Yep, when we turn it on, we seem to have a bit of an issue. So we're going to leave it off. You could add it later with the draft tool. So hit the green check. And now we have our lip in there. Now, to add it later, there's a draft tool right here. And we'd be able to select the faces. Let's see if it works. Go to draft, go to the manual. Uh, the draft expert's very nice. I, in this case, it's such a simple little area. I'm gonna go to manual, uh, neutral plane, select this surface here, and then the faces to draft will select this surface right here and this surface here. And make sure we see the preview of the arrow. Let's see, um, there it is had to zoom out. It's way back here. As long as it's pointing outward, we're in good shape. 
to the green check. And now it should have added draft. Now, if we want to check, you could click on draft up here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, hit cancel there. You can go to evaluate and there's actually draft analysis. And this is very useful for mold makers because they have to make sure there's draft on most every face. Uh, so it pulls out of the mold properly. And here we have a draft analysis parameters. Let's turn it up to one. We didn't put much draft on here. Uh, select this face and you'll see green is positive draft. That's good in this case, we have a lot of green. Now yellow requires draft. So if we wanted to, we need to put draft on those faces and it calls that out on us. Red, negative draft, don't panic. That's not a bad thing as long as it's on the opposite side. And here you can actually see those faces need draft too, but we're not going to put that on. Uh, you just saw a method of putting draft in. We know two methods now while you extrude, and sometimes it doesn't work, especially with a spline contour like that. Sometimes we have some issues, so you could add it later on. Anyhow, this isn't a draft a mold class, but uh, just wanted to talk about that. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and Let's go back to the assembly. Now to go back, first of all, you could save this part and hold control and hit the tab key one time and then release it. And it should bring you back to the assembly. It wants to update it. So just go ahead and hit yes. And so it has the changes we've made to it. The next thing we want to do is we want to get the battery cradle. See here, this red surface, these red surfaces are the battery cradle that are attached to the circuit board. We want to mimic that on the side of our cover so that the battery is held in place securely. And notice there's that many sharp edges on the actual rear cover to make dimensions to. So this is where top-down assembly modeling shows you its magic ability. What we're going to do, we're going to select the floor of that shelled out part there. Start a sketch. Now I'm going to hit the space bar and I'm going to go to front view orientation and I'm going to proceed to go to the hidden in gray or hidden lines removed, I should say, and zoom up. And here is at the bottom. It's somewhat hard to see. Maybe if we go to wireframe, we might see it better. Maybe not. Let's go back. Okay, what we're seeing here, this is the battery, the edge of the battery. And there you can actually see the tip of the battery. So it's going around here. Now that's this little, what looks like the Roman numeral one or the letter I, capital I, is the battery cradle. We want to capture the two ribs here and here. Now here's how to do that. Click on the little arrow to the right of your rectangle tool, find corner rectangle. Hover over this corner right here. When you get the orange dot, you have to look carefully. I'll hold it there for a second. You can pause if you, you need to look at it. Click, drag across to this point here where it ends. Click, same over here. Find the orange dot there, click, and over here, click, and then hit escape. Didn't even have to use any dimensions. We just actually drew right over the geometry and it's tied to it. Now, if you rotate, now you can see in there. And in fact, we should probably go to shade with edges now. And you can see our patterns at the bottom. They're ready to extrude. So go to features, extrude boss base. And we could just click on this vertex of the red cradle on that's mounted on the circuit board for it to go up to. And then you can see it's going up to it. Now, some of you might say up to, uh, I can't, couldn't you have selected up to next? Up to next wouldn't have been an option because up to next only looks at its own volume. This is a separate volume, so it wouldn't see it. It'd be blind to it. Hit the green check. Now we need to make the cutout, scout cutout for the actual battery, the half round. So select this face here, and I'll zoom out so you can see that. There's the battery click right here. You're going to start a sketch and now hit your space bar and go to the bottom view orientation. And there we could actually see the battery. Now go to sketch, go to the circle and hover over this edge. 
And I think it's going to make us actually, although there it goes. I hover over the edge and there's the center point. And I could click on that center point, drag it out to this red corner right here where the red corner meets our rib that we made. Click. And notice it's a little bit bigger than the battery. There's the battery. We have some clearance. And remember with batteries, they can vary, especially temperature. If the batteries get really hot, heat expands. So you want to have some decent clearance for that battery. And now we could go to features, extrude and cut. And here's where I get a lot of students who select the wrong side. They select this corner. Remember, you wanted to go all the way through, but not all the way through the other side. So find the far end, the furthest red little marker there, click and hit the green check. Now we should be able to, if we hold control and hit tab, it should bring us back to our part. And look at that. We have our two ribs completed. And notice we hardly had to use any measuring. We used all the tools like up, up to vertex. We used uh, the profiles we just sketched out. And this is like extremely accurate up to eight decimal places. So just be aware, it's a great technique, top down assembly modeling. You're looking at the strengths right now very quickly. We didn't have to take any measurements. Just put them right in. Now hold control and hit the tab key. And from here, we're going to go ahead and bring back. Uh, actually, we could turn off edit component because we're, we're done with that rear part. And then click on original and go to show component. Let's hit our space bar and go to isometric. And let's explode it now. So go to Exploded View, select, uh, let's see, we want to select this transparent part. Does anyone remember how to select it? Notice it's selecting through it. And we learned this a couple weeks ago. There's a key on the keyboard that allows you to select transparent objects. It's the Shift key. So hover over it again, click. And now that's selected. Now you could release the Shift key, get over the Z arrow, make sure that zero turns blue, hold your mouse button down and drag it forward. And we're metric, so we'll bring it about 230 millimeters out, approximately. Then hit done. Now you could click on this, which is the LCD. Get the Z to turn blue, the Z arrow, and drag that out. You could drag it out a little bit further, maybe 270. And remember, you can zoom out if you need more room. Hit done. Now let's go ahead and click on the purple part. Grab the Z, drag it forward about 100. Hit done. And we'll start to drag these parts backwards. So click on the rear cover. Go to the Z. Drag it back about probably 250-ish around there. And now you know we have a battery in there, so you could rotate, hit done, and rotate around, and then see that battery, click on the battery, and go to Z, drag it. And then you could also go to Y, and let's say we want to drag it down or up. Okay, in this case, it did something I wasn't expecting, so I'm going to hit the undo button. I'm going to hit done click on the battery again and drag it down. Now, do we really want it there? Not really. I just wanted to show you how you could drag it in different axes. All right, now grab the circuit board, click. And now look what it did there. It moved that as well because we never hit the done. So let's hit undo, hit done. And now it can move that, drag that this way. And what we're going to do here is once you got that, go ahead and grab this right here. And we could drag that around. Actually, we probably have to hit done again. Let's uh, hit done, click on it, grab this little arrow and drag it around so that we could flip it so we can see the circuit board. Now in real life, would we do that? Probably not, um, only to show the circuit board there. Um, but Hit the green check. 
Okay, so now we could see the assembly. And let's go underneath Exploded View. Let's go to Exploded Line Sketch. And what we can do for this, let's see. Um, if you don't have a, a nice cylinder or an edge, like we do have edges here, but here we can actually select maybe this and have that go to this. And notice it kind of zigzagged around. This isn't the best example since I flipped around the circuit board, sadly. But uh, hit the green check and you get the idea. So if you need to make additional entities like that, it's just selecting the edges. Uh, like actually we could add one over here. Select this and then go ahead and probably have to get around to the backside. Select that edge right there. There we go. All right. That's pretty good. Hit the green check. And now let's collapse it. So to collapse it, right click up here, hit collapse. Now there is actually animate collapse too. If you go ahead and try animate collapse and you'll get to see it reassemble. So if you hit reciprocate and there's playback mode of half that speed or twice that speed, hit play again. And you'll see it will go back and forth. You can slow it down to half speed. And then you could record it. You could hit save animation. And if you save the animation, you could select um, a series of, there's actually different, there's flash video, electroscope video. So there's a number of them on here. I'm not sure if you have all those but uh, I'm going to hit cancel here. Just note you have those options. Okay, so we're done with that. Now the lab that's in the training guide. If you look on page, uh, let's see here, here on 96, and I rotated it. Remember, if you download it, then you click on it. You usually right click and you'll find rotate, or in this case in Firefox, rotate is just right over here. Depends on what browser you're looking at. Uh, you might get the option to rotate. And we can see here, this is a cylindrical part. And it, the tricky part here is the sketch. Now, I'm not going to go through every single dimension. Um, I actually did give you duplicate dimensions because uh, it depends on how you, what types of, uh, the way you draw it, it might come out a little bit different in terms of like which dimensions you add versus a relation or a constraint. Uh, let's zoom up a little bit here. This is what it's called as a fictitious part. It's a, uh, a turbine filter. And so these are basic little veins that are here that um, we're going to cut out last. Notice there's a, a hole that's patterned here. And whenever you see this in parentheses, like for a quarter inch binding head machine screw, that means you don't have to plug in all those numbers. You could actually go to the hole wizard, which we learned in exercise four, and find a quarter inch binding head machine screw counterbore and put it in and it'll, it'll actually find it from a library. And so you don't have to put all those details in and it'll put it in exactly like you see it there. So be aware that's uh, a nice feature. Okay, but we have here, it's nine inches overall. Uh, I have a cross section through it and there's these details. Now be careful with the details, the, the, the holes or the counterbores. Remember, you don't draw those in. Those are gonna be put in last. So let's, uh, let me show you a technique here. And, and I'm not going to uh, put in all those dimensions because I want you to do it. Right now we're already near the end of the semester and I'm gonna give you little tidbits on how to get it if you get stuck. But I, at this point, I expect you to be doing these on your own. And as I always say, when you get a job doing this, there ought not to be any surprises that there's not going to be a video to show you how to do your job. So that's why I insist that you learn to do these on your own. All right, I'm going to start with the, let's see here, front plane, start a sketch. I'm going to go to the centerline tool, drop it up. 
And I'm going to draw a line across here just for scale, because if you remember, it's nine inches across, so about four and a half inches. That would bring us to for half. And that vertical center line is there because we need to uh, revolve it. Okay, now you have to look very carefully at these models or these drawings. And as you can see here, we have a, a hole that's two inches. And so that's going to be one inch off of there. And it's uh, off of the bottom edge. It's positioned a half inch. And then the overall thickness here is going to be 1.5. So we could actually draw that in to something like this. Let's put some dimensions again to give a scale. The hole is going to be two inches. So we'll get that in. And then from here to the base, it's going to be 0 0.5. Let's hit escape. And I might actually have that wrong. Let me go back to that drawing. Oh no, I'm sorry, I have that wrong. It's actually 1.5. All right, I was wondering why it's turned out so small. And one last thing there. It's going to be it's one inch. It's going to be half inch off the base. So by putting this in, this little bit of work is going to make your life a, a lot easier when you're drawing this out. So let's get that way over there. Okay, so we have that now. Now we just go over here to the line tool. And let's just verify that this goes across. And then there's a jog of 35 degrees all the way down to the center line. And then a, a short little area there across. And then an 18 degree dimension there. And then this goes, looks like it goes straight up. Then there's a little jog of 53 degrees. Then it goes down four degrees off uh, angle. And that you're back to that 118. And then straight across. We get in there about um, a half inch up and then connect. So let's do that. So we're going to take this, go across like so, about uh, two inches, bring it down, across, up. That was that 118. And then it goes straight up. And there's a little jog here, about 50 something degrees. Now, if you don't want to accidentally get an angle, see it's going to some angles. Remember the trick is the control key will disable auto snap just for a moment. And then there's a, about four degrees of draft here. And then there, we've got this. And again, I'm going to use the control to disable the snaps. Going to go across here, up. And we do actually want to snap to that. There we go. And let's get that stretched out there. So the smart dimension, get this to here. That's supposed to be nine. Now it's going to jazz up our geometry a little bit. But if I hit escape, I can bring this back down. There we go. And then we know this is going to be four degrees. And this is from here to here. I believe that was 52 or 53. Let's go check that out. 53. And this is 18 degrees from here to here. Make sure you get it in the little areas that I'm showing you here. If you drag it out here, you're going to get the opposite. So be, be aware of that. Okay, and then we have 35 degrees for this angle to the center line. And I'll straighten these out in a little bit. And let's see what else we got here. I think we're in pretty good shape. Now we just have to put some additional dimensions. We could see this needs to be 1.5 off that base so from here to the center line. That needs to be 1.5. 
or we could mate it with uh, instead of having dual dimensions like that. Oh, here it slipped out of there. We just dra hit escape. I dragged it over. And there are some dimensions here. Let's see. That bottom line is a uh, one inch. Okay. And notice the colors are changing. They're turning black. And black is good. That means it's fully defined. The blue is what we still have to define. And okay, now we need to get that corner, which is uh, right here. Follow that. That's going to be five inches. This is three inches off of here. So let's start work our way from the inside out. So from here to here, remember, cross the center line to the right, make that three. This point to the center line. Cross the center line on the right. It's going to be five. And, uh, and then we have 8.5 for that point. So from here to here, this will be 8.5 to the center line. Basically. And we have the nine already in there. And let's get these aligned here. Get them out of the way. Okay, now the height, we have a two inch from this face here to the top of that. So from here to this face will be two inches. Okay, and again, we have it get thrown off a little bit, hit escape. You could either, you could hit undo if you wanted to constrain this in a different manner, but um, this should take care of it. You could just drag things around and get them relocated until we get more dimensions on. Oh, we have a 37 degree angle there. Do I have that? No, I don't. So uh, let's put that angle in. So from here to here, that's 37. Okay, we only have two blue lines left. Let's see what we need for those. Uh, this should be one inch off of the off of this face here. Okay, one left. Just that one right there. That's blue. And what are we missing? I see it's, uh, the corner is 1.75 or here. Yeah, we actually have that dimension if we follow it. 0.25 off of that face. So from here to here. 0.25. Now it's fully defined. So this is where I would recommend laying this out. And these are important. You could actually add your diameter symbols to these. We just uh, hit escape, click on the arrows for those. Stay away from the actual dimension or else that happens. Here, we'll actually just group select those and then go to diameter. And now we could lay those out a little bit better. Got the 53, the four degrees right there. 0 0.25, 1.5, another 1.5. And there are better ways of laying this out. I'm just trying to get it to match up as easily as possible. Um, remember, this isn't the drawing, but for the drawing later on, you might want to lay those out even better because that's uh, very difficult to read. Okay, but for the most part, you've got them laid out. And that's what's important. It's, it's easy for, not easy, but it's easier for the person modeling this because remember, change occurs. They could go in and they could see it a little bit easier. So always lay them out in such a way that might look easy to uh, string. All right, let's go ahead and click on the center line. Go to Features, Revolve Boss Base. Hit the green check. <coughs> okay, looking good. Now for those holes here, let's select this face. 
and start a sketch. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bolt circle in for ease of use. So we have a bolt circle here of a radius of two inches. It would actually be a diameter of four. And then the quadrant. So let's go to the circle tool. And at the origin, draw the circle and smart dimension it at four inches diameter. And now while uh, we hit escape, select that circle. And right here, you can turn it to construction geometry or check the box over here, construction geometry. So now it's dashed. And let's go to uh, normal to that face. And we could go to features and hit rebuild, by the way, and it'll stay in there. So we're in good shape. Now we could go to features and we could actually go to uh, whole wizard. Now it is a counter bore that we're seeking. And let's look at that drawing again. It's for a quarter inch binding head machine screw. So we're in binding head screw size, find a quarter inch. There it is. The condition and condition should be through all. And it should be standard, whatever the defaults are. So now we go to position and we should be able to click on this face and find the quadrants for each one of those. Now we could do a pattern, but I just want to show you how you could just click and add those holes. Hit the green check. And there it is. Okay, now select this face, start a sketch. And let's go back normal too. And now we have to put in the cutouts to make those veins. So I'm going to start with a center line at the origin. All right, so now as we look here, we can see if we zoom up, we have those cutouts and they follow this pattern. Oh, there's also a keyway that we have to put in, so we can't forget that. All right, but at the base here, it's 0.1 at the base for the width. It's centered and then it's spread out um, in three degrees. So if we did uh, something like this, where we go off that edge and let's put in three degrees between those two. So control select and uh, oh i'm sorry just go to smart dimension from here to here three and then from the base to the center line just make sure that's point one and now you could control select that by hit escape control select the center line and that line that you want because we're going to mirror them now right here just put a little straight And let's go to Features, Extrude Cut, um, and we're going to go through all both. Actually, it just needs to be through all, doesn't need to be both, but let's see. I hit the green check, and it cut our little sliver in there. Now, we sometimes you might have to flip it so it cuts the reverse side, but it, it did an okay job there. Now, we just need to pattern it. So let's look at the drawing, and there's 27 of those. So select that cut extrude, go to circular pattern. <clears throat> we'll put in 27, select the outer face, hit apply, and we're almost done. Let's put the keyway in, select this face, start a sketch, go normal two, and get that little, uh, go to center rectangle. Well, let's first draw a center line. Then go to, let's see what the parameters are before we add anything. Okay, so the keyway, um, the top edge is 1.1 cut out and it's 0.25 wide. So let's get a center rectangle. Draw it out like so. Dimension it at 0.25 wide. And then from this top edge to the origin, 1.1. And if you want to make sure it doesn't accidentally screw up here, just make it at least 
something that we know we'll always make sure it goes through. And go to Features, Extrude Cut, Through All. And I believe that completes this exercise. Now, I would recommend that you make a drawing from this. So we could go ahead and make that drawing. It's front, section, right, back, and isometric. So I'm going to let you do that. And that concludes exercise 10 and lab. Welcome back. I'm Chris Sikora, and I'm here to uh, take us on a journey through SOLIDWORKS 2020 and introduction to sheet metal. As you can see up on the screen here, I have a sheet metal part that's constructed, and it's a, like a hose bracket for mounting a hose on, on a machine or something. Anyhow, we're going to go ahead and take a look at how that's constructed. The idea here is with sheet metal is once you've built it, you could go ahead and flatten it and you get the flat pattern that you would actually be able to cut out on a plasma cutter or a water jet. So let's take a look at how that's built. First of all, go to File, New, Part, and hit OK. Select the front plane and start a sketch, and we're going to proceed to draw out the side profile. And it starts off that circle in the middle is going to be a two and a half inch diameter. So draw a circle on that front plane. And then go ahead and find center rectangle. And at the origin, click and drag out a center rectangle about five inches across. And let's dimension that five inches. And then dimension this at one and a half. And let me verify that in the training guide. You could go to vertanu1.com, so V is in Victor, E, R, T is in Tom, A, N is in Nancy, U, X, 1, don't forget that one, dot com, hit enter, and it's under Instructional Manuals and SOLIDWORKS Basics. Once you get there, it's going to be on page 108. Well, it starts a little bit earlier than that, page 107. And you can see the parameters here. And sure enough, I made a mistake. 1.25. Now we don't need to center it like it shows a dimension locating from this point to that point. We don't need to do that. But hit escape. Now, before we trim anything, sometimes it's better, especially if you're using a rectangle tool like that, or like what we see up on the screen, is to actually, if there's going to be an opening on that right side, we could actually not have to delete that line. We could just click on it and change it to construction geometry, and then it's innocuous for the extrusion. Now we could go to the trim tools, trim entities. You could use power trim or trim to closest. Trim to closest, I think, is easier on this one. Just delete these two lines, top and bottom, and then there's six additional little segments you're gonna have to go in and delete, and surgically go in there and be careful not to hit the center lines because that's controlling our rectangle. Okay, um, I'm going to hit the green check. Now, it might appear that this didn't trim. Now, be aware that that's just the extension line off of this dimension. So if you pull it down, it's not there. So always look at the actual line font, the thickness of the line. If it's very thin, a lot, most likely it's just a dimension extension line. Okay, now we could go ahead and go to features. Uh, and actually, no features, I'm sorry we want to go to the sheet metal tab. Now the sheet metal tab may not appear on your screen if you've never used it before. What you need to do if it's not showing up there, just right click on any of these tabs, go to the tabs and find sheet metal and check it. And you can take a look there. Look at that. There's structural systems for structural steel, weld mints, mold tools, mesh modeling. There's a lot of modules. You may not have all the modules that I have here. It depends on uh, if your company has purchased SOLIDWORKS Professional or SOLIDWORKS, uh, different versions of it. And if it's just the core SOLIDWORKS, you, you will have sheet metal though. Everyone gets sheet metal. Okay, now that we're in the sheet metal tab, go ahead and select it. Go to base flange. Now, first of all, before we go any further, look at all these tools that you have. We're only going to scrape the surface of this one, just like we usually do in intro class. In the advanced class, we have several 
sheet metal exercises. So those of you who are interested in more, definitely take a look at the advanced lessons and you'll see that there's how to make cylinders, cones, um, lofted shapes, uh, a lot of neat things in there. But let's go to base flange. Now we're going to go ahead and extrude this instead of blind mid plane. So it go because it's a symmetric part. We want it on both sides or it's semi symmetric. It's going to have some flanges that will appear shortly that we're going to add. But we want this to go uh, be two and a half inches wide. And again, let me verify that because I have a tendency to get this wrong. Oh, it's actually one and a half inches. So 1.5 and hit the green check. Now, if you click anywhere on the screen, it will, hide, it will get rid of that uh, the blue geometry. Now, what we want to do is we want to put little bent uh, areas on here. And what they call those uh, are hems. So go to the hem tool and select. Um, actually, let's leave it on open just to, so you can see what it does here. If you select the bottom edge, now you want to make sure on the top flange, you want to select the bottom edge. Here, I'll zoom up. Because if you select the top edge, it'll fold upward. We don't want it to fold upward. We want it to fold downward in this case. And you can see that it's adding this very large radius. But go over here to the type and size and look at they have several different types. We're going to go with teardrop. And that's a lot more manageable. It's 200 degrees by 0 0.00725. That's good for me. Now go ahead and select this edge on the top of the bottom flange so it folds up and around and hit the green check. And so now we have two hems in there. So it's not quite as sharp. So if someone brushes against this, they're not going to cut themselves. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in some holes in here. So go ahead and select this face right here and start a sketch. Now to center a hole, hit the little arrow to the right and find center line. And then from this corner here, make sure you get the orange dot in that corner. To this corner go diagonally across now you could go to the circle tool and right at that midpoint on that diagonal line draw a circle and smart dimension it and just dimension it at a half inch and now you could go to features extrude cut and select through all all right now we're going to go ahead and put a cut in uh, uh, in this main area here. Let's say we want to light, keep this as light as possible. So we're going to open up that area, taking out some of the sheet metal. Let's go ahead and select the top plane, start a sketch, hit your space bar, and go to the top view orientation. Find the center point straight slot. Hit the little arrow there if you can't see it. Center point straight slot. Now at the origin there, click and drag this across, make sure it's horizontal and have it go a little bit beyond the geometry here. and Click and drag it out. We're going to make it a little bit smaller than what I did on my uh, practice part. Now click and drag that out. And then let's go ahead and dimension this radius at 0.125. And then dimension the center line and make that two and a half. OK, so we're intersecting a little bit. Now, in theory, we could have actually patterned this, or we could still pattern it. If we want, but we'll just put the one in here. Go to features, extrude cut. Now, if you rotate it, make sure it's going through all both and hit the green check. All right, so we have a little cutout in there. Now we want to put in a flange over on this area here. So let's go back to the sheet metal tab, go to edge flange, select the top edge here and drag it up a little bit, click. And now let's click on Edit Flange Profile. Now don't hit Finish yet. Just drag this over out of the way. We're going to keep that up. Not until we're finished can we hit Finish on there. So leave that alone. Don't close it. Let's go ahead and we're going to select um, the Smart Dimension tool and dimension this width right here. And we're going to make this, um, oh, and unfortunately, um, it's locked in. Hit cancel there. Hit cancel. Hit escape. Two times maybe to get out of the smart dimension. Now what we want to do first before we just let it stay locked in place is grab this line here and grab this line in here and drag them in a little bit. 
Now we could go to smart dimension. It was locked into position, so we'll make this 0.75, and then the height of the flange will make it 0.75 as well. Now let's use that little trick so we can center some through holes in there. So go to the center line tool and draw a diagonal line across, and then go to the circle tool. And at the center, draw out a circle and smart dimension it. And we'll make these 0.375. Now, some additional things. Let's zoom up and see what we have here. Now, in the preview, we see a cutout. And what happens when you're putting flanges in? Think of it as if you've ever wrapped a gift for someone and you roll the paper over in corners, you see little ripples that will occur. The same occurs with sheet metal quite often. And so to make it a little bit easier during the fabrication process, they might put in these little cutouts. And what you'll find here, just hit the green check mark on dimension. Um, and let's hit back. Okay, and here what we're looking for, first of all, uh, before we hit that little cutout there, there's flange position. If you want it to go, right now it's going to material inside, so it's going to be flush with the, the face that we see there on the edge of the flange. But you have the ability to bend outside. Um, there's bend from virtual sharps. There's um, material outside and things like that. But we're going to keep it right here. You have the ability to offset it too or trim side bends. But now we have relief type. Check custom or turn off custom relief type and hit the little arrow. Oops, you know what, actually check it. And then hit the little arrow again. Now you'll see rectangular that we have there is a cutout of rectangular shape. Now rectangular shapes for a cutout for this relief, which is very common on sheet metal, again, so it doesn't ripple in those corners, uh, is, is very useful if you're using any sort of um, machine that's gonna cut this out. Like for example, a water jet cutter, or plasma, laser cutter, very thin pieces and things like that. Okay, because it could make that easy rectangle. Now, what you don't want to use here is typically if it's going to be die pressed. Now, you can, they can still make it straight with a die. Now, think of dies as if any of you have ever seen the hole punchers for your paper. Usually, that's a die and it's circular, so it punches it out and the wear is even on a circular shape versus on a rectangular shape, where do you think it's gonna wear out if you made like a million punches with that? Think about it for a second. It's gonna wear out at the corners first. So that's why there's another option here. So if you go with the process of manufacturing, you wanna use a brown for die cutting usually. And again, your sheet metal fabricator will tell you the best solution that they like to use here. So um, don't necessarily go with what exactly I'm saying. I've done, I worked on sheet metal before, but um, this is just what I've learned over the years. But really, uh, they can make a straight cut, especially if it's not a lot of parts. If it's only just a few, it's not a big deal. Okay, and then finally, there's tear is another option. Now tear, oh, first of all, look at Abram there. See how it's radiused, it's rounded? But let's go to tear. Now, when I used tear, we were designing countertops for the food service industry and for the medical industry. So out of stainless steel. And so the countertops, when you got to a corner, you wouldn't want to have a gap or an opening with an oblong or a rectangular area there, or else they'd have to require additional finishing. Because imagine wiping off, uh, if you're working at a restaurant and you're wiping off uh, salad dressing or food product it's going to get caught in those corners and bacteria can develop so for the purpose of uh, not leaving corners open and making it easier to fabricate uh, we usually went with tear i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to go with opera on this one hit the green check mark and by the way you saw that there was 90 degrees you could have we could have put it at a different angle like 70, 70 degrees or 45, but we'll keep it at 90 in this case. And you can see that right there. Now let's go ahead and get that on the other side. Now, rather than recreating it, we can mirror it. Go to features, mirror, and select that face right there. Oh, actually mirror face plane. First we have to select 
this little arrow up here, go to the top plane. Now the features to mirror, go ahead and select that face and you'll see it down below in a preview. Go ahead and hit the green check. All right. Now what we want to do is we want to see what this looks like in its flattened state because some uh, sheet metal fabricators will take your SOLIDWORKS model and they'll do the rest from here on. But some of you might have to export this as a DXF for most CNC driven uh, water jet cutters or plasma or laser cutters. So let's take a look here. Um, go back to the sheet metal tab and go to flatten. And there is our flatten pattern. So imagine this, those of you who aren't familiar, obviously, with sheet metal, think of it, uh, most of you have assembled a box before, like the Kurrigan boxes. And essentially, that's what you're doing here. You're, when you see the box in its flattened state, and then you have to fold it. Sheet metal works very similar to that. Okay. And let's go ahead and fold it back up. Now, we're going to go ahead and save this. And go ahead and save that. This is E11. And I'm going to save it in my SOLIDWORKS Basics folder. Oops. Let me go back there. I'm going to call it E11B and save it. All right, now to get the DXF file to export to a laser jet or water jet laser or plasma cutter, go to File. And you're going to find make drawing from part. And you want to go with something large enough because you don't want them to have to scale it. Yes, they can scale it, but then you have to give them the information on how the overall length is. To make it easier on the fabricator, you give it to them in scale. So they don't have to, and there, there won't be any mistakes that way, uh, hopefully. And what you could do, you could go with custom sheet size, or you could just like, like in this case, um, this is. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go with the D size sheet. And if you go with the custom sheet, you could eliminate the actual border. Let's go with that maybe. Yeah, 34 by 22. That should fit it. Hit OK. And so it should not put a border in because otherwise they might have to remove the border. Some old software systems required the border to be removed as well as other features. Now, as you can see over here, on the right, you have the flat pattern, in the upper right corner. Go ahead and drag that in and release it. Make sure, uh, hit escape and then click on it and just make sure that it's a one to one scale. So if you go to scale here, look at that, it made it two to one. So let's turn that off and find one to one scale. And SOLIDWORKS has its own algorithm built into it. I guess we picked too large of a sheet, but that's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, SOLIDWORKS has an uh, equation that looks at the size of your part and it looks at the sheet size and it calculates how it could comfortably fit front, top, and right views. We're not interested in that, but it still takes advantage of it there. And so it scaled it to two to one, which is twice the size. All right, now you can also see here, it put in all this other information. Again, sometimes your fabricator does not want to see that. You can actually click on these. You can either hide them or delete them. Uh, hiding might be a nice option just simply because you could always bring them back. I'm going to control select them and then hide them. Now I could right click and hide. As far as these lines go too, you have the ability to go in there and hide those if need be. Again, the sheet metal fabricator, depending upon their software, most recent softwares will enable them to work around those extra lines. I've worked with some though that didn't want anything. They just wanted it all blank. So like even these uh, sketches and such, if we could find those, um, those would be, I believe in the flat pattern. Some of these sketches, if we hide them, whoop. There we go. 
So the bend lines, when I right clicked it, hid those. And then the center marks, I think you might have to do them individually. There might be a way to hide those all too. I bet you it's under the standard option. If someone sees it, go ahead and post it below in the comments. And there you go. In this case now, it's completely stripped of everything. It could go right into uh, as a DXF. But here, oh, one last thing. You have to do a file, save as, and uh, let's, let's update it. Let's see what it does. Okay, uh, instead of a SOLIDWORKS drawing, there is DXF. DXF stands for Drawing Exchange Format. It's one of the earliest neutral file formats that's two-dimensional. And so almost all of the laser jet, laser and plasma and water jet cutters accept DXF. If they ask for something else, you can provide it. SOLIDWORKS has basically all in there. And you just hit save. There are some additional options in here for that. You can save it for different versions that are compatible with AutoCAD. Uh, as a DWG, um, you could enable export as splines or as polylines. Older machines might require polylines, so you would select that, and it breaks up curved geometry into a collection of little lines. And older machines, in particular from the 80s or 90s, might require that. Anything in the 21st century here should accept splines for the most part, as far as I know. But again, talk to your sheet metal fabricator and see what they need. And uh, this is just a nice courtesy to do these things for them because they've got a lot going on. All right, now what I wanna take a look at here is the next exercise of sheet metal. This next exercise is actually building, uh, working inside the context of an assembly. We've been dealing with assemblies for the past couple of weeks top down, which was exercise 10. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, that was, a, that was a hybrid, basically top down and bottom up. We did bottom up with exercise five. And then um, now we're gonna do this one. We're gonna build the sheet metal enclosure around that gear assembly, the gear and belt assembly. And let's say it's for safety purposes. And I'm gonna show you some neat techniques here. So go ahead and click on this one and let's hide it. And we're gonna reconstruct that. I'm gonna go through how. So here we have our assembly. We have a casting there that's holding into place those gears as well as the belt and pulley. And I'd like you to go to assembly, go to new part, and just select the front plane. Now the front plane just so happens to be aligned to these end faces, which is perfect for us. So we've it's already opened up a sketch. We could actually save this as a new part. In fact, let's go to file save as, hit OK there, and let's save it as our E11 uh, SM for sheet metal cover, just so you know it's yours. And save it with there, wherever you like, or with the assembly is preferable. I didn't really look where I was saving. But now, select this face. We want to encompass that geometry. So select this face and hit convert entities. Now that makes it equal size as the casting of that green face that we selected. Now let's go to features, extrude boss base. Now the technique I'm showing you, uh, there's users that have been using it for a decade already, the SOLIDWORKS, who don't even know the technique I'm about to show you. This goes back to 1997. Uh, when I first started with SOLIDWORKS, they introduced sheet metal in their uh, third release, which was in 1997. And this goes back to then. And so it's kind of a forgotten method, but it's, I think it's really cool. And I think you'll like it too. So if you're doing this and someone's kind of like, what are you doing there? You could say, this is an ancient secret that dates back to the 90s for SOLIDWORKS. Okay. Anyhow, let's go ahead and click on this back edge and it will extrude up to that back edge automatically, which is fine. Now notice I'm not in the sheet metal tools yet. I'm just extruding a solid over it. That's what makes this so interesting is that I haven't even touched the sheet metal tools. It's, I'm just using standard modeling tools. So I have this um, solid over it, which I'm gonna turn into an enclosure in just a moment, but let's go ahead and click on it 
and go to open part. We're going to separate it outside of the assembly just temporarily. Hit your F key on your keyboard and keep it at this view orientation. Now what we're going to do, we're going to go to the shell command. Again, I'm not doing anything sheet metal related just yet. Uh, keep it at, a, uh, let's put it 0.062. Now, 0.062 could vary as a gauge. Um, I've seen it with, uh, I believe it's aluminum. It could be considered 12 gauge with uh, steel. I believe it's 16 gauge. I can't remember. So maybe it's vice versa. Anyhow, I will go with 0.062. And the faces to remove now, we have to select this one here, this one here, and that one. Now, there's one more on the other side. And you can either rotate to get it, or you could get your pointer in this upper left corner near right click and use the select other tool now this is the second time i've showed this to you a couple weeks ago i showed it to you in another tool but go to select other and it should only be one face back there select it so we didn't even have to rotate it you could rotate it if you like honestly if i were doing this in real life i probably would have rotated it because right clicking and then selecting app is actually a little bit more work to me than rotating so go ahead and hit the green check and you can see now we've shelled it out but it's not a sheet metal part yet. It can't just flatten right now. We need to give it the instructions on how to do that. So we'll go to the sheet metal tab and go to, now here's the thing, insert bends. It's not used by a whole lot of people actually, I found. I've uh, done SolidWorks World. Last time I did SolidWorks World was 2010. And I talked about this, I actually showed this demonstration. And um, there's the rip tool too. Now the rip tool is still used quite often, but let's go ahead and use that first. Go to rip. Just so you know, rip is integrated into insert bends. So we could have done this all in one shot, but I want to show it to you separately because to break it down to make it easier to digest. So rip parameters, select this edge right here and you'll see a double arrow. Select this edge over here and you'll see a double arrow. If you either hit change direction for those, you'll see the arrows flip around. You can actually click on the arrows and get them to flip too, but one of the downsides is that you can't get the double-sided arrow again unless you hit change direction. So just be aware and you select them from this list. The double-sided arrow actually makes a complete notch out of the corner. So let's see what that does. Uh, we're going to keep it at ten thousandths of an inch, which is the default. Now look carefully here. This is a, a corner that's currently not open, but it will be. Hit the green check. And it notched out both of those ends. Now let's, uh, and you see it goes all the way down and then it stops. Now let's see what happens if we alter that. So edit the rip by clicking on it, go to edit feature. Now hit change direction. Uh, we got to actually, let's go back to this view here. Change direction so that the arrows are pointing up towards this face. Now hit the green check again. Let's take a look at what we just did. Look at that. It actually followed this surface as if it were cutting down and used that surface as a jig where it took like a hacksaw blade, cut it through. So it's not a complete notch out. Let's try another one. Right click on it, edit feature, rotate around. You could click on the heads, flip them and see what this does. Now rotate and now it's using the adjacent face perpendicular face as the jig where it's actually cutting down. So, um, and I just use jig, the term loosely. Those of you in manufacturing typically know what a jig is, but um, it's not really a jig. It's just, I'm just using that as an example. It's following that surface if you were to cut. Okay, but let's go back, edit the feature, and let's uh, click on edge one, hit change direction until you get both arrows. Hit edge two, change direction so you get both arrows. Hit the green check. We're going to completely notch it out. Otherwise, you can't see what I'm about to do very well. So um, you can leave it if you like. Sometimes I've gotten error messages because it's a little too complex because it's a tight corner if you leave one of those on. But now that we've got this, we can now go to insert bends. And we have to select the, the, the main face that's going to be, uh, as they call it here, if you hover over it the fixed face. That's going to be immovable. Everything else is going to unfold around it. Now, the bend radius, um, 0.12, that's okay. We could go a little tighter. Let's go 0.07. Oops, I got too many decimal places. Notice it turns red when you do that. 
And you know, a fabricator might not like me for that one. Let's go 0.06. Oh, wait, that's the thickness. Oh, let's go with 0.1. Let's just go with 0.1. Okay. All right. Now the uh, bend allowance. If you hit the little check mark here, you'll see there's K factor as a default. There's bend table, bend allowance, bend deduction, and bend calculation. What these are, um, if you ever want to know what they and uh, the equations that go along with them, click on the little question mark while you're in it right here. And the question mark up here is the help. And it will bring up SOLIDWORKS help, which is really quite nice. Now look at this over here on the right, K factor, bend calculation, auto release, bend table. Let's go with K factor. Here you can see what's involved with the K factor. Those of you in sheet metal fabricating know what this is already, most likely in the United States, especially I know here in the Midwest, it's very commonly used. Um, you can see it's uh, here it is. Bend allowance is equal to pi times radius plus kt, which kt is the k factor, which is t. And you can see the uh, distinctions of capital T and the uh, lowercase t, which is considered the center, center of that point, but that could vary. All right, I'm not going to go into this because th those of you in sheet metal fabrication know what you need. Those of you who aren't, contact your sheet metal fabricator, ask them what they want. Okay, uh, the sweet spot for the K factor, it defaults to 0.5 every time, but um, I believe, oh gosh, I can't remember what the, the, the sweet spot that I've been told before out there is not necessarily 0.5. I believe it's 0.3, 3, 4, or something like that. But make sure that your fabricator knows, uh, because if you leave it at 0.5, I've had, um, customers back in the day when I used to work with sheet metal who were like, oh my gosh, everything's coming out 30 thousandths too large. And then once we adjusted the, the K factor, and I believe it was 3.34, but again, verify that that's just my experience with one fabricator, you know, it, it came out correct. So definitely you can look into that. Now there's other things too. There's bend allowance, which that's an explicit value. Oh, don't want that to go away. Let's click on that again. And let's look at the bend calculation table. And here you can see that, how you could insert that type of information. There's also bend allowance and bend deduction. And this is an equation. And I'm told that in Europe this is used. I was told by one of my students years ago. I've never seen it here in the United States. But um, I think he was from Poland. And if I recall correctly, he mentioned that he'd seen that. So uh, anyhow, then there's bend table. And bend tables, you could see, you could specify your units, millimeters, bend type, allow, um, the material type, soft copper and brass, and that could vary for whatever material you might use. Uh, where I saw this back in the day, when I used to be a SOLIDWORKS tech support person, I used to go out to fabricators, and it was quite often in the 90s, they were trying to convert their, their tables over. And what they had, they had these old three ring binders and you know the sheets were laminated and they were they would go through and they had uh, tons of these things that had to be entered in and what i discovered is that the angle and most of them were the opposite of what the angle that solidworks required so you just have to if it's you just have to reverse it if it's a hundred um, over the 180 degrees so Anyhow, just be aware that might be a little bit of a challenge unless they've changed it as of recently. I'm not sure. Okay, but you can look up those different items. We're going to keep the K factor at 0.34. And then auto relief, we'll leave it at rectangular at 0.5 is fine. 0.5, the relief ratio basically makes the width and the depth of half the sheet metal thickness. And then the rip parameters, that's where our rip, we could have done this all in one shot. We don't need to do it because we already did it. So hit the green shot. And it's, this is not an error message. Auto relief cuts were made for one of our bends. Look at that corner. It really gouged it out. So anyhow, so we could see now, let's go ahead and try and flatten that. Hit on, hit flatten. And there's your flat pattern. Okay, let's uh, hold control and hit tab. And what you might notice here is that there's an intersection. I'm going to have it update and I'm going to hit yes. The actual model is intersecting with this geometry. So what I neglected to do, let's uh, hold control, hit tab, go back. Now, 
we have to go look at the shell. Click on the shell and edit the feature. And click on shell outward. Hit the green check. Now control tab back. And yes, let it update. And now it's actually overlapping. Now be aware there's a little uh, area there on the casting should have actually a fill in on it. I never put that one in there. But anyhow, um, there you could see it's bent around it. So we've successfully made our enclosure. Okay. Um, and if you wanted to close off this backside, you could do that. And I'm just going to show this to you. You could use the edge flange like we used earlier. Select this, select this edge for it to stop at. Now you'll notice it's intersecting. So this is where you need to use material outside. Okay, and hit edit flange profile. And now what we could do is we could steal these edges where there's screws that need to go into those areas and hit convert entities. And now you can hit finish. And now we've actually matched up those holes. Now there are some holes at the top here that I neglected to do too. So select this and start a sketch because currently we're editing that enclosure. See, it's blue. We know that if the text is blue, that's the part we're editing. So if you're not, make sure that that's turned blue. Remember, edit component allows you to toggle it on and off. Okay, so we're sketching on here. Let's go to pin lines and uh, select this edge here and control select this edge, hit convert entities. Let's go back to shaded with edges. So now we have the circles, but we have to come through. So go to features, extrude cut. And now they have something called, when you're working with the sheet metal, link to thickness. And this actually showed up in the last exercise as well. Link to thickness is a really nice tool because what it does is it only goes through the one layer of sheet metal. Now, last time we used through all because we wanted to go through two layers of sheet metal. Okay, so that was a little different, but link to thickness will only go through the one layer of sheet metal. Uh, you also have a normal cut and normal cut doesn't really make a difference here. But if uh, like, for example, here, if we were to actually draw a circle to cut through, uh, if you cut it through at this angle that is currently sitting at and we flatten it, you would have the hole. If you looked at the cross section of the hole, it would look like this. It would have angles on it. You'd have sharp edges at the top and at the bottom of the other side because it turns almost elliptical. So you, what, the, what that tool does, normal cut, will straighten those out, projecting through the actual circle to both sides. So when you flatten it out, it's straight. So it, it's, it's on by default. So just be aware, sometimes you might want to turn it off. If you're fabricating in the, in the folded state, you might want to turn it off. But if you're fabricating in the flattened state, you ought to turn it and leave it on. Hit the green check. All right, and that uh, the, the the lab for this is to make a drawing of this model here. So go to file. Uh, actually, we'll have to save it. And now we go file, make drawing from assembly. Oh, and I forgot to explode it. Well, that's all right. We'll go back. That's a good thing because a lot of times you forget to explode. I'm going to show you how you can go back and explode it. Make, or I should say make an explode view. We're going to go with standard sheet size. I always recommend for something that you might want to print out for your portfolio, keep it at A size. For me, if you're going to send it to me, give, give me an A size so when I print it up, I can mark it up. I don't have a plotter at home, especially if I'm grading from home. Okay, hit OK. And oh, we actually do have an isometric exploded, but I'm going to show you how to fix that. Actually, I'm going to hold Control and hit Tab. Now to explode this, I'm going to go to the turn off edit component and go to exploded view. I'm going to select this and grab the Z arrow and make sure the Z arrow turns blue before you do this. Drag it forward. Now hit done. Click on this casting, drag it backward. And that's all. Hit the green check. Now let's add the exploded line sketch. Click on exploded line sketch. Select this edge here. Make sure you flip that arrow so it's pointing towards this. 
and click on that edge, hit apply. This edge, flip the arrow. This edge here, hit apply. Um, actually, if you select the face, I still have to select the arrow, and now it's stuck in there. So I'll just hit reverse, and let's uh, see if we select that edge there. So these, the line doesn't go all the way through. Hit the green check. Now, if you need to, you could delete these. You can click on them and hit delete on your keyboard if you're unhappy with the way they turned out. But let's go ahead and save this. Rebuild. And now let's... Uh, Control tab back to the drawing and click on the view palette. Now grab the isometric exploded and all of a sudden you see it's like, oh, that's not my isometric exploded. Well, this is because I changed it. There was an original one in there. So go over here to the exploded view and select the second one that's on the list. And there we go. Okay, and click on this, and then let's shade it with edges. Now let's go back to the view palette and grab the, let's see here, let's grab this front one right here. And unfold a right, and a top, and a left. Hit escape. I know I did a little bit different in the actual book, uh, if you do this, this is fine. I think I actually do a section view and such. Um, this is good up. Now click on this, and if we want to see hidden lines, click on hidden lines right there so we can see the internal as well as this one. Click on hidden lines. And that's pretty good. And let's put an inspection dimension just for good practice. So select this bottom edge here, top edge click and go to inspection click on this edge here to this edge here you might have to zoom up because there's multiple edges that are very close click there let's go and add an inspection dimension there okay and then just put your name on it right there and that concludes exercise 11 sheet metal.